Section 17 of Jean Christophe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1, by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Morning 3, Part 1. 3. Minna. Four or five months before these events, Frau Josephs von Kerich, widow of Councillor Stefan von Kerich, had left Berlin, where her husband's duties had hitherto detained them, and settled down with her daughter in the little Rhine town in her native country. She had an old house with a large garden, almost a park, which sloped down to the river not far from Jean Christophe's home. From his attic, Jean Christophe could see the heavy branches of the trees hanging over the walls, and the high peak of the red roof with its mossy tiles. A little sloping alley, with hardly room to pass, ran alongside the park to the right. From there, by climbing a post, you could look over the wall. Jean Christophe did not fail to make use of it. He could then see the grassy avenues, the lawns like open meadows, the trees interlacing and growing wild, and the white front of the house with its shutters obstinately closed. Once or twice a year a gardener made the rounds and aired the house, but soon nature resumed her sway over the garden, and silence reigned over all. That silence impressed Jean Christophe. He used often stealthily to climb up to his watchtower, and as he grew taller, his eyes, then his nose, then his mouth reached up to the top of the wall. Now he could put his arms over it if he stood on tiptoe, and in spite of the discomfort of that position, he used to stay so, with his chin on the wall, looking, listening, while the evening unfolded over the lawns its soft waves of gold, which lit up with bluish rays the shade of the pines. There he could forget himself, until he heard footsteps approaching in the street. The night scattered its scents over the garden, lilac in spring, acacia in summer, dead leaves in the autumn. When Jean Christophe was on his way home in the evening from the palace, however weary he might be, he used to stand by the door to drink in the delicious scent, and it was hard for him to go back to the smells of his room. And often he had played, when he used to play, in the little square with its tufts of grass between the stones before the gateway of the house of the Kerichs. On each side of the gate grew a chestnut tree a hundred years old. His grandfather used to come and sit beneath them and smoke his pipe, and the children used to use the nuts for missiles and toys. One morning, as he went up the alley, he climbed up the post as usual. He was thinking of other things and looked absently. He was just going to climb down when he felt that there was something unusual about it. He looked towards the house. The windows were open, the sun was shining into them, and, although no one was to be seen, the old place seemed to have been roused from its fifteen years' sleep and to be smiling in its awakening. Jean Christophe went home uneasy in his mind. At dinner his father talked of what was the topic of the neighborhood, the arrival of Frau Kerich and her daughter, with an incredible quantity of luggage. The chestnut square was filled with rascals who had turned up to help unload the carts. Jean Christophe was excited by the news, which in his limited life was an important event, and he returned to his work, trying to imagine the inhabitants of the enchanted house from his father's story, as usual, hyperbolical. Then he became absorbed in his work, and had forgotten the whole affair when, just as he was about to go home in the evening, he remembered it all, and he was impelled by curiosity to climb his watchtower to spy out what might be toward within the walls. He saw nothing but the quiet avenue, 
in which the motionless trees seemed to be sleeping in the last rays of the sun. In a few moments he had forgotten why he was looking, and abandoned himself, as he always did, to the sweetness of the silence. That strange place, standing erect, perilously balanced on the top of a post, was meat for dreams. Coming from the ugly alley, stuffy and dark, the sunny gardens were of a magical radiance. His spirit wandered freely through these regions of harmony, and music sang in him. They lulled him, and he forgot time and material things, and was only concerned to miss none of the whisperings of his heart. So he dreamed, open-eyed and open-mouthed, and he could not have told how long he had been dreaming, for he saw nothing. Suddenly his heart leaped. In front of him, at a bend in an avenue, were two women's faces looking at him. One, a young lady in black, with fine, irregular features and fair hair, tall, elegant, with carelessness and indifference in the poise of her head, was looking at him with kind, laughing eyes. The other, a girl of fifteen, also in deep mourning, looked as though she were going to burst out into a fit of wild laughter. She was standing a little behind her mother, who, without looking at her, signed to her to be quiet. She covered her lips with her hands, as if she were hard put to it not to burst out laughing. She was a little creature with a fresh face, white, pink, and round-cheeked. She had a plump little nose, a plump little mouth, a plump little chin, firm eyebrows, bright eyes, and a mass of fair hair plaited and wound round her head in a crown to show her rounded neck and her smooth white forehead, a Cranach face. Jean Christophe was turned to stone by this apparition. He could not go away, but stayed, glued to his post, with his mouth wide open. It was only when he saw the young lady coming towards him with her kindly mocking smile that he wrenched himself away and jumped, tumbled, down into the alley, dragging with him pieces of plaster from the wall. He heard a kind voice calling him, "'Little boy!' and a shout of childish laughter, clear and liquid as the song of a bird. He found himself in the alley on hands and knees, and after a moment's bewilderment he ran away, as hard as he could go, as though he was afraid of being pursued. He was ashamed, and his shame kept bursting upon him again when he was alone in his room at home. After that he dared not go down the alley, fearing oddly that they might be lying in wait for him. When he had to go by the house he kept close to the walls, lowered his head, and almost ran without ever looking back. At the same time, he never ceased to think of the two faces that he had seen. He used to go up to the attic, taking off his shoes so as not to be heard, and to look his hardest out through the skylight in the direction of the Kerich's house and park, although he knew perfectly well that it was impossible to see anything but the tops of the trees and the topmost chimneys. About a month later, at one of the weekly concerts of the Hofmusikverein, he was playing a concerto for piano and orchestra of his own composition. He had reached the last movement when he chanced to see in the box facing him Frau and Fraulein Kerich looking at him. He so little expected to see them that he was astounded and almost missed out his reply to the orchestra. He went on playing mechanically to the end of the piece. When it was finished, he saw, although he was not looking in their direction, that Frau and Fraulein Kerich were applauding a little exaggeratedly, as though they wished him to see that they were applauding. He hurried away from the stage. As he was leaving the theatre, he saw Frau Kerich in the lobby, separated from him by several rows of people, and she seemed to be waiting for him to pass. It was impossible for him not to see her, but he pretended not to do so, and, brushing his way through, he left hurriedly by the stage door of the theatre. Then he was angry with himself, for he knew quite well that Frau Kerich meant no harm. But he knew that in the same situation he would do the same again. 
he was in terror of meeting her in the street. Whenever he saw at a distance a figure that resembled her, he used to turn aside and take another road. It was she who came to him. She sought him out at home. One morning, when he came back to dinner, Louisa proudly told him that a lackey in breeches and livery had left a letter for him, and she gave him a large, black-edged envelope, on the back of which was engraved the Carrick Arms. Jean-Christophe opened it and trembled as he read these words. Frau Josepha von Carrick requests the pleasure of Hofmusikus jean Christoph Kraft's company at tea today at half-past five. I shall not go, declared jean Christophe. What? cried Louisa. I said that you would go. jean Christophe made a scene, and reproached his mother with meddling in affairs that were no concern of hers. The servant waited for a reply. I said that you were free today. You have nothing to do then. In vain did John Christophe lose his temper and swear that he would not go. He could not get out of it now. When the appointed time came, he got ready, fuming. In his heart of hearts, he was not sorry that chance had so done violence to his whims. Frau von Kerich had had no difficulty in recognizing in the pianist at the concert the little savage whose shaggy head had appeared over her garden wall on the day of her arrival. She had made inquiries about him of her neighbors, and what she learned about Jean Christophe's family and the boy's brave and difficult life had roused interest in him and a desire to talk to him. Jean Christophe, trussed up in an absurd coat which made him look like a country parson, arrived at the house quite ill with shyness. He tried to persuade himself that Frau and Fräulein Kerich had had no time to remark his features on the day when they had first seen him. A servant led him down a long corridor, thickly carpeted, so that his footsteps made no sound, to a room with a glass-panelled door which opened on to the garden. It was raining a little and cold. A good fire was burning in the fireplace, near the window, through which he had a peep of the wet trees in the mist, the two ladies were sitting. Frau Kerich was working, and her daughter was reading a book when Jean Christophe entered. When they saw him, they exchanged a sly look. They know me again, thought Jean Christophe, abashed. He bobbed awkwardly and went on bobbing. Frau von Kerich smiled cheerfully and held out her hand. Good day, my dear neighbor she said. I am glad to see you. Since I heard you at the concert, I have been wanting to tell you how much pleasure you gave me, and as the only way of telling you was to invite you here, I hope you will forgive me for having done so. In the kindly, conventional words of welcome there was so much cordiality, in spite of a hidden sting of irony, that Jean Christophe grew more at his ease. They do not know me again, he thought, comforted. Frau von Kerich presented her daughter, who had closed her book and was looking interestedly at Jean Christophe. "'My daughter Minna,' she said. "'She wanted so much to see you.' "'But, Mama," said Minna, "'it is not the first time that we have seen each other.' And she laughed aloud. "'They do know me again,' thought Jean Christophe, crestfallen. "'True,' said Frau von Kerich, laughing too. You paid us a visit the day we came. At these words the girl laughed again, and Jean Christophe looked so pitiful that when Minna looked at him she laughed more than ever. She could not control herself, and she laughed until she cried. Frau von Kerich tried to stop her, but she too could not help laughing, and Jean Christophe, in spite of his constraint, fell victim to the contagiousness of it. Their merriment was irresistible. It was impossible to take offense at it, but Jean Christophe lost countenance altogether when Minna caught her breath again and asked him whatever he could be doing on the wall. She was tickled by his uneasiness, he murmured, altogether at a loss. Frau von Kerich came to his aid and turned the conversation by pouring out tea. She questioned him amiably about his life, but he did not gain confidence. 
He could not sit down. He could not hold his cup, which threatened to upset. And whenever they offered him water, milk, sugar, or cakes, he thought that he had to get up hurriedly and bow his thanks, stiff, trussed up in his frock coat, collar, and tie, like a tortoise in its shell, not daring and not being able to turn his head to right or left, and overwhelmed by Frau von Kerich's innumerable questions and the warmth of her manner, frozen by Minna's looks, which he felt were taking in his features, his hands, his movements, his clothes. They made him even more uncomfortable by trying to put him at his ease. Frau von Kerich, by her flow of words, Minna, by the coquettish eyes which instinctively she made at him to amuse herself. Finally they gave up trying to get anything more from him than bows and monosyllables, and Frau von Kerich, who had the whole burden of the conversation, asked him, when she was worn out, to play the piano. Much more shy of them than of a concert audience, he played an adagio of Mozart. But his very shyness, the uneasiness which was beginning to fill his heart from the company of the two women, the ingenuous emotion with which his bosom swelled, which made him happy and unhappy, were in tune with the tenderness and youthful modesty of the music, and gave it the charm of spring. Frau von Kerich was moved by it. She said so with the exaggerated words of praise customary among men and women of the world. She was none the less sincere for that, and the very excess of the flattery was sweet, coming from such charming lips. Naughty Minna said nothing, and looked astonished at the boy who was so stupid when he talked, but was so eloquent with his fingers. Jean-Christophe felt their sympathy, and grew bold under it. He went on playing, then half turning towards Minna, with an awkward smile, and without raising his eyes, he said timidly, This is what I was doing on the wall. He played a little piece, in which he had, in fact, developed the musical ideas which had come to him in his favorite spot as he looked into the garden, not, be it said, on the evening when he had seen Minna and Frau von Kerich, for some obscure reason known only to his heart, he was trying to persuade himself that it was so, but long before, and in the calm rhythm of the andante con moto, there were to be found the serene impression of the singing of birds, muttering of beasts, and the majestic slumber of the great trees in the peace of the sunset. The two hearers listened delightedly. When he had finished, Frau von Kerich rose, took his hands with her usual vivacity, and thanked him effusively. Minna clapped her hands and cried that it was admirable and that to make him compose other works as sublime as that, she would have a ladder placed against the wall, so that he might work there at his ease. Frau von Kerich told Jean Christophe not to listen to silly Minna. She begged him to come as often as he liked to her garden, since he loved it, and she added that he need never bother to call on them if he found it tiresome. You need never bother to come and see us, added Minna. Only if you do not come, beware. She wagged her finger in menace. Minna was possessed by no imperious desire that Jean Christophe should come to see her, or should even follow the rules of politeness with regard to herself. But it pleased her to produce a little effect which instinctively she felt to be charming. Jean Christophe blushed delightedly. Frau von Kerich won him completely by the tact with which she spoke of his mother and grandfather, whom she had known. The warmth and kindness of the two ladies touched his heart. He exaggerated their easy urbanity, their worldly graciousness, in his desire to think it heartfelt and deep. He began to tell them, with his naive trustfulness, of his plans and his wretchedness. He did not notice that more than an hour had passed, and he jumped with surprise when a servant came and announced dinner. But his confusion turned to happiness when Frau von Kerich told him to stay and dine with them, like the good friends that they were going to be, and were already. A place was laid for him between the mother and daughter, and at table his talents did not show to such advantage as at the piano. 
That part of his education had been much neglected. It was his impression that eating and drinking were the essential things at table, and not the manner of them. And so Tidy Minna looked at him, pouting and a little horrified. They thought that he would go immediately after supper, but he followed them into the little room and sat with them, and had no idea of going. Minna stifled her yawns, and made signs to her mother. He did not notice them, because he was dumb with his happiness, and thought they were like himself, because Minna, when she looked at him, made eyes at him from habit. And finally, once he was seated, he did not quite know how to get up and take his leave. He would have stayed all night, had not Frau von Kerich sent him away herself, without ceremony, but kindly. He went, carrying in his heart the soft light of the brown eyes of Frau von Kerich and the blue eyes of Minna. On his hands he felt the sweet contact of soft fingers, soft as flowers, and a subtle perfume, which he had never before breathed, enveloped him, bewildered him, brought him almost to swooning. End of section 17「Section 18 of Jean Christophe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1, by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Morning 3, Part 2. He went again two days later as was arranged, to give Minna a music lesson. Thereafter, under this arrangement, he went regularly twice a week in the morning, and very often he went again in the evening to play and talk. Frau von Kerich was glad to see him. She was a clever and a kind woman. She was thirty-five when she lost her husband, and although young in body and at heart, she was not sorry to withdraw from the world in which she had gone far since her marriage. Perhaps she left it the more easily because she had found it very amusing and thought wisely that she could not both eat her cake and have it. She was devoted to the memory of Herr von Kerich, not that she had felt anything like love for him when they married, but good fellowship was enough for her. She was of an easy temper and an affectionate disposition. She had given herself up to her daughter's education. But the same moderation which she had had in her love held in check the impulsive and morbid quality which is sometimes in motherhood, when the child is the only creature upon whom the woman can expend her jealous need of loving and being loved. She loved Minna much, but was clear in her judgment of her, and did not conceal any of her imperfections any more than she tried to deceive herself about herself. Witty and clever, she had a keen eye for discovering at a glance the weakness and ridiculous side of any person. She took great pleasure in it, without ever being the least malicious, for she was as indulgent as she was scoffing, and while she laughed at people she loved to be of use to them. Young Jean Christophe gave food both to her kindness and to her critical mind. During the first days of her sojourn in the little town, when her mourning kept her out of society, Jean Christophe was a distraction for her, primarily by his talent. She loved music, although she was no musician. She found in it a physical and moral well-being in which thoughts could idly sink into a pleasant melancholy. Sitting by the fire, while Jean Christophe played, a book in her hands and smiling vaguely, she took a silent delight in the mechanical movements of his fingers and the purposeless wanderings of her reverie, hovering among the sad, sweet images of the past. But more even than the music, the musician interested her. She was clever enough to be conscious of Jean Christophe's rare gifts, although she was not capable of perceiving his really original quality. It gave her a curious pleasure to watch the waking of those mysterious fires which she saw kindling in him. 
she had quickly appreciated his moral qualities, his uprightness, his courage, the sort of stoicism in him so touching in a child. But for all that she did not view him the less with the usual perspicacity of her sharp mocking eyes. His awkwardness, his ugliness, his little ridiculous qualities amused her. She did not take him altogether seriously. She did not take many things seriously. Jean Christophe's antic outbursts, his violence, his fantastic humor, made her think sometimes that he was a little unbalanced. She saw in him one of the crafts, honest men and good musicians, but always a little wrong in the head. Her light irony escaped Jean Christophe. He was conscious only of Frau von Kerich's kindness. He was so unused to anyone being kind to him. Although his duties at the palace brought him into daily contact with the world, poor Jean Christophe had remained a little savage, untutored and uneducated. The selfishness of the court was only concerned in turning him to its profit and not in helping him in any way. He went to the palace, sat at the piano, played, and went away again, and nobody ever took the trouble to talk to him, except absently to pay him some banal compliment. Since his grandfather's death, no one, either at home or outside, had ever thought of helping him to learn the conduct of life, or to be a man. He suffered cruelly from his ignorance and the roughness of his manners. He went through an agony and bloody sweat to shape himself alone, but he did not succeed. Books, conversation, example, all were lacking. He would fain have confessed his distress to a friend, but could not bring himself to do so. Even with Otto he had not dared, because at the first words he had uttered, Otto had assumed a tone of disdainful superiority which had burned into him like hot iron. And now with Frau von Kerich it all became easy. Of her own accord, without his having to ask anything, it cost Jean Christophe's pride so much, she showed him gently what he should not do, told him what he ought to do, advised him how to dress, eat, walk, talk, and never passed over any fault of manners, taste, or language. And he could not be hurt by it, so light and careful was her touch in the handling of the boy's easily injured vanity. She took in hand also his literary education without seeming to be concerned with it. She never showed surprise at his strange ignorance, but never let slip an opportunity of correcting his mistakes simply, easily, as if it were natural for him to have been in error, and instead of alarming him with pedantic lessons, she conceived the idea of employing their evening meetings by making Minna or Jean Christophe read passages of history, or of the poets, German and foreign. She treated him as a son of the house, with a few fine shades of patronizing familiarity, which he never saw. She was even concerned with his clothes, gave him new ones, knitted him a woolen comforter, presented him with little toilet things, and all so gently that he never was put about by her care or her presence. In short, she gave him all the little attentions and the quasi-maternal care which come to every good woman instinctively for a child who is entrusted to her or trusts himself to her without her having any deep feeling for it. But Jean Christophe thought that all the tenderness was given to him personally, and he was filled with gratitude. He would break out into little awkward, passionate speeches, which seemed a little ridiculous to Frau von Kerich, though they did not fail to give her pleasure. With Minna, his relation was very different. When Jean Christophe met her again at her first lesson, he was still intoxicated by his memories of the preceding evening and of the girl's soft looks, and he was greatly surprised to find her an altogether different person from the girl he had seen only a few hours before. She hardly looked at him and did not listen to what he said, and when she raised her eyes to him, he saw in them so icy a coldness that he was chilled by it. He tortured himself for a long time to discover wherein lay his offense. 
he had given none, and Minna's feelings were neither more nor less favorable than on the preceding day. Just as she had been then, Minna was completely indifferent to him. If on the first occasion she had smiled upon him in welcome, it was from a girl's instinctive coquetry, who delights to try the power of her eyes on the first comer, be it only a trimmed poodle who turns up to fill her idle hours. But since the preceding day, the too easy conquest had already lost interest for her. She had subjected Jean Christophe to a severe scrutiny, and she thought him an ugly boy, poor, ill-bred, who played the piano well, though he had ugly hands, held his fork at table abominably, and ate his fish with a knife. Then he seemed to her very uninteresting. She wanted to have music lessons from him. She wanted even to amuse herself with him, because for the moment she had no other companion, and because in spite of her pretensions of being no longer a child, she had still in gusts a crazy longing to play, a need of expending her superfluous gaiety, which was, in her as in her mother, still further roused by the constraint imposed by their mourning. But she took no more account of Jean Christophe than of a domestic animal, and if it still happened occasionally during the days of her greatest coldness that she made eyes at him, it was purely out of forgetfulness and because she was thinking of something else, or simply so as not to get out of practice. And when she looked at him like that, Jean Christophe's heart used to leap. It is doubtful if she saw it. She was telling herself stories, for she was at the age when we delight the senses with sweet fluttering dreams. She was forever absorbed in thoughts of love, filled with a curiosity which was only innocent from ignorance. And she only thought of love, as a well-taught young lady should, in terms of marriage. Her ideal was far from having taken definite shape. Sometimes she dreamed of marrying a lieutenant, sometimes of marrying a poet, properly sublime, a la Schiller. One project devoured another, and the last was always welcomed with the same gravity and just the same amount of conviction. For the rest, all of them were quite ready to give way before a profitable reality, for it is wonderful to see how easily romantic girls forget their dreams when something less ideal, but more certain, appears before them. As it was, sentimental Minna was, in spite of all, calm and cold. In spite of her aristocratic name and the pride with which the ennobling particle filled her, she had the soul of a little German housewife in the exquisite days of adolescence. Naturally, Jean Christophe did not in the least understand the complicated mechanism, more complicated in appearance than in reality, of the feminine heart. He was often baffled by the ways of his friends, but he was so happy in loving them that he credited them with all that disturbed and made him sad with them, so as to persuade himself that he was as much loved by them as he loved them himself. A word or an affectionate look plunged him in delight. Sometimes he was so bowled over by it that he would burst into tears. Sitting by the table in the quiet little room, with Frau von Kerrich a few yards away, sewing by the light of the lamp, Minna reading on the other side of the table, and no one talking, he looking through the half-open garden door at the gravel of the avenue, glistening under the moon, a soft murmur coming from the tops of the trees. His heart would be so full of happiness that suddenly, for no reason, he would leap from his chair, throw himself at Frau von Kerrich's feet, seize her hand, needle or no needle, cover it with kisses, press it to his lips, his cheeks, his eyes, and sob. Minna would raise her eyes, slightly shrug her shoulders, and make a face. Frau von Kerrich would smile down at the big boy groveling at her feet, and pat his head with her free hand, and say to him in her pretty voice, affectionately and ironically, "'Well, well, old fellow, what is it?' "'Oh, the sweetness of that voice, that peace, that silence, 
that soft air in which were no shouts, no roughness, no violence, that oasis in the harsh desert of life, and heroic light gilding with its rays people and things, the light of the enchanted world conjured up by the reading of the divine poets, Goethe, Schiller, Shakespeare, springs of strength, of sorrow, and of love. Minna, with her head down over the book, and her face faintly colored by her animated delivery, would read in her fresh voice, with its slight lisp, and try to sound important when she spoke in the characters of warriors and kings. Sometimes Frau von Kerrick herself would take the book. Then she would lend to tragic histories the spiritual and tender graciousness of her own nature. But most often she would listen, lying back in her chair, her never-ending needlework in her lap. She would smile at her own thoughts for always she would come back to them through every book. Jean-Christophe also had tried to read, but he had had to give it up. He stammered, stumbled over the words, skipped the punctuation, seemed to understand nothing, and would be so moved that he would have to stop in the middle of the pathetic passages, feeling tears coming. Then, in a tantrum, he would throw the book down on the table and his two friends would burst out laughing. How he loved them! He carried the image of them everywhere with him, and they were mingled with the persons in Shakespeare and Goethe. He could hardly distinguish between them. Some fragrant word of the poets which called up from the depths of his being passionate emotions could not in him be severed from the beloved lips that had made him hear it for the first time. Even twenty years later, he could never read Egmont or Romeo, or see them played, without their leaping up in him at certain lines the memory of those quiet evenings, those dreams of happiness, and the beloved faces of Frau von Kerich and Minna. He would spend hours looking at them in the evening when they were reading, in the night when he was dreaming in his bed, awake, with his eyes closed, during the day when he was dreaming at his place in the orchestra, playing mechanically with his eyes half-closed. He had the most innocent tenderness for them, and knowing nothing of love, he thought he was in love. But he did not quite know whether it was with the mother or the daughter. He went into the matter gravely, and did not know which to choose. And yet, as it seemed to him he must at all costs make his choice, he inclined towards Frau von Kerich, and he did in fact discover, as soon as he had made up his mind to it, that it was she that he loved. He loved her quick eyes, the absent smile upon her half-open lips, her pretty forehead, so young in seeming, and the parting to one side in her fine, soft hair, her rather husky voice, with its little cough, her motherly hands, the elegance of her movements, and her mysterious soul. He would thrill with happiness when, sitting by his side, she would kindly explain to him the meaning of some passage in a book which he did not understand. She would lay her hand on Jean Christophe's shoulder. He would feel the warmth of her fingers, her breath on his cheek, the sweet perfume of her body. He would listen in ecstasy, lose all thought of the book, and understand nothing at all. She would see that and ask him to repeat what she had said. Then he would say nothing, and she would laughingly be angry and tap his nose with her book, telling him that he would always be a little donkey. To that he would reply that he did not care so long as he was her little donkey, and she did not drive him out of her house. She would pretend to make objections. Then she would say that although he was an ugly little donkey and very stupid, she would agree to keep him, and perhaps even to love him, although he was good for nothing, if, at the least, he would be just good. Then they would both laugh, and he would go swimming in his joy. When he discovered that he loved Frau von Kerich, Jean Christophe broke away from Minna. 
He was beginning to be irritated by her coldness and disdain, and as, by dint of seeing her often, he had been emboldened little by little to resume his freedom of manner with her, he did not conceal his exasperation from her. She loved to sting him, and he would reply sharply. They were always saying unkind things to each other, and Frau von Kerach only laughed at them. Jean Christophe, who never got the better in such passages of words, used sometimes to issue from them so infuriated that he thought he detested Minna, and he persuaded himself that he only went to her house again because of Frau von Kerach. He went on giving her music lessons twice a week from nine to ten in the morning. He superintended the girls' scales and exercises. The room in which they did this was Minna's studio, an odd workroom which, with an amusing fidelity, reflected the singular disorder of her little feminine mind. On the table were little figures of musical cats, a whole orchestra, one playing a violin, another the violoncello a little pocket mirror, toilet things and writing things, tidily arranged. On the shelves were tiny busts of musicians, Beethoven frowning, Wagner with his velvet cap, and the Apollo Belvedere. On the mantelpiece, by a frog smoking a red pipe, a paper fan on which was painted the Bayreuth Theatre. On the two bookshelves were a few books, Lubke, Mommsen, Schiller, saint Famille. Jules Verne, Montaigne. On the walls, large photographs of the Sistine Madonna and pictures by Herkimer, edged with blue and green ribbons. There was also a view of a Swiss hotel in a frame of silver thistles, and above all, everywhere in profusion, in every corner of the room, photographs of officers, tenors, conductors, girlfriends, all with inscriptions, almost all with verse, or at least what is accepted as verse in Germany. In the center of the room, on a marble pillar, was enthroned a bust of Brahms with a beard, and above the piano little plush monkeys and cotillion trophies hung by threads. Minna would arrive late, her eyes still puffy with sleep, sulky. She would hardly reach out her hand to Jean Christophe, coldly bid him good day, and without a word, gravely and with dignity sit down at the piano. When she was alone, it pleased her to play interminable scales, for that allowed her agreeably to prolong her half-somnolent condition and the dreams which she was spinning for herself. But Jean Christophe would compel her to fix her attention on difficult exercises, and so sometimes she would avenge herself by playing them as badly as she could. She was a fair musician, but she did not like music, like many German women. But like them, she thought she ought to like it, and she took her lessons conscientiously enough, except for certain moments of diabolical malice indulged in to enrage her master. She could enrage him much more by the icy indifference with which she set herself to her task. But the worst was when she took it into her head that it was her duty to throw her soul into an expressive passage. Then she would become sentimental and feel nothing. Young Jean Christophe, sitting by her side, was not very polite. He never paid her compliments. Far from it. She resented that, and never let any remark pass without answering it. She would argue about everything that he said, and when she made a mistake, she would insist that she was playing what was written. He would get cross, and they would go on exchanging ungracious words and impertinences. With her eyes on the keys, she never ceased to watch Jean Christophe and enjoy his fury. As a relief from boredom, she would invent stupid little tricks, with no other object than to interrupt the lesson and to annoy Jean Christophe. She would pretend to choke so as to make herself interesting. She would have a fit of coughing, or she would have something very important to say to the maid. Jean Christophe knew that she was play-acting, and Minna knew that Jean Christophe knew that she was play-acting, and it amused her, for Jean Christophe could not tell her what he was thinking. One day, 
When she was indulging in this amusement and was coughing languidly, hiding her mouth in her handkerchief, as if she were on the point of choking, but in reality watching Jean Christophe's exasperation out of the corner of her eye, she conceived the ingenious idea of letting the handkerchief fall, so as to make Jean Christophe pick it up, which he did with the worst grace in the world. She rewarded him with a thank you in her grand manner, which nearly made him explode. She thought the game too good not to be repeated. Next day she did it again. Jean Christophe did not budge. He was boiling with rage. She waited a moment and then said in an injured tone, Will you please pick up my handkerchief? Jean Christophe could not contain himself. I am not your servant, he cried roughly. Pick it up yourself. Minna choked with rage. She got up suddenly from her stool, which fell over. Oh, this is too much, she said, and angrily thumped the piano, and she left the room in a fury. Jean Christophe waited. She did not come back. He was ashamed of what he had done. He felt that he had behaved like a little cad, and he was at the end of his tether. She made fun of him too impudently. He was afraid lest Minna should complain to her mother, and he should be forever banished from Frau von Kerich's thoughts. He knew not what to do, for if he was sorry for his brutality, no power on earth would have made him ask pardon. He came again on the chance the next day, although he thought that Minna would refuse to take her lesson. But Minna, who was too proud to complain to anybody, Minna, whose conscience was not shielded against reproach, appeared again after making him wait five minutes more than usual, and she sat down at the piano, stiff, upright, without turning her head or saying a word, as though Jean Christophe no longer existed for her. But she did not fail to take her lesson, and all the subsequent lessons, because she knew very well that Jean Christophe was a fine musician and that she ought to learn to play the piano properly if she wished to be, what she wished to be, a well-bred young lady of finished education. But how bored she was! How they bored each other! End of section 18section 19 of jean christophe volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by joshua seeger in chicago jean christophe volume 1 by romain roland translated by gilbert canan morning 3 part 3 one misty morning in march when little flakes of snow were flying, like feathers in the gray air, they were in the studio. It was hardly daylight. Minna was arguing, as usual, about a false note that she had struck, and pretending that it was written so. Although he knew perfectly well that she was lying, Jean Christophe bent over the book to look at the passage in question closely. Her hand was on the rack, and she did not move it. His lips were near her hand. He tried to read, and could not. He was looking at something else, a thing soft, transparent, like the petals of a flower. Suddenly, he did not know what he was thinking of, he pressed his lips as hard as he could on the little hand. They were both dumbfounded by it. He flung backwards. She withdrew her hand, both blushing. They said no word. They did not look at each other. After a moment of confused silence, she began to play again. She was very uneasy. Her bosom rose and fell as though she were under some weight. She struck wrong note after wrong note. He did not notice it. He was more uneasy than she. His temples throbbed. He heard nothing. He knew not what she was playing, and, to break the silence, he made a few random remarks in a choking voice. He thought that he was forever lost in Minna's opinion. He was confounded by what he had done thought it stupid and rude. The lesson hour over, he left Minna without looking at her, and even forgot to say good-bye. She did not mind. She had no thought now of deeming Jean-Christophe ill-mannered, 
and if she made so many mistakes in playing, it was because all the time she was watching him out of the corner of her eye with astonishment and curiosity and, for the first time, sympathy. When she was left alone, instead of going to look for her mother as usual, she shut herself up in her room and examined this extraordinary event. She sat with her face in her hands in front of the mirror. Her eyes seemed to her soft and gleaming. She bit gently at her lip in the effort of thinking. And as she looked complacently at her pretty face, she visualized the scene and blushed and smiled. At dinner she was animated and merry. She refused to go out at once and stayed in the drawing-room for part of the afternoon. She had some work in her hand and did not make ten stitches without a mistake. But what did that matter? In a corner of the room, with her back turned to her mother, she smiled. Or, under a sudden impulse to let herself go, she pranced about the room and sang at the top of her voice. Frau von Karach started and called her mad. Minna flung her arms round her neck, shaking with laughter, and hugged and kissed her. In the evening, when she went to her room, it was a long time before she went to bed. She went on looking at herself in the mirror, trying to remember, and having thought all through the day of the same thing, thinking of nothing. She undressed slowly. She stopped every moment, sitting on the bed, trying to remember what Jean Christophe was like. It was a Jean Christophe of fantasy who appeared, and now he did not seem nearly so uncouth to her. She went to bed and put out the light. Ten minutes later the scene of the morning rushed back into her mind, and she burst out laughing. Her mother got up softly and opened the door, thinking that, against orders, she was reading in bed. She found Minna lying quietly in her bed, with her eyes wide open in the dim candlelight. "'What is it?' she asked. "'What is amusing you?' "'Nothing,' said Minna gravely. "'I was thinking.' You are very lucky to find your own company so amusing. But go to sleep. Yes, Mama, replied Minna meekly. Inside herself she was grumbling. Go away, do go away, until the door was closed, and she could go on enjoying her dreams. She fell into a sweet drowsiness. When she was nearly asleep, she leaped for joy. He loves me. What happiness! How good of him to love me! How I love him! She kissed her pillow and went fast asleep. When next they were together, Jean Christophe was surprised at Minna's amiability. She gave him good day and asked him how he was in a very soft voice. She sat at the piano, looking wise and modest. She was an angel of docility. There were none of her naughty schoolgirl's tricks, but she listened religiously to Jean Christophe's remarks acknowledged that they were right, gave little timid cries herself when she made a mistake, and set herself to be more accurate. Jean Christophe could not understand it. In a very short time she made astounding progress. Not only did she play better, but with musical feeling. Little as he was given to flattery, he had to pay her a compliment. She blushed with pleasure and thanked him for it with a look tearful with gratitude. She took pains with her toilet for him. She wore ribbons of an exquisite shade. She gave Jean Christophe little smiles and soft glances, which he disliked, for they irritated him and moved him to the depths of his soul. And now it was she who made conversation, but there was nothing childish in what she said. She talked gravely and quoted the poets in a pedantic and pretentious way. He hardly ever replied, he was ill at ease. This new Minna that he did not know astonished and disquieted him. Always she watched him. She was waiting. For what? Did she know herself? She was waiting for him to do it again. He took good care not to, for he was convinced that he had behaved like a clod. He seemed never to give a thought to it. She grew restless, and one day when he was sitting quietly at a respectful distance from her dangerous little pause, she was seized with impatience. With a movement so quick that she had no time to think of it, she herself 
thrust her little hand against his lips. He was staggered by it, then furious and ashamed, but nonetheless he kissed it very passionately. Her naive effrontery enraged him. He was on the point of leaving her there and then. But he could not. He was entrapped. Whirling thoughts rushed in his mind. He could make nothing of them. Like mists ascending from a valley, they rose from the depths of his heart. He wandered hither and thither at random through this mist of love. And whatever he did, he did but turn round and round an obscure fixed idea, a desire unknown, terrible and fascinating as a flame to an insect. It was the sudden eruption of the blind forces of nature. They passed through a period of waiting. They watched each other, desired each other, were fearful of each other. They were uneasy. But they did not, for that, desist from their little hostilities and sulkinesses. Only there were no more familiarities between them. They were silent. Each was busy constructing their love in silence. Love has curious retroactive effects. As soon as Jean Christophe discovered that he loved Minna, he discovered at the same time that he had always loved her. For three months they had been seeing each other almost every day, without ever suspecting the existence of their love. But from the day when he did actually love her, he was absolutely convinced that he had loved her from all eternity. It was a good thing for him to have discovered at last whom he loved. He had loved for so long without knowing whom. It was a sort of relief to him, like a sick man who, suffering from a general illness, vague and enervating, sees it become definite in sharp pain in some portion of his body. Nothing is more wearing than love without a definite object. It eats away and saps the strength like a fever. A known passion leads the mind to excess. That is exhausting, but at least one knows why. It is an excess. It is not a wasting away, anything rather than emptiness. Although Minna had given Jean Christophe good reason to believe that she was not indifferent to him, he did not fail to torture himself with the idea that she despised him. They had never had any very clear idea of each other, but this idea had never been more confused and false than it was now. It consisted of a series of strange fantasies which could never be made to agree, for they passed from one extreme to the other, endowing each other in turn with faults and charms which they did not possess, charms when they were parted, faults when they were together. In either case they were wide of the mark. They did not know themselves what they desired. For Jean Christophe his love took shape as that thirst for tenderness imperious, absolute, demanding reciprocation which had burned in him since childhood, which he demanded from others and wished to impose on them by will or force. Sometimes this despotic desire of full sacrifice of himself and others, especially others perhaps, was mingled with gusts of a brutal and obscure desire which set him whirling, and he did not understand it. Minna, curious above all things, and delighted to have a romance, tried to extract as much pleasure as possible from it for her vanity and sentimentality. She tricked herself wholeheartedly as to what she was feeling. A great part of their love was purely literary. They fed on the books they had read, and were forever ascribing to themselves feelings which they did not possess. But the moment was to come when all these little lies and small egoisms were to vanish away before the divine light of love. A day, an hour, a few seconds of eternity, and it was so unexpected. One evening they were alone and talking. The room was growing dark. Their conversation took a serious turn. They talked of the infinite, of life and death. It made a larger frame for their little passion. Minna complained of her loneliness, which led naturally to Jean Christophe's answer that she was not so lonely as she thought. No, she said, shaking her head. 
That is only words. Everyone lives for himself. No one is interested in you. Nobody loves you. Silence. And I, said Jean Christophe suddenly, pale with emotion. Impulsive Minna jumped to her feet and took his hands. The door opened. They flung apart. Frau von Kerich entered. Jean Christophe buried himself in a book, which he held upside down. Minna bent over her work and pricked her finger with her needle. They were not alone together for the rest of the evening, and they were afraid of being left. When Frau von Kerich got up to look for something in the next room, Minna, not usually obliging, ran to fetch it for her, and Jean Christophe took advantage of her absence to take his leave without saying good night to her. Next day they met again, impatient to resume their interrupted conversation. They did not succeed, yet circumstances were favorable to them. They went a walk with Frau von Kerich and had plenty of opportunity for talking as much as they liked. But Jean Christophe could not speak, and he was so unhappy that he stayed as far away as possible from Minna, and she pretended not to notice his discourtesy, but she was piqued by it and showed it. When Jean Christophe did at last contrive to utter a few words, she listened icily. He had hardly the courage to finish his sentence. They were coming to the end of the walk. Time was flying, and he was wretched at not having been able to make use of it. A week passed. They thought they had mistaken their feeling for each other. They were not sure but that they had dreamed the scene of that evening. Minna was resentful against Jean Christophe. Jean Christophe was afraid of meeting her alone. They were colder to each other than ever. A day came when it had rained all morning and part of the afternoon. They had stayed in the house without speaking, reading, yawning, looking out of the window. They were bored and cross. About four o'clock the sky cleared. They ran into the garden. They leaned their elbows on the terrace wall and looked down at the lawns sloping to the river. The earth was steaming. A soft mist was ascending to the sun. Little raindrops glittered on the grass. The smell of the damp earth and the perfume of the flowers intermingled. Around them buzzed a golden swarm of bees. They were side by side, not looking at each other. They could not bring themselves to break the silence. A bee came up and clung awkwardly to a clump of wisteria heavy with rain and sent a shower of water down on them. They both laughed, and at once they felt that they were no longer cross with each other and were friends again, but still they did not look at each other. Suddenly, without turning her head, she took his hand and said, Come! She led him quickly to the little labyrinth with its box-bordered paths, which was in the middle of the grove. They climbed up the slope, slipping on the soaking ground, and the wet trees shook out their branches over them. Near the top she stopped to breathe. Wait, wait, she said in a low voice, trying to take breath. He looked at her. She was looking away. She was smiling, breathing hard. With her lips parted, her hand was trembling in Jean Christophe's. They felt the blood throbbing in their linked hands and their trembling fingers. Around them all was silent. The pale shoots of the trees were quivering in the sun. A gentle rain dropped from the leaves with silvery sounds, and in the sky were the shrill cries of swallows. She turned her head towards him. It was a lightning flash. She flung her arms about his neck. He flung himself into her arms. Minna, Minna, my darling, I love you, Jean Christophe, I love you. They sat on a wet wooden seat. They were filled with love, sweet, profound, absurd. Everything else had vanished. No more egoism, no more vanity, no more reservation. Love, love. That is what their laughing, tearful eyes were saying. The cold coquette of a girl, the proud boy, were devoured with the need of self-sacrifice, of giving, of suffering, of dying for each other. They did not know each other. They were not the same. Everything was changed. Their hearts, their faces, their eyes, 
gave out a radiance of the most touching kindness and tenderness. Moments of purity, of self-denial, of absolute giving of themselves, which through life will never return. After a desperate murmuring of words and passionate promises to belong to each other forever, after kisses and incoherent words of delight, they saw that it was late, and they ran back hand in hand, almost falling in the narrow paths, bumping into trees, feeling nothing, blind and drunk with the joy of it. When he left her, he did not go home. He could not have gone to sleep. He left the town and walked over the fields. He walked blindly through the night. The air was fresh, the country dark and deserted. A screech owl hooted shrilly. Jean Christophe went on like a sleepwalker. The little lights of the town quivered on the plain and the stars in the dark sky. He sat on a wall by the road and suddenly burst into tears. He did not know why. He was too happy, and the excess of his joy was compounded of sadness and delight. There was in it thankfulness for his happiness, pity for those who were not happy, a melancholy and sweet feeling of the frailty of things, the mad joy of living. He wept for delight and slept in the midst of his tears. When he awoke, dawn was peeping. White mists floated over the river and veiled the town where Minna, worn out, was sleeping, while in her heart was the light of her smile of happiness. They contrived to meet again in the garden next morning and told their love once more, but now the divine unconsciousness of it all was gone. She was a little playing the part of the girl in love, and he, though more sincere, was also playing a part. They talked of what their life should be. He regretted his poverty and humble estate. She affected to be generous and enjoyed her generosity. She said that she cared nothing for money. That was true, for she knew nothing about it, having never known the lack of it. He promised that he would become a great artist. That she thought fine and amusing, like a novel. She thought it her duty to behave really like a woman in love. She read poetry. She was sentimental. He was touched by the infection. He took pains with his dress. He was absurd. He set a guard upon his speech. He was pretentious. Frau von Kerich watched him and laughed, and asked herself what could have made him so stupid. But they had moments of marvelous poetry, and these would suddenly burst upon them out of dull days, like sunshine through a mist. A look, a gesture, a meaningless word, and they were bathed in happiness. They had their goodbyes in the evening on the dimly lighted stairs, and their eyes would seek each other, divine each other through the half-darkness, and the thrill of their hands as they touched, the trembling in their voices, all those little nothings that fed their memory at night, as they slept so lightly that the chiming of each hour would awake them, and their hearts would sing, I am loved, like the murmuring of a stream. They discovered the charm of things. Spring smiled with a marvelous sweetness. The heavens were brilliant. The air was soft as they had never been before. All the town, the red roofs, the old walls, the cobbled streets, showed with a kindly charm that moved Jean Christophe. At night, when everybody was asleep, Minna would get up from her bed and stand by the window, drowsy and feverish, and in the afternoon, when he was not there, she would sit in a swing and dream with a book on her knees, her eyes half-closed, sleepy and lazily happy, mind and body hovering in the spring air. She would spend hours at the piano, with a patience exasperating to others, going over and over again scales and passages which made her turn pale and cold with emotion. She would weep when she heard Schumann's music. She felt full of pity and kindness for all creatures, and so did he. They would give money stealthily to poor people whom they met in the street, and would then exchange glances of compassion. They were happy in their kindness. To tell the truth, they were kind only by fits and starts. 
Minna suddenly discovered how sad was the humble life of devotion of old Frida, who had been a servant in the house since her mother's childhood, and at once she ran and hugged her, to the great astonishment of the good old creature who was busy mending the linen in the kitchen. But that did not keep her from speaking harshly to her a few hours later, when Frida did not come at once on the sound of the bell. And Jean Christophe, who was consumed with love for all humanity and would turn aside so as not to crush an insect, was entirely indifferent to his own family. By a strange reaction he was colder and more curt with them the more affectionate he was to all other creatures. He hardly gave thought to them. He spoke abruptly to them and found no interest in seeing them. Both in Jean Christophe and Minna, their kindness was only a surfeit of tenderness which overflowed at intervals to the benefit of the first comer. Except for these overflowings, they were more egoistic than ever, for their minds were filled only with the one thought, and everything was brought back to that. How much of Jean Christophe's life was filled with the girl's face! What emotion was in him when he saw her white frock in the distance, when he was looking for her in the garden, when at the theatre, sitting a few yards away from their empty places, he heard the door of their box open and the mocking voice that he knew so well, when in some outside conversation the dear name of Kerich cropped up. He would go pale, and blush. For a moment or two he would see and hear nothing, and then there would be a rush of blood over all his body, the assault of unknown forces. The little German girl, naive and sensual, had odd little tricks. She would place her ring on a little pile of flour, and he would have to get it again and again with his teeth without whitening his nose, or she would pass a thread through a biscuit and put one end of it in her mouth, and one in his, and then they had to nibble the thread to see who could get to the biscuit first. Their faces would come together, they would feel each other's breathing, their lips would touch, and they would laugh forcedly while their hands would turn to ice. Jean Christophe would feel a desire to bite, to hurt, he would fling back, and she would go on laughing forcedly. They would turn away, pretend indifference, and steal glances at each other. These disturbing games had a disquieting attraction for them. They wanted to play them, and yet avoided them. Jean Christophe was fearful of them, and preferred even the constraint of the meetings when Frau von Kerich or someone else was present. So outside presence could break in upon the converse of their loving hearts. Constraint only made their love sweeter and more intense. Everything gained infinitely in value. A word, a movement of the lips, a glance, were enough to make the rich new treasure of their inner life shine through the dull veil of ordinary existence. They alone could see it, or so they thought, and smiled, happy in their little mysteries. Their words were no more than those of a drawing-room conversation about trivial matters. To them, they were an unending song of love. They read the most fleeting changes in their faces and voices, as in an open book. They could have read as well with their eyes closed, for they had only to listen to their hearts, to hear in them the echo of the heart of the Beloved. They were full of confidence in life, in happiness, in themselves. Their hopes were boundless. They loved, they were loved, happy without a shadow, without a doubt, without a fear of the future, wonderful serenity of those days of spring, not a cloud in the sky, a faith so fresh that it seems that nothing can ever tarnish it, a joy so abounding that nothing can ever exhaust it. Are they living? Are they dreaming? Doubtless they are dreaming. There is nothing in common between life and their dream, nothing except in that moment of magic. They are but a dream themselves. Their being has melted away at the touch of love. End of section 19。section 20 of Jean Christophe, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean-Christophe, Volume 1, by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Morning 3, Part 4. It was not long before Frau von Kerich perceived their little intrigue, which they thought very subtly managed, though it was very clumsy. Minna had suspected it from the moment when her mother had entered suddenly one day when she was talking to Jean Christophe and standing as near to him as she could, and on the click of the door they had darted apart as quickly as possible, covered with confusion. Frau von Kerich had pretended to see nothing. Minna was almost sorry. She would have liked a tussle with her mother. It would have been more romantic. Her mother took care to give her no opportunity for it. She was too clever to be anxious, or to make any remark about it. But to Minna she talked ironically about Jean Christophe, and made merciless fun of his foibles. She demolished him in a few words. She did not do it deliberately. She acted upon instinct, with the treachery natural to a woman who is defending her own. It was useless for Minna to resist, and sulk, and be impertinent, and go on denying the truth of her remarks. There was only too much justification for them, and Frau von Kerich had a cruel skill in flicking the raw spot. The largeness of Jean Christophe's boots, the ugliness of his clothes, his ill-brushed hat, his provincial accent, his ridiculous way of bowing, the vulgarity of his loud-voicedness. Nothing was forgotten which might sting Minna's vanity. Such remarks were always simple and made by the way. They never took the form of a set speech, and when Minna, irritated, got upon her high horse to reply, Frau von Kerich would innocently be off on another subject. But the blow struck home, and Minna was sore under it. She began to look at Jean Christophe with a less indulgent eye. He was vaguely conscious of it, and uneasily asked her, "'Why do you look at me like that?' And she answered, "'Oh, nothing.' But a moment later, when he was merry, she would harshly reproach him for laughing so loudly. He was abashed. He never would have thought that he would have to take care not to laugh too loudly with her. All his gaiety was spoiled. Or, when he was talking absolutely at his ease, she would absently interrupt him to make some unpleasant remark about his clothes, or she would take exception to his common expressions with pedantic aggressiveness. Then he would lose all desire to talk, and sometimes would be cross. Then he would persuade himself that these ways which so irritated him were a proof of Minna's interest in him, and she would persuade herself also that it was so. He would try humbly to do better, but she was never much pleased with him, for he hardly ever succeeded. But he had no time, nor had Minna, to perceive the change that was taking place in her. Easter came, and Minna had to go with her mother to stay with some relations near Weimar. During the last week before the separation, they returned to the intimacy of the first days. Except for little outbursts of impatience, Minna was more affectionate than ever. On the eve of her departure, they went for a long walk in the park. She led Jean Christophe mysteriously to the arbor, and put about his neck a little scented bag, in which she had placed a lock of her hair. They renewed their eternal vows, and swore to write to each other every day, and they chose a star out of the sky, and arranged to look at it every evening at the same time. The fatal day arrived. Ten times during the night he had asked himself, Where will she be tomorrow? And now he thought, It is today. This morning she is still here. Tonight she will be here no longer. He went to her house before eight o'clock. She was not up. He set out to walk in the park. He could not. He returned. The passages were full of boxes and parcels. He sat down in a corner of the room, listening for the creaking of doors and floors, and recognizing the footsteps on the floor above him. 
Frau von Karich passed, smiled as she saw him, and, without stopping, threw him a mocking, Good day. Minna came at last. She was pale. Her eyelids were swollen. She had not slept any more than he during the night. She gave orders busily to the servants. She held out her hand to Jean Christophe, and went on talking to old Frida. She was ready to go. Frau von Kerich came back. They argued about a hat-box. Minna seemed to pay no attention to Jean Christophe, who was standing, forgotten and unhappy, by the piano. She went out with her mother, then came back. From the door she called out to Frau von Kerich. She closed the door. They were alone. She ran to him, took his hand, and dragged him into the little room next door. Its shutters were closed. Then she put her face up to Jean Christophe's and kissed him wildly. With tears in her eyes, she said, You promise, you promise that you will love me always? They sobbed quietly and made convulsive efforts to choke their sobs down so as not to be heard. They broke apart as they heard footsteps approaching. Minna dried her eyes and resumed her busy air with the servants, but her voice trembled. He succeeded in snatching her handkerchief, which she had let fall, her little dirty handkerchief, crumpled and wet with her tears. He went to the station with his friends in their carriage. Sitting opposite each other, Jean Christophe and Minna hardly dared look at each other for fear of bursting into tears. Their hands sought each other and clasped until they hurt. Frau von Kerich watched them with quizzical good humor and seemed not to see anything. The time arrived. Jean Christophe was standing by the door of the train when it began to move, and he ran alongside the carriage, not looking where he was going, jostling against porters, his eyes fixed on Minna's eyes, until the train was gone. He went on running until it was lost from sight. Then he stopped, out of breath and found himself on the station platform among people of no importance. He went home, and, fortunately, his family were all out, and all through the morning he wept. For the first time he knew the frightful sorrow of parting, an intolerable torture for all loving hearts. The world is empty, life is empty, all is empty. The heart is choked, it is impossible to breathe, there is mortal agony. It is difficult, impossible, to live, especially when all around you there are the traces of the departed loved one, when everything about you is forever calling up her image, when you remain in the surroundings in which you lived together, she and you, when it is a torment to try to live again in the same places, the happiness that is gone. Then, it is as though an abyss were opened at your feet. You lean over it. You turn giddy. You almost fall. You fall. You think you are face to face with death. And so you are. Parting is one of his faces. You watch the beloved of your heart pass away. Life is effaced. Only a black hole is left. Nothingness. Jean Christophe went and visited all the beloved spots so as to suffer more. Frau von Kerich had left him the key to the garden so that he could go there while they were away. He went there that very day and was like to choke with sorrow. It seemed to him as he entered that he might find there a little of her who was gone. He found only too much of her. Her image hovered over all the lawns. He expected to see her appear at all the corners of the paths. He knew well that she would not appear, but he tormented himself with pretending that she might, and he went over the tracks of his memories of love, the path to the labyrinth, the terrace carpeted with wisteria, the seat in the arbor, and he inflicted torture on himself by saying, A week ago, three days ago, yesterday it was so, Yesterday she was here, this very morning. He racked his heart with these thoughts until he had to stop, choking, and like to die. In his sorrow was mingled anger with himself for having wasted all that time and not having made use of it. So many minutes, so many hours, 
when he had enjoyed the infinite happiness of seeing her, breathing her, and feeding upon her, and he had not appreciated it. He had let the time go by, without having tasted to the full every tiny moment. And now? Now it was too late. Irreparable! Irreparable! He went home. His family seemed odious to him. He could not bear their faces, their gestures, their fatuous conversation, the same as that of the preceding day, the same as that of all the preceding days, always the same. They went on living their usual life, as though no such misfortune had come to pass in their midst, and the town had no more idea of it than they. The people were all going about their affairs, laughing, noisy, busy. The crickets were chirping, the sky was bright. He hated them all. He felt himself crushed by this universal egoism. But he himself was more egoistic than the whole universe. Nothing was worth while to him. He had no kindness. He loved nobody. He passed several lamentable days. His work absorbed him again automatically. But he had no heart for living. One evening, when he was at supper with his family, silent and depressed, the postman knocked at the door and left a letter for him. His heart knew the sender of it before he had seen the handwriting. Four pairs of eyes, fixed on him with undisguised curiosity, waited for him to read it, clutching at the hope that this interruption might take them out of their usual boredom. He placed the letter by his plate and would not open it, pretending carelessly that he knew what it was about. But his brothers, annoyed, would not believe it, and went on prying at it. And so he was in tortures until the meal was ended. Then he was free to lock himself up in his room. His heart was beating so that he almost tore the letter as he opened it. He trembled to think what might be in it. But as soon as he had glanced over the first words, he was filled with joy. A few very affectionate words. Minna was writing to him by stealth. She called him Dear Christline, and told him that she had wept much, had looked at the star every evening, that she had been to Frankfurt, which was a splendid town where there were wonderful shops, but that she had never bothered about anything because she was thinking of him. She reminded him that he had sworn to be faithful to her and not to see anybody while she was away so that he might think only of her. She wanted him to work all the time while she was gone, so as to make himself famous, and her too. She ended by asking him if he remembered the little room where they had said goodbye on the morning when she had left him. She assured him that she would be there still in thought, and that she would still say goodbye to him in the same way. She signed herself, Eternally yours, eternally. And she had added a postscript, bidding him buy a straw hat instead of his ugly felt. All the distinguished people there were wearing them, a coarse straw hat with a broad blue ribbon. Jean-Christophe read the letter four times before he could quite take it all in. He was so overwhelmed that he could not even be happy, and suddenly he felt so tired that he lay down and read and reread the letter and kissed it again and again. He put it under his pillow, and his hand was forever making sure that it was there. An ineffable sense of well-being permeated his whole soul. He slept all through the night. His life became more tolerable. He had ever-sweet, soaring thoughts of Minna. He set about answering her, but he could not write freely to her. He had to hide his feelings. That was painful and difficult for him. He continued clumsily to conceal his love beneath formulae of ceremonious politeness, which he always used in an absurd fashion. When he had sent it, he awaited Minna's reply, and only lived in expectation of it. To win patience, he tried to go for walks and to read, but his thoughts were only of Minna. He went on crazily repeating her name over and over again. He was so abject in his love and worship of her name that he carried everywhere with him a volume of lessing because the name of Minna occurred in it, 
and every day when he left the theater he went a long distance out of his way so as to pass a mercery shop on whose signboard the five adored letters were written. He reproached himself for wasting time when she had bid him so urgently to work so as to make her famous. The naive vanity of her request touched him as a mark of her confidence in him. He resolved, by way of fulfilling it, to write a work which should be not only dedicated but consecrated to her. He could not have written any other at that time. Hardly had the scheme occurred to him than musical ideas rushed in upon him. It was like a flood of water accumulated in a reservoir for several months, until it should suddenly rush down, breaking all its dams. He did not leave his room for a week. Louisa left his dinner at the door, for he did not allow even her to enter. He wrote a quintet for clarinet and strings. The first movement was a poem of youthful hope and desire. The last, a lover's joke, in which Jean Christophe's wild humor peeped out, but the whole work was written for the sake of the second movement, the Larghetto, in which Jean Christophe had depicted an ardent and ingenuous little soul, which was, or was meant to be, a portrait of Minna. No one would have recognized it, least of all herself. But the great thing was that it was perfectly recognizable to himself, and he had a thrill of pleasure in the illusion of feeling that he had caught the essence of his beloved. No work had ever been so easily or happily written. It was an outlet for the excess of love which the parting had stored up in him, and at the same time his care for the work of art, the effort necessary to dominate and concentrate his passion into a beautiful and clear form, gave him a healthiness of mind, a balance in his faculties, which gave him a sort of physical delight, a sovereign enjoyment known to every creative artist. While he is creating, he escapes altogether from the slavery of desire and sorrow. He becomes then master in his turn, and all that gave him joy or suffering seems then to him to be only the fine play of his will. Such moments are too short, for when they are done, he finds about him, more heavy than ever, the chains of reality. While Jean Christophe was busy with his work, he hardly had time to think of his parting from Minna. He was living with her. Minna was no longer in Minna. She was in himself. But when he had finished, he found that he was alone, more alone than before, more weary, exhausted by the effort. He remembered that it was a fortnight since he had written to Minna, and that she had not replied. He wrote to her again and this time he could not bring himself altogether to exercise the constraint which he had imposed on himself for the first letter. He reproached Minna jocularly, for he did not believe it himself, with having forgotten him. He scolded her for her laziness and teased her affectionately. He spoke of his work with much mystery, so as to rouse her curiosity, and because he wished to keep it as a surprise for her when she returned, he described minutely the hat that he had bought, and he told how, to carry out the little despot's orders, for he had taken all her commands literally, he did not go out at all, and said that he was ill as an excuse for refusing invitations. He did not add that he was even on bad terms with the Grand Duke, because, in excess of zeal, he had refused to go to a party at the palace to which he had been invited." The whole letter was full of a careless joy, and conveyed those little secrets so dear to lovers. He imagined that Minna alone had the key to them, and thought himself very clever, because he had carefully replaced every word of love with words of friendship. After he had written, he felt comforted for a moment, first because the letter had given him the illusion of conversation with his absent fair but chiefly because he had no doubt but that Minna would reply to it at once. He was very patient for the three days which he had allowed for the post to take his letter to Minna and bring back her answer, but when the fourth day had passed, he began once more to find life difficult. He had no energy or interest in things, except during the hour before the post's arrival. Then he was trembling with impatience. He became superstitious and looked for the smallest sign, the crackling of the fire, a chance word, to give him an assurance that the letter would come. 
Once that hour was past, he would collapse again. No more work, no more walks. The only object of his existence was to wait for the next post, and all his energy was expended in finding strength to wait for so long. But when evening came and all hope was gone for the day, then he was crushed. It seemed to him that he could never live until the morrow, and he would stay for hours, sitting at his table, without speaking or thinking, without even the power to go to bed, until some remnant of his will would take him off to it, and he would sleep heavily, haunted by stupid dreams, which made him think that the night would never end. This continual expectation became at length a physical torture, an actual illness. Jean Christophe went so far as to suspect his father, his brother, even the postman, of having taken the letter and hidden it from him. He was racked with uneasiness. He never doubted Minna's fidelity for an instant. If she did not write, it must be because she was ill, dying, perhaps dead. Then he rushed to his pen and wrote a third letter a few heart-rending lines in which he had no more thought of guarding his feelings than of taking care with his spelling. The time for the post to go was drawing near. He had crossed out and smudged the sheet as he turned it over, dirtied the envelope as he closed it. No matter. He could not wait until the next post. He ran and hurled his letter into the box and waited in mortal agony. On the next night but one, he had a clear vision of Minna, ill, calling to him. He got up and was on the point of setting out on foot to go to her. But where? Where should he find her? On the fourth morning Minna's letter came at last, hardly a half-sheet, cold and stiff. Minna said that she did not understand what could have filled him with such stupid fears, that she was quite well, that she had no time to write, and begged him not to get so excited in future and not to write any more. Jean Christophe was stunned. He never doubted Minna's sincerity. He blamed himself. He thought that Minna was justly annoyed by the impudent and absurd letters that he had written. He thought himself an idiot and beat at his head with his fist. But it was all in vain. He was forced to feel that Minna did not love him as much as he loved her. The days that followed were so mournful that it is impossible to describe them. Nothingness cannot be described. Deprived of the only boon that made living worthwhile for him, his letters to Minna, Jean Christophe now only lived mechanically, and the only thing which interested him at all was when, in the evening, as he was going to bed, he ticked off on the calendar, like a schoolboy, one of the interminable days which lay between himself and Minna's return. The day of the return was past. They ought to have been at home a week. Feverish excitement had succeeded Jean Christophe's prostration. Minna had promised, when she left, to advise him of the day and hour of their arrival. He waited from moment to moment to go and meet them, and he tied himself up in a web of guesses as to the reasons for their delay. End of section 20《Section 21 of Jean Christophe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1, by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Morning 3, Part 5. One evening, one of their neighbors, a friend of his grandfather, Fisher, the furniture dealer, came in to smoke and chat with Melchior after dinner, as he often did. Jean Christophe, in torment, was going up to his room after waiting for the postman to pass, when a word made him tremble. Fisher said that next day he had to go early in the morning to the Kerichs to hang up the curtains. Jean Christophe stopped dead and asked, "'Have they returned?' "'You, Ag, you know that as well as I do,' said old Fisher roguishly. "'Fine weather. They came back the day before yesterday.' Jean Christophe heard no more. He left the room and got ready to go out. His mother, who for some time had secretly been watching him without his knowing it, followed him into the lobby and asked him timidly where he was going. 
He made no answer and went out. He was hurt. He ran to the Carrick's house. It was nine o'clock in the evening. They were both in the drawing room and did not appear to be surprised to see him. They said, Good evening, quietly. Minna was busy writing and held out her hand over the table and went on with her letter, vaguely asking him for his news. She asked him to forgive her discourtesy and pretended to be listening to what he said, but she interrupted him to ask something of her mother. He had prepared touching words concerning all that he had suffered during her absence. He could hardly summon a few words. No one was interested in them, and he had not the heart to go on. It all rang so false. When Minna had finished her letter, she took up some work, and sitting a little away from him began to tell him about her travels. She talked about the pleasant weeks she had spent, riding on horseback, country house life, interesting society. She got excited gradually, and made allusions to events and people whom Jean Christophe did not know, and the memory of them made her mother and herself laugh. Jean Christophe felt that he was a stranger during the story. He did not know how to take it, and laughed awkwardly. He never took his eyes from Minna's face, beseeching her to look at him, imploring her to throw him a glance for alms. But when she did look at him, which was not often, for she addressed herself more to her mother than to him, her eyes, like her voice, were cold and indifferent. Was she so constrained because of her mother, or was it that he did not understand? He wished to speak to her alone, but Frau von Karach never left them for a moment. He tried to bring the conversation round to some subject interesting to himself. He spoke of his work and his plans. He was dimly conscious that Minna was evading him, and instinctively he tried to interest her in himself. Indeed, she seemed to listen attentively enough. She broke in upon his narrative with various interjections, which were never very apt, but always seemed to be full of interest. But just as he was beginning to hope once more, carried off his feet by one of her charming smiles, he saw Minna put her little hand to her lips and yawn. He broke off short. She saw that, and asked his pardon amiably, saying that she was tired. He got up, thinking that they would persuade him to stay, but they said nothing. He spun out his goodbye and waited for a word to ask him to come again next day. There was no suggestion of it. He had to go. Minna did not take him to the door. She held out her hand to him, an indifferent hand that drooped limply in his, and he took his leave of them in the middle of the room. He went home with terror in his heart. Of the Minna of two months before, of his beloved Minna, nothing was left. What had happened? What had become of her? For a poor boy who has never yet experienced the continual change, the complete disappearance, and the absolute renovation of living souls, of which the majority are not so much souls as collections of souls in succession changing and dying away continually, the simple truth was too cruel for him to be able to believe it. He rejected the idea of it in terror and tried to persuade himself that he had not been able to see properly, and that Minna was just the same. He decided to go again to the house next morning, and to talk to her at all costs. He did not sleep. Through the night he counted one after another the chimes of the clock. From one o'clock on he was rambling round the Carrick's house. He entered it as soon as he could. He did not see Minna, but Frau von Kerich. Always busy and an early riser, she was watering the pots of flowers on the veranda. She gave a mocking cry when she saw Jean Christophe. Ah, she said, it is you. I am glad you have come. I have something to talk to you about. Wait a moment. She went in for a moment to put down her watering can and to dry her hands, and came back with a little smile as she saw Jean Christophe's discomfiture. He was conscious of the approach of disaster. "'Come into the garden,' she said. "'We shall be quieter.' In the garden, that was full still of his love, he followed Frau von Kerich. She did not hasten to speak, and enjoyed the boy's uneasiness. "'Let us sit here,' she said at last. 
They were sitting on the seat in the place where Minna had held up her lips to him on the eve of her departure. "'I think you know what is the matter,' said Frau von Karach, looking serious so as to complete his confusion. "'I should never have thought it of you, Jean Christophe. I thought you a serious boy. I had every confidence in you. I should never have thought that you would abuse it to try and turn my daughter's head. She was in your keeping.' You ought to have shown respect for her, respect for me, respect for yourself. There was a light irony in her accents. Frau von Kerich attached not the least importance to this childish love affair, but Jean Christophe was not conscious of it, and her reproaches, which he took, as he took everything tragically, went to his heart. But, madam, but, madam, he stammered, with tears in his eyes. I have never abused your confidence. Please do not think that. I am not a bad man, that I swear. I love Fraulein Minna. I love her with all my soul, and I wish to marry her. Frau von Kerich smiled. No, my poor boy, she said with that kindly smile in which was so much disdain, as at last he was to understand. No, it is impossible. It is just a childish folly. Why? Why? he asked. He took her hands, not believing that she could be speaking seriously, and almost reassured by the new softness in her voice. She smiled still, and said, Because, he insisted, with ironical deliberation, she did not take him altogether seriously. She told him that he had no fortune, that Minna had different tastes. He protested that that made no difference, that he would be rich, famous, that he would win honors, money, all that Minna could desire. Frau von Karach looked skeptical. She was amused by his self-confidence, and only shook her head by way of saying no. But he stuck to it. No, Jean Christophe, she said firmly. No, it is not worth arguing. It is impossible. It is not only a question of money. So many things. The position... She had no need to finish. That was a needle that pierced to his very marrow. His eyes were opened. He saw the irony of the friendly smile. He saw the coldness of the kindly look. He understood suddenly what it was that separated him from this woman whom he loved as a son, this woman who seemed to treat him like a mother. He was conscious of all that was patronizing and disdainful in her affection. He got up. He was pale. Frau von Kerich went on talking to him in her caressing voice. But it was the end. He heard no more the music of the words. He perceived under every word the falseness of that elegant soul. He could not answer a word. He went. Everything about him was going round and round. When he regained his room, he flung himself on his bed and gave way to a fit of anger and injured pride, just as he used to do when he was a little boy. He bit his pillow. He crammed his handkerchief into his mouth so that no one should hear him crying. He hated Frau von Kerich. He hated Minna. He despised them mightily. It seemed to him that he had been insulted, and he trembled with shame and rage. He had to reply, to take immediate action. If he could not avenge himself, he would die. He got up and wrote an idiotically violent letter. Madam, I do not know if, as you say, you have been deceived in me. But I do know that I have been cruelly deceived in you. I thought that you were my friends. You said so. You pretended to be so. And I loved you more than my life. I see now that it was all a lie, that your affection for me was only a sham. You made use of me. I amused you, provided you with entertainment, made music for you. I was your servant. Your servant. That I am not. I am no man's servant. You have made me feel cruelly that I had no right to love your daughter. Nothing in the world can prevent my heart from loving where it loves, and if I am not your equal in rank, I am as noble as you. It is the heart that ennobles a man. 
If I am not a count, I have perhaps more honor than many counts, lackey or count. When a man insults me, I despise him. I despise as much anyone who pretends to be noble and is not noble of soul. Farewell. You have mistaken me. You have deceived me. I detest you. He who in spite of you loves and will love till death, Fraulein Minna, because she is his, and nothing can take her from him. Hardly had he thrown his letter into the box than he was filled with terror at what he had done. He tried not to think of it, but certain phrases cropped up in his memory. He was in a cold sweat as he thought of Frau von Kerrick reading those enormities. At first he was upheld by his very despair, but next day he saw that his letter could only bring about a final separation from Minna, and that seemed to him the direst of misfortunes. He still hoped that Frau von Kerrick, who knew his violent fits, would not take it seriously, that she would only reprimand him severely, and, who knows, that she would be touched, perhaps, by the sincerity of his passion. One word, and he would have thrown himself at her feet. He waited for five days. Then came a letter. She said, Dear Sir, since, as you say, there has been a misunderstanding between us, it would be wise not any further to prolong it. I should be very sorry to force upon you a relationship which has become painful to you. You will think it natural, therefore, that we should break it off. I hope that you will, in time to come, have no lack of other friends who will be able to appreciate you as you wish to be appreciated. I have no doubt as to your future, and from a distance shall, with sympathy, follow your progress in your musical career. Kind regards, Josepha von Kerich. The most bitter reproaches would have been less cruel. Jean Christophe saw that he was lost. It is possible to reply to an unjust accusation. But what is to be done against the negativeness of such polite indifference? He raged against it. He thought that he would never see Minna again, and he could not bear it. He felt how little all the pride in the world weighs against a little love. He forgot his dignity. He became cowardly. He wrote more letters, in which he implored forgiveness. They were no less stupid than the letter in which he had railed against her. They evoked no response, and everything was said. He nearly died of it. He thought of killing himself. He thought of murder. At least he imagined that he thought of it. He was possessed by incendiary and murderous desires. People have little idea of the paroxysm of love or hate which sometimes devours the hearts of children. It was the most terrible crisis of his childhood. It ended his childhood. It stiffened his will. But it came near to breaking it forever. He found life impossible. He would sit for hours with his elbows on the window sill, looking down into the courtyard, and dreaming, as he used to when he was a little boy, of some means of escaping from the torture of life when it became too great. The remedy was there, under his eyes. Immediate. Immediate? How could one know? Perhaps after hours, centuries, horrible sufferings. But so utter was his childish despair that he let himself be carried away by the giddy round of such thoughts. Louisa saw that he was suffering, she could not gauge exactly what was happening to him, but her instinct gave her a dim warning of danger. She tried to approach her son, to discover his sorrow so as to console him. But the poor woman had lost the habit of talking intimately to Jean Christophe. For many years he had kept his thoughts to himself, and she had been too much taken up by the material cares of life to find time to discover them or divine them. Now that she would so gladly have come to his aid, she knew not what to do. She hovered about him like a soul in torment. She would gladly have found words to bring him comfort, and she dared not speak for fear of irritating him. And in spite of all her care, she did irritate him by her every gesture and by her very presence, for she was not very adroit, and he was not very indulgent. And yet he loved her, they loved each other, but so little is needed to part two creatures who are dear to each other and love each other with all their hearts. 
a too violent expression, an awkward gesture, a harmless twitching of an eye or a nose, a trick of eating, walking, or laughing, a physical constraint which is beyond analysis. You say that these things are nothing, and yet they are all the world. Often they are enough to keep a mother and a son, a brother and a brother, a friend and a friend, who live in proximity to each other, forever strangers to each other. Jean Christophe did not find in his mother's grief a sufficient prop in the crisis through which he was passing. Besides, what is the affection of others to the egoism of passion preoccupied with itself? One night, when his family were sleeping, and he was sitting by his desk, not thinking or moving, he was engulfed in his perilous ideas, when a sound of footsteps resounded down the little silent street, and a knock on the door brought him from his stupor. There was a murmuring of thick voices. He remembered that his father had not come in, and he thought angrily that they were bringing him back drunk, as they had done a week or two before, when they had found him lying in the street. For Melchior had abandoned all restraint, and was more and more the victim of his vice. Though his athletic health seemed not in the least to suffer from an excess and a recklessness which would have killed any other man, he ate enough for four, drank until he dropped, passed whole nights out of doors in icy rain, was knocked down and stunned in brawls, and would get up again next day with his rowdy gaiety, wanting everybody about him to be gay too. Louisa, hurrying up, rushed to open the door. Jean Christophe, who had not budged, stopped his ears so as not to hear Melchior's vicious voice and the tittering comments of the neighbors. Suddenly a strange terror seized him. For no reason he began to tremble, with his face hidden in his hands, and on the instant a piercing cry made him raise his head. He rushed to the door, in the midst of a group of men talking in low voices, in the dark passage, lit only by the flickering light of a lantern, lying, just as his grandfather had done, on a stretcher, was a body dripping with water, motionless. Louisa was clinging to it and sobbing. They had just found Melchior drowned in the mill race. Jean Christophe gave a cry. Everything else vanished. All his other sorrows were swept aside, he threw himself on his father's body by Louise's side, and they wept together. Seated by the bedside, watching Melchior's last sleep, on whose face was now a severe and solemn expression, he felt the dark peace of death enter into his soul. His childish passion was gone from him like a fit of fever. The icy breath of the grave had taken it all away. Minna, his pride, his love— and himself. Alas, what misery! How small everything showed by the side of this reality, the only reality, death. Was it worth while to suffer so much, to desire so much, to be so much put about to come in the end to that? He watched his father's sleep, and he was filled with an infinite pity. He remembered the smallest of his acts of kindness and tenderness. For with all his faults, Melchior was not bad. There was much good in him. He loved his family. He was honest. He had a little of the uncompromising probity of the crafts, which, in all questions of morality and honor, suffered no discussion, and never would admit the least of those small moral impurities which so many people in society regard not altogether as faults. He was brave, and whenever there was any danger, faced it with a sort of enjoyment. If he was extravagant himself, he was so for others too. He could not bear anybody to be sad, and very gladly gave away all that belonged to him, and did not belong to him, to the poor devils he met by the wayside. All his qualities appeared to Jean Christophe now, and he invented some of them, or exaggerated them. It seemed to him that he had misunderstood his father. He reproached himself with not having loved him enough. He saw him as broken by life. He thought he heard that unhappy soul 
drifting, too weak to struggle, crying out for the life so uselessly lost. He heard that lamentable entreaty that had so cut him to the heart one day. Jean Christophe, do not despise me. And he was overwhelmed by remorse. He threw himself on the bed and kissed the dead face and wept. And as he had done that day, he said again, Dear father, I do not despise you. I love you. Forgive me. But that piteous entreaty was not appeased, and went on. Do not despise me, do not despise me. And suddenly Jean Christophe saw himself lying in the place of the dead man. He heard the terrible words coming from his own lips. He felt weighing on his heart the despair of a useless life, irreparably lost. And he thought in terror, Ah, everything! all the suffering, all the misery in the world, rather than come to that. How near he had been to it! Had he not all but yielded to the temptation to snap off his life himself, cowardly to escape his sorrow? As if all the sorrows, all betrayals, were not childish griefs beside the torture and the crime of self-betrayal, denial of faith, of self-contempt in death. He saw that life was a battle without armistice, without mercy, in which he who wishes to be a man worthy of the name of a man must forever fight against whole armies of invisible enemies, against the murderous forces of nature, uneasy desires, dark thoughts, treacherously leading him to degradation and destruction. He saw that he had been on the point of falling into the trap he saw that happiness and love were only the friends of a moment to lead the heart to disarm and abdicate. And the little Puritan of fifteen heard the voice of his God, Go, go, and never rest. But whither, Lord, shall I go? Whatsoever I do, whithersoever I go, is not the end always the same? Is not the end of all things in that? Go on to death, you who must die. Go and suffer, you who must suffer. You do not live to be happy. You live to fulfill my law. Suffer, die. But be what you must be, a man. End of section 21《Section 22 of Jean Christophe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1 by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Youth 1, Part 1. Youth. Christophori facem dae quacumque tueris, ilanempe dae non morte mala morieris. 1. The House of Euler. The house was plunged in silence. Since Melchior's death everything seemed dead. Now that his loud voice was stilled, from morning to night nothing was heard but the wearisome murmuring of the river. Christophe hurled himself into his work. He took a fiercely angry pleasure in self-castigation for having wished to be happy. To expressions of sympathy and kind words he made no reply, but was proud and stiff. Without a word he went about his daily task and gave his lessons with icy politeness. His pupils who knew of his misfortune were shocked by his insensibility, but those who were older and had some experience of sorrow knew that this apparent coldness might, in a child, be used only to conceal suffering, and they pitied him. He was not grateful for their sympathy. Even music could bring him no comfort. He played without pleasure and as a duty. It was as though he found a cruel joy in no longer taking pleasure in anything, or in persuading himself that he did not, in depriving himself of every reason for living, and yet going on. His two brothers, terrified by the silence of the house of death, ran away from it as quickly as possible. Rodolphe went into the office of his uncle Theodore and lived with him, and Ernest, after trying two or three trades, 
found work on one of the Rhine steamers plying between Mainz and Cologne, and he used to come back only when he wanted money. Christophe was left alone with his mother in the house, which was too large for them, and the meagerness of their resources and the payments of certain debts which had been discovered after his father's death forced them, whatever pain it might cost, to seek another more lowly and less expensive dwelling. They found a little flat, two or three rooms on the second floor of a house in the Market Street. It was a noisy district in the middle of the town, far from the river, far from the trees, far from the country and all the familiar places. But they had to consult reason, not sentiment, and Christophe found in it a fine opportunity for gratifying his bitter creed of self-mortification. Besides, the owner of the house, old Registrar Euler, was a friend of his grandfather, and knew the family. That was enough for Louisa, who was lost in her empty house and was irresistibly drawn towards those who had known the creatures whom she had loved. They got ready to leave. They took long draughts of the bitter melancholy of the last days passed by the sad, beloved fireside that was to be left forever. They dared hardly tell their sorrow. They were ashamed of it, or afraid. Each thought that they ought not to show their weakness to the other. At table, sitting alone in a dark room with half-closed shutters, they dared not raise their voices. They ate hurriedly and did not look at each other for fear of not being able to conceal their trouble. They parted as soon as they had finished. Christophe went back to his work, but as soon as he was free for a moment, he would come back, go stealthily home, and creep on tiptoe to his room or to the attic. Then he would shut the door, sit down in a corner on an old trunk or on the window ledge, or stay there without thinking, letting the indefinable buzzing and humming of the old house, which trembled with the lightest tread, thrill through him. His heart would tremble with it. He would listen anxiously for the faintest breath in or out of doors, for the creaking of floors, for all the imperceptible familiar noises. He knew them all. He would lose consciousness. His thoughts would be filled with the images of the past, and he would issue from his stupor only at the sound of St. Martin's clock, reminding him that it was time to go. In the room below him he could hear Louise's footsteps passing softly to and fro. Then for hours she could not be heard. She made no noise. Christophe would listen intently. He would go down, a little uneasy, as one is for a long time after a great misfortune. He would push the door ajar. Louisa would turn her back on him. She would be sitting in front of a cupboard in the midst of a heap of things, rags, old belongings, odd garments, treasures, which she had brought out intending to sort them. But she had no strength for it. Everything reminded her of something. She would turn and turn it in her hands and begin to dream. It would drop from her hands. She would stay for hours together with her arms hanging down, lying back exhausted in a chair, given up to a stupor of sorrow. Poor Louisa was now spending most of her life in the past, that sad past which had been very niggardly of joy for her. But she was so used to suffering that she was still grateful for the least tenderness shown to her, and the pale lights which had shone here and there in the drab days of her life were still enough to make them bright. All the evil that Melchior had done her was forgotten, she remembered only the good. Her marriage had been the great romance of her life. If Melchior had been drawn into it by a caprice, of which he had quickly repented, she had given herself with her whole heart. She thought that she was loved as much as she had loved, and to Melchior she was ever most tenderly grateful. She did not try to understand what he had become in the sequel. Incapable of seeing reality as it is, she only knew how to bear it as it is, humbly and honestly, as a woman who has no need of understanding life in order to be able to live. What she could not explain, she left to God for explanation. In her singular piety, she put upon God the responsibility for all the injustice that she had suffered at the hands of Melchior and the others, and only visited them with the good that they had given her. And so her life of misery had left her with no bitter memory. She only felt worn out, weak as she was, 
by those years of privation and fatigue. And now that Melchior was no longer there, now that two of her sons were gone from their home, and the third seemed to be able to do without her, she had lost all heart for action. She was tired, sleepy. Her will was stupefied. She was going through one of those crises of neurasthenia, which often come upon active and industrious people in the decline of life, when some unforeseen event deprives them of every reason for living. She had not the heart even to finish the stocking she was knitting, to tidy the drawer in which she was looking, to get up to shut the window. She would sit there, without a thought, without strength, save for recollection. She was conscious of her collapse, and was ashamed of it or blushed for it. She tried to hide it from her son, and Christophe, wrapped up in the egoism of his own grief, never noticed it. No doubt he was often secretly impatient with his mother's slowness in speaking and acting and doing the smallest thing. But different though her ways were from her usual activity, he never gave a thought to the matter until then. Suddenly on that day it came home to him for the first time when he surprised her in the midst of her rags, turned out on the floor, heaped up at her feet, in her arms and in her lap. Her neck was drawn out, her head was bowed, her face was stiff and rigid. When she heard him come in, she started. Her white cheeks were suffused with red. With an instinctive movement, she tried to hide the things she was holding, and muttered with an awkward smile, "'You see, I was sorting.' The sight of the poor soul stranded among the relics of the past cut to his heart, and he was filled with pity. But he spoke with a bitter asperity, and seemed to scold, to drag her from her apathy." "'Come, come, mother. You must not stay there, in the middle of all that dust, with the room all shut up. It is not good for you. You must pull yourself together, and have done with all this.' "'Yes,' she said meekly. She tried to get up to put the things back in the drawer, but she sat down again at once, and listlessly let them fall from her hands. "'Oh, I can't! I can't!' she moaned. "'I shall never finish!' He was frightened." He leaned over her. He caressed her forehead with his hands. "'Come, mother, what is it?' he said. "'Shall I help you? Are you ill?' She did not answer. She gave a sort of stifled sob. He took her hands and knelt down by her side, the better to see her in the dusky room. "'Mother!' he said anxiously. Louisa laid her head on his shoulder and burst into tears. "'My boy! My boy!' she cried, holding close to him. "'My boy, you will not leave me. Promise me that you will not leave me.' His heart was torn with pity. "'No, mother, no. I will not leave you. What made you think of such a thing?' "'I am so unhappy. They have all left me, all.' She pointed to the things all about her, and he did not know whether she was speaking of them or of her sons and the dead. "'You will stay with me?' You will not leave me? What should I do if you went too? I will not go, I tell you. We will stay together. Don't cry, I promise. She went on weeping. She could not stop herself. He dried her eyes with his handkerchief. What is it, mother dear? Are you in pain? I don't know. I don't know what it is. She tried to calm herself and to smile. I do try to be sensible. I do, but just nothing at all makes me cry. You see, I'm doing it again. Forgive me, I am so stupid. I am old. I have no strength left. I have no taste for anything any more. I am no good for anything. I wish I were buried with all the rest. He held her to him, close, like a child. Don't worry, mother. Be calm. Don't think about it. Gradually she grew quiet. It is foolish. I am ashamed. But what is it? What is it? She, who had always worked so hard, could not understand why her strength had suddenly snapped, and she was humiliated to the very depths of her being. He pretended not to see it. A little weariness, mother, he said, trying to speak carelessly. It is nothing. You will see. It is nothing. But he too was anxious. From his childhood he had been accustomed to see her brave, 
resigned, in silence withstanding every test, and he was astonished to see her suddenly broken. He was afraid. He helped her to sort the things scattered on the floor. Every now and then she would linger over something, but he would gently take it from her hands, and she suffered him. From that time on he took pains to be more with her. As soon as he had finished his work, instead of shutting himself up in his room, as he loved to do, he would return to her. He felt her loneliness, and that she was not strong enough to be left alone. There was danger in leaving her alone. He would sit by her side in the evening near the open window, looking on to the road. The view would slowly disappear. The people were returning home. Little lights appeared in the houses far off. They had seen it all a thousand times, but soon they would see it no more. They would talk disjointedly. They would point out to each other the smallest of the familiar incidents and expectations of the evening, always with fresh interest. They would have long intimate silences, or Louisa, for no apparent reason, would tell some reminiscence, some disconnected story that passed through her mind. Her tongue was loosed a little now that she felt that she was with one who loved her. She tried hard to talk. It was difficult for her for she had grown used to living apart from her family. She looked upon her sons and her husband as too clever to talk to her, and she had never dared to join in their conversation. Christophe's tender care was a new thing to her, and infinitely sweet, though it made her afraid. She deliberated over her words. She found it difficult to express herself. Her sentences were left unfinished and obscure. Sometimes she was ashamed of what she was saying. She would look at her son and stop in the middle of her narrative. But he would press her hand, and she would be reassured. He was filled with love and pity for the childish, motherly creature to whom he had turned when he was a child, and now she turned to him for support. And he took a melancholy pleasure in her prattle that had no interest for anybody but himself in her trivial memories of a life that had always been joyless and mediocre, though it seemed to Louisa to be of infinite worth. Sometimes he would try to interrupt her. He was afraid that her memories would make her sadder than ever, and he would urge her to sleep. She would understand what he was at, and would say with gratitude in her eyes, No, I assure you, it does one good. Let us stay a little longer. They would stay until the night was far gone and the neighbors were abed. Then they would say good night, she a little comforted by being rid of some of her trouble, he with a heavy heart under this new burden added to that which already he had to bear. The day came for their departure. On the night before they stayed longer than usual in the unlighted room. They did not speak. Every now and then Louisa moaned, "'Fear God!' Fear God! Christophe tried to keep her attention fixed on the thousand details of the morrow's removal. She would not go to bed until he gently compelled her. But he went up to his room and did not go to bed for a long time. When leaning out of the window, he tried to gaze through the darkness to see for the last time the moving shadows of the river beneath the house. He heard the wind in the tall trees in Minna's garden. The sky was black. There was no one in the street. A cold rain was just falling. The weathercocks creaked. In a house nearby a child was crying. The night weighed with an overwhelming heaviness upon the earth and upon his soul. The dull chiming of the hours, the cracked note of the halves and quarters, dropped one after another into the grim silence, broken only by the sound of the rain on the roofs and the cobbles. When Christophe at last made up his mind to go to bed, chilled in body and soul, he heard the window below him shut, and as he lay he thought sadly that it is cruel for the poor to dwell on the past, for they have no right to have a past like the rich. They have no home, no corner of the earth wherein to house their memories. Their joys, their sorrows, all their days are scattered in the wind. 
Next day, in beating rain, they moved their scanty furniture to their new dwelling. Fisher, the old furniture dealer, lent them a cart and a pony. He came and helped them himself. But they could not take everything, for the rooms to which they were going were much smaller than the old. Christoph had to make his mother leave the oldest and most useless of their belongings. It was not altogether easy. The least thing had its worth for her. A shaky table, a broken chair. She wished to leave nothing behind. Fisher, fortified by the authority of his old friendship with Jean-Michel, had to join Christophe in complaining. And good fellow that he was, and understanding her grief, had even to promise to keep some of her precious rubbish for her against the day when she should want it again. Then she agreed to tear herself away. The two brothers had been told of the removal, but Ernest came on the night before to say that he could not be there, and Rodolphe appeared for a moment about noon. He watched them load the furniture, gave some advice, and went away again, looking mightily busy. The procession set out through the muddy streets. Christophe led the horse, which slipped on the greasy cobbles. Louisa walked by her son's side and tried to shelter him from the rain. And so they had a melancholy homecoming in the damp rooms that were made darker than ever by the dull light coming from the lowering sky. They could not have fought against the depression that was upon them had it not been for the attentions of their landlord and his family. But when the cart had driven away, as night fell, leaving the furniture heaped up in the room, and Christophe and Louisa were sitting, worn out, one on a box, the other on a sack, they heard a little dry cough on the staircase. There was a knock at the door. Old Euler came in. He begged pardon elaborately for disturbing his guests, and said that by way of celebrating their first evening he hoped that they would be kind enough to sup with himself and his family. Louisa, stunned by her sorrow, wished to refuse. Christophe was not much more tempted than she by this friendly gathering, but the old man insisted, and Christophe, thinking that it would be better for his mother not to spend their first evening in their new home alone with her thoughts, made her accept. They went down to the floor below, where they found the whole family collected, the old man, his daughter, his son-in-law, Fogel, and his grandchildren, a boy and a girl, both a little younger than Christophe. They clustered around their guests, bade them welcome, asked if they were tired, if they were pleased with their rooms, if they needed anything, putting so many questions that Christophe, in bewilderment, could make nothing of them, for everybody spoke at once. The soup was placed on the table, they sat down, but the noise went on. Amalia, Euler's daughter, had set herself at once to acquaint Louisa with local details, with the topography of the district, the habits and advantages of the house, the time when the milkman called, the time when she got up, the various tradespeople and the prices that she paid. She did not stop until she had explained everything. Louisa, half asleep, tried hard to take an interest in the information, but the remarks which she ventured showed that she had understood not a word, and provoked Amalia to indignant exclamations and repetition of every detail. Old Euler, a clerk, tried to explain to Christophe the difficulties of a musical career. Christophe's other neighbor, Rosa, Amalia's daughter, never stopped talking from the moment when they sat down. So volubly that she had no time to breathe, she lost her breath in the middle of a sentence. But at once she was off again. Fogel was gloomy and complained of the food, and there were embittered arguments on the subject. Amalia, Euler, the girl, left off talking to take part in the discussion, and there were endless controversies as to whether there was too much salt in the stew or not enough. They called each other to witness, and naturally, no two opinions were the same. Each despised his neighbor's taste, and thought only his own healthy and reasonable. They might have gone on arguing until the last judgment. But in the end, they all joined in crying out upon the bad weather, 
They all commiserated Louisa and Christophe upon their troubles, and in terms which moved him greatly they praised him for his courageous conduct. They took great pleasure in recalling not only the misfortunes of their guests, but also their own, and those of their friends, and all their acquaintance. And they all agreed that the good are always unhappy, and that there is joy only for the selfish and dishonest. They decided that life is sad, that it is quite useless, and that they were all better dead, were it not the indubitable will of God that they should go on living so as to suffer. All these ideas came very near to Christophe's actual pessimism. He thought the better of his landlord, and closed his eyes to their little oddities. When he went upstairs again with his mother to the disordered rooms, they were weary and sad, but they felt a little less lonely, and while Christophe lay awake through the night, for he could not sleep because of his weariness and the noise of the neighborhood, and listened to the heavy carts shaking the walls and the breathing of the family sleeping below, he tried to persuade himself that he would be, if not happy, at least less unhappy here with these good people, a little tiresome, if the truth be told, who suffered from like misfortunes, who seemed to understand him, and whom he thought he understood. But when at last he did fall asleep, he was roused unpleasantly at dawn by the voices of his neighbors arguing, and the creaking of a pump worked furiously by someone who was in a hurry to swill the yard and the stairs. End of section 22section 23 of jean christophe volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by joshua seeger in chicago jean christophe volume 1 by romain roland translated by gilbert canan youth 1 part 2 eustus euler was a little bent old man with uneasy gloomy eyes, a red face, all lines and pimples, gap-toothed, with an unkempt beard, with which he was forever fidgeting with his hands. Very honest, quite able, profoundly moral, he had been on quite good terms with Christophe's grandfather. He was said to be like him, and in truth he was of the same generation and brought up with the same principles. But he lacked Jean-Michel's strong physique that is, while he was of the same opinion on many points, fundamentally he was hardly at all like him, for it is temperament far more than ideas that makes a man, and whatever the divisions, fictitious or real, marked between men by intellect, the great divisions between men and men are into those who are healthy and those who are not. Old Euler was not a healthy man. He talked morality, like Jean-Michel, but his morals were not the same as Jean-Michel's. He had not his sound stomach, his lungs, or his jovial strength. Everything in Euler and his family was built on a more parsimonious and niggardly plan. He had been an official for forty years, was now retired, and suffered from that melancholy that comes from inactivity and weighs so heavily upon old men who have not made provision in their inner life for their last years. All his habits, natural and acquired, all the habits of his trade, had given him a meticulous and peevish quality, which was reproduced to a certain extent in each of his children. His son-in-law, Vogel, a clerk at the Chancery Court, was fifty years old. Tall, strong, almost bald, with gold spectacles, fairly good-looking. He considered himself ill, and no doubt was so, although obviously he did not have the diseases which he thought he had, but only a mind soured by the stupidity of his calling, and a body ruined, to a certain extent, by his sedentary life. Very industrious, not without merit, even cultured up to a point, he was a victim of our ridiculous modern life, or, like so many clerks, locked up in their offices, 
he had succumbed to the demon of hypochondria, one of those unfortunates whom Goethe called ein trauriger ungriechischer hypochondrist, a gloomy and un-Greek hypochondriac, and pitied, though he took good care to avoid them. Amalia was neither the one nor the other. Strong, loud, and active, she wasted no sympathy on her husband's jeremiads. She used to shake him roughly. But no human strength can bear up against living together, and when in a household one or other is neurasthenic, the chances are that in time they will both be so. In vain did Amalia cry out upon Fogel. In vain did she go on protesting, either from habit or because it was necessary. Next moment she herself was lamenting her condition more loudly even than he, and passing imperceptibly from scolding to lamentation, she did him no good. She increased his ills tenfold by loudly singing chorus to his follies. In the end, not only did she crush the unhappy Fogel, terrified by the proportions assumed by his own outcries sent sounding back by this echo, but she crushed everybody, even herself. In her turn she caught the trick of unwarrantably bemoaning her health, and her father's, and her daughter's, and her son's. It became a mania. By constant repetition she came to believe what she said. She took the least chill tragically. She was uneasy and worried about everybody. More than that, when they were well, she still worried, because of the sickness that was bound to come. So life was passed in perpetual fear. Outside that, they were all in fairly good health, and it seemed as though their state of continual moaning and groaning did serve to keep them well. They all ate and slept and worked, as usual, and the life of this household was not relaxed for it all. Amalia's activity was not satisfied with working from morning to night up and down the house. They all had to toil with her, and there was forever a moving of furniture, a washing of floors, a polishing of wood, a sound of voices, footsteps, quivering, movement. The two children, crushed by such loud authority, leaving nobody alone, seemed to find it natural enough to submit to it. The boy, Leonard, was good-looking, though insignificant of feature, and stiff in manner. The girl, Rosa, fair-haired, with pretty blue eyes, gentle and affectionate, would have been pleasing especially with the freshness of her delicate complexion and her kind manner, had her nose not been quite so large or so awkwardly placed. It made her face heavy and gave her a foolish expression. She was like a girl of Holbein, in the gallery at Belle, the daughter of Burgomaster Meyer, sitting with eyes cast down, her hands on her knees, her fair hair falling down to her shoulders, looking embarrassed and ashamed of her uncomely nose. But so far Rosa had not been troubled by it, and it never had broken in upon her inexhaustible chatter. Always her shrill voice was heard in the house telling stories, always breathless, as though she had no time to say everything, always excited and animated, in spite of the protests which she drew from her mother, her father, and even her grandfather, exasperated not so much because she was forever talking as because she prevented them talking themselves. For these good people, kind, loyal, devoted, the very cream of good people, had almost all the virtues, but they lacked one virtue which is capital, and is the charm of life, the virtue of silence. Christophe was in tolerant mood. His sorrow had softened his intolerant and emphatic temper. His experience of the cruel indifference of the elegant made him more conscious of the worth of these honest folk, graceless and devilish tiresome, who had yet an austere conception of life, and because they lived joylessly, seemed to him to live without weakness. Having decided that they were excellent, and that he ought to like them, like the German that he was, he tried to persuade himself that he did, in fact, like them. But he did not succeed. He lacked that easy Germanic idealism, which does not wish to see, and does not see, what would be displeasing to its sight, 
for fear of disturbing the very proper tranquillity of its judgment and the pleasantness of its existence. On the contrary, he never was so conscious of the defects of these people as when he loved them, when he wanted to love them absolutely without reservation. It was a sort of unconscious loyalty and an inexorable demand for truth, which in spite of himself made him more clear-sighted and more exacting with what was dearest to him, and it was not long before he began to be irritated by the oddities of the family. They made no attempt to conceal them. Contrary to the usual habit, they displayed every intolerable quality they possessed, and all the good in them was hidden. So Christophe told himself, for he judged himself to have been unjust, and tried to surmount his first impressions, and to discover in them the excellent qualities which they so carefully concealed. He tried to converse with old Eustus Euler, who asked nothing better. He had a secret sympathy with him, remembering that his grandfather had liked to praise him. But good old Jean-Michel had more of the pleasant faculty of deceiving himself about his friends than Christophe, and Christophe soon saw that, in vain, did he try to accept Euler's memories of his grandfather. He could only get from him a discolored caricature of Jean-Michel and scraps of talk that were utterly uninteresting. Euler's stories used invariably to begin with, As I used to say to your poor grandfather, he could remember nothing else. He had heard only what he had said himself. Perhaps Jean-Michel used only to listen in the same way, most friendships are little more than arrangements for mutual satisfaction, so that each party may talk about himself to the other. But at least Jean-Michel, however naively he used to give himself up to the delight of talking, had sympathy which he was always ready to lavish on all sides. He was interested in everything. He always regretted that he was no longer fifteen, so as to be able to see the marvelous inventions of the new generations and to share their thoughts. He had the quality, perhaps the most precious in life, a curiosity always fresh, ever changing with the years, born anew every morning. He had not the talent to turn this gift to account, but how many men of talent might envy him? Most men die at twenty or thirty, thereafter they are only reflections of themselves. For the rest of their lives they are aping themselves, repeating from day to day, more and more mechanically and affectedly, what they said and did and thought and loved when they were alive. It was so long since old Euler had been alive, and he had been such a small thing then, that what was left of him now was very poor and rather ridiculous. Outside his former trade and his family life, he knew nothing, and wished to know nothing. On every subject he had ideas ready-made, dating from his youth. He pretended to some knowledge of the arts, but he clung to certain hallowed names of men about whom he was forever reiterating his emphatic formulae. Everything else was not and had never been. When modern interests were mentioned, he would not listen, and talked of something else. He declared that he loved music passionately, and he would ask Christophe to play. But as soon as Christophe, who had been caught once or twice, began to play, the old fellow would begin to talk loudly to his daughter, as though the music only increased his interest in everything but music. Christophe would get up, exasperated, in the middle of his piece, so one would notice it. There were only a few old airs, three or four, some very beautiful, others very ugly, but all equally sacred, which were privileged to gain comparative silence and absolute approval. With the very first notes, the old man would go into ecstasies, tears would come to his eyes, not so much for the pleasure he was enjoying as for the pleasure which once he had enjoyed. In the end, Christophe had a horror of these airs, though some of them, like the Adelaide of Beethoven, were very dear to him. The old man was always humming the first bars of them, and never failed to declare, There, that is music, contemptuously comparing it with, 
all the blessed modern music in which there is no melody. Truth to tell, he knew nothing whatever about it. His son-in-law was better educated and kept in touch with artistic movements, but that was even worse, for in his judgment there was always a disparaging tinge. He was lacking neither in taste nor intelligence, but he could not bring himself to admire anything modern. He would have disparaged Mozart and Beethoven if they had been contemporary, just as he would have acknowledged the merits of Wagner and Richard Strauss had they been dead for a century. His discontented temper refused to allow that there might be great men living during his own lifetime. The idea was distasteful to him. He was so embittered by his wasted life that he insisted on pretending that every life was wasted, that it could not be otherwise, and that those who thought the opposite or pretended to think so were one of two things, fools or humbugs. And so he never spoke of any new celebrity except in a tone of bitter irony, and, as he was not stupid, he never failed to discover at the first glance the weak or ridiculous sides of them. Any new name roused him to distrust. Before he knew anything about the man, he was inclined to criticize him, because he knew nothing about him. If he was sympathetic towards Christophe, it was because he thought that the misanthropic boy found life as evil as he did himself, and that he was not a genius. Nothing so unites the small of soul in their suffering and discontent as the statement of their common impotence. Nothing so much restores the desire for health or life to those who are healthy and made for the joy of life as contact with the stupid pessimism of the mediocre and the sick, who, because they are not happy, deny the happiness of others. Christophe felt this, and yet these gloomy thoughts were familiar to him, but he was surprised to find them on Vogel's lips, where they were unrecognizable. More than that, they were repugnant to him, they offended him. He was even more in revolt against Amalia's ways. The good creature did no more than practice Christophe's theories of duty. The word was upon her lips at every turn. She worked unceasingly and wanted everybody to work as she did. Her work was never directed towards making herself and others happier. On the contrary, it almost seemed as though it was mainly intended to incommode everybody and to make life as disagreeable as possible so as to sanctify it. Nothing would induce her for a moment to relinquish her holy duties in the household, that sacrosanct institution which in so many women takes the place of all other duties, social and moral. She would have thought herself lost had she not on the same day, at the same time, polished the wooden floors, washed the tiles, cleaned the door handles, beaten the carpets, moved the chairs, the cupboards, the tables. She was ostentatious about it. It was as though it was a point of honor with her. And after all, is it not in much the same spirit that many women conceive and defend their honor? It is a sort of piece of furniture which they have to keep polished, a well-waxed floor, cold, hard, and slippery. The accomplishment of her task did not make Frau Vogel more amicable. She sacrificed herself to the trivialities of the household as to a duty imposed by God, and she despised those who did not do as she did, those who rested and were able to enjoy life a little in the intervals of work. She would go and rouse Louisa in her room when from time to time she sat down in the middle of her work to dream. Louisa would sigh, but she submitted to it with a half-shamed smile. Fortunately, Christophe knew nothing about it. Amalia used to wait until he had gone out before she made these interruptions into their rooms. And so far she had not directly attacked him. He would not have put up with it. When he was with her, he was conscious of a latent hostility within himself. What he could least forgive her was the noise she made. He was maddened by it. When he was locked in his room, a little low room looking out on the yard, with the window hermetically sealed, in spite of the want of air, so as not to hear the clatter in the house, 
he could not escape from it. Involuntarily, he was forced to listen attentively for the least sound coming up from below, and when the terrible voice which penetrated all the walls broke out again after a moment of silence, he was filled with rage. He would shout, stamp with his foot, and roar insults at her through the wall. In the general uproars, no one ever noticed it. They thought he was composing. He would consign Frau Vogel to the depths of hell. He had no respect for her, nor esteem to check him. At such times, it seemed to him that he would have preferred the loosest and most stupid of women, if only she did not talk, to cleverness, honesty, all the virtues, when they make too much noise. His hatred of noise brought him in touch with Leonard. In the midst of the general excitement, the boy was the only one to keep calm, and never to raise his voice more at one moment than another. He always expressed himself correctly and deliberately, choosing his words, and never hurrying. Amalia, simmering, never had patience to wait until he had finished. The whole family cried out upon his slowness. He did not worry about it. Nothing could upset his calm, respectful deference. Christophe was the more attracted to him when he learned that Leonard intended to devote his life to the church, and his curiosity was roused. With regard to religion, Christophe was in a queer position. He did not know himself how he stood towards it. He had never had time to think seriously about it. He was not well enough educated and he was too much absorbed by the difficulties of existence to be able to analyze himself and to set his ideas in order. His violence led him from one extreme to the other, from absolute facts to complete negation, without troubling to find out whether in either case he agreed with himself. When he was happy, he hardly thought of God at all, but he was quite ready to believe in Him. When he was unhappy, he thought of Him, but did not believe. It seemed to him impossible that a god could authorize unhappiness and injustice. But these difficulties did not greatly exercise him. He was too fundamentally religious to think much about God. He lived in God. He had no need to believe in him. That is well enough for the weak and worn, for those whose lives are anemic. They aspire to God as a plant does to the sun, the dying cling to life. But he who bears in his soul the sun and life, what need has he to seek them outside himself? End of section 23section 24 of Jean Christophe, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1, by Romain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canin. Youth 1, Part 3. Christophe would probably never have bothered about these questions had he lived alone, but the obligations of social life forced him to bring his thoughts to bear on these puerile and useless problems, which occupy a place out of all proportion in the world. It is impossible not to take them into account, since at every step they are in the way. As if a healthy, generous creature, overflowing with strength and love, had not a thousand more worthy things to do than to worry as to whether God exists or no. If it were only a question of believing in God, but it is needful to believe in a God, of whatever shape or size and color and race. So far Christophe never gave a thought to the matter. Jesus hardly occupied his thoughts at all. It was not that he did not love him. He loved him when he thought of him, but he never thought of him. Sometimes he reproached himself for it, was angry with himself, could not understand why he did not take more interest in him, and yet he professed, all his family professed. His grandfather was forever reading the Bible. He went regularly to Mass. He served it in a sort of way, for he was an organist, and he set about his task conscientiously and in an exemplary manner. 
But when he left the church, he would have been hard put to it to say what he had been thinking about. He set himself to read the holy books in order to fix his ideas, and he found amusement and even pleasure in them, just as in any beautiful strange books, not essentially different from other books, which no one ever thinks of calling sacred. In truth, if Jesus appealed to him, Beethoven did no less, and at his organ in St. Florian's church, where he accompanied on Sundays, he was more taken up with his organ than with Mass, and he was more religious when he played Bach than when he played Mendelssohn. Some of the ritual brought him to a fervor of exaltation, but did he then love God, or was it only the music, as an impudent priest said to him one day in jest, without thinking of the unhappiness which his quip might cause in him? Anybody else would not have paid any attention to it, and would not have changed his mode of living. So many people put up with not knowing what they think. But Christophe was cursed with an awkward need for sincerity, which filled him with scruples at every turn. And when scruples came to him, they possessed him forever. He tortured himself. He thought that he had acted with duplicity. Did he believe or did he not? He had no means, material or intellectual, knowledge and leisure are necessary, of solving the problem by himself. And yet it had to be solved, or he was either indifferent or a hypocrite. Now he was incapable of being either one or the other. He tried timidly to sound those about him. They all seemed to be sure of themselves. Christophe burned to know their reasons. He could not discover them. Hardly did he receive a definite answer. They always talked obliquely. Some thought him arrogant, and said that there is no arguing these things, that thousands of men cleverer and better than himself had believed without argument, and that he needed only to do as they had done. There were some who were a little hurt, as though it were a personal affront to ask them such a question, and yet they were of all perhaps the least certain of their facts. Others shrugged their shoulders and said with a smile, Bah! It can't do any harm. And their smile said, And it is so useful. Christophe despised them with all his heart. He had tried to lay his uncertainties before a priest, but he was discouraged by the experiment. He could not discuss the matter seriously with him. Though his interlocution was quite pleasant, he made Christophe feel, quite politely, that there was no real equality between them. He seemed to assume in advance that his superiority was beyond dispute, and that the discussion could not exceed the limits which he laid down for it, without a kind of impropriety. It was just a fencing bout, and was quite inoffensive. When Christophe wished to exceed the limits, and to ask questions which the worthy man was pleased not to answer, he stepped back with a patronizing smile, and a few Latin quotations, and a fatherly objurgation to pray, pray that God would enlighten him. Christophe issued from the interview humiliated and wounded by his love of polite superiority. Wrong or right, he would never again for anything in the world have recourse to a priest. He admitted that these men were his superiors in intelligence or by reason of their sacred calling, but in argument there is neither superiority, nor inferiority, nor title, nor age, nor name. Nothing is of worth but truth, before which all men are equal. So he was glad to find a boy of his own age who believed. He asked no more than belief, and he hoped that Leonard would give him good reason for believing. He made advances to him. Leonard replied with his usual gentleness, but without eagerness, he was never eager about anything. As they could not carry on a long conversation in the house without being interrupted every moment by Amalia or the old man, Christophe proposed that they should go for a walk one evening after dinner. Leonard was too polite to refuse, although he would gladly have got out of it, for his indolent nature disliked walking, talking, and anything that cost him an effort. Christophe had some difficulty in opening up the conversation. After two or three awkward sentences about trivialities, he plunged with a brusqueness that was almost brutal, 
he asked Leonard if he were really going to be a priest, and if he liked the idea. Leonard was nonplussed, and looked at him uneasily, but when he saw that Christophe was not hostily disposed, he was reassured. Yes, he replied. How could it be otherwise? Ah, said Christophe, you are very happy. Leonard was conscious of a shade of envy in Christophe's voice, and was agreeably flattered by it. He altered his manner, became expansive, his face brightened. Yes, he said, I am happy, he beamed. What do you do to be so? asked Christophe. Before replying, Leonard proposed that they should sit down on a quiet seat in the cloisters of St. Martin's. From there they could see a corner of the little square, planted with acacias, and beyond it the town, the country, bathed in the evening mists. The Rhine flowed at the foot of the hill. An old, deserted cemetery, with graves lost under the rich grass, lay in slumber beside them, behind the closed gates. Leonard began to talk. He said, with his eyes shining with contentment, how happy he was to escape from life, to have found a refuge where a man is, and forever will be, in shelter. Christophe, still sore from his wounds, felt passionately the desire for rest and forgetfulness, but it was mingled with regret. He asked with a sigh, And yet, does it cost you nothing to renounce life altogether? Oh, said Leonard quietly, what is there to regret? Isn't life sad and ugly? There are lovely things, too, said Christophe, looking at the beautiful evening. There are some beautiful things, but very few. The few that there are are yet many to me. Oh, well, it is simply a matter of common sense. On the one hand, a little good and much evil. On the other, neither good nor evil on earth, and after infinite happiness, how can one hesitate? Christophe was not very pleased with this sort of arithmetic. So economic a life seemed to him very poor. But he tried to persuade himself that it was wisdom. So, he asked, a little ironically, there is no risk of your being seduced by an hour's pleasure? How foolish, when you know that it is only an hour, and that after it there is all eternity. You are quite certain of eternity? Of course. Christophe questioned him. He was thrilled with hope and desire. Perhaps Leonard would at last give him impregnable reasons for believing. With what a passion he would himself renounce all the world to follow him to God. At first, Leonard proud of his role of apostle, and convinced that Christophe's doubts were only a matter of form, and that they would, of course, give way before his first arguments, relied upon the holy books, the authority of the gospel, the miracles, and traditions. But he began to grow gloomy when, after Christophe had listened for a few minutes, he stopped him, and said that he was answering questions with questions, and that he had not asked him to tell exactly what it was that he was doubting, but to give some means of resolving his doubts. Leonard then had to realize that Christophe was much more ill than he seemed, and that he would only allow himself to be convinced by the light of reason. But he still thought that Christophe was playing the free thinker. It never occurred to him that he might be so sincerely. He was not discouraged, and strong in his recently acquired knowledge, he turned back to his school learning. He unfolded higgledy-piggledy with more authority than order his metaphysical proofs of the existence of God and the immortality of the soul. Christophe, with his mind at stretch and his brow knit in the effort, labored in silence and made him say it all over again, tried hard to gather the meaning and to take it to himself and to follow the reasoning. Then suddenly he burst out, vowed that Leonard was laughing at him, that it was all tricks, jests of the fine talkers who forged words and then amused themselves with pretending that these words were things. Leonard was nettled, and guaranteed the good faith of his authors. Christophe shrugged his shoulders, and said with an oath, 
that they were only humbugs, infernal writers, and he demanded fresh proof. Leonard perceived to his horror that Christophe was incurably attainted and took no more interest in him. He remembered that he had been told not to waste his time in arguing with skeptics, at least when they stubbornly refused to believe. There was the risk of being shaken himself, without profiting the other. It was better to leave the unfortunate fellow to the will of God, who, if he so designs, would see to it that the skeptic was enlightened, or, if not, who would dare to go against the will of God. Leonard did not insist then on carrying on the discussion. He only said gently that, for the time being, there was nothing to be done, that no reasoning could show the way to a man who was determined not to see it, and that Jean Christophe must pray and appeal to grace. Nothing is possible without that. He must desire grace and the will to believe. The will, thought Christophe bitterly. So then, God will exist because I will him to exist? So then, death will not exist because it pleases me to deny it? Alas! How easy life is to those who have no need to see the truth, to those who can see what they wish to see and are forever forging pleasant dreams in which softly to sleep. In such a bed, Christophe knew well that he would never sleep. Leonard went on talking. He had fallen back on his favorite subject, the sweets of the contemplative life, and once on this neutral ground he was inexhaustible. In his monotonous voice, that shook with the pleasure in him, he told of the joys of the life in God, outside, above the world, far from noise, of which he spoke in a sudden tone of hatred. He detested it almost as much as Christophe, far from violence, far from frivolity, far from the little miseries that one has to suffer every day in the warm, secure nest of faith from which you can contemplate in peace the wretchedness of a strange and distant world. And as Christophe listened, he perceived the egoism of that faith. Leonard saw that. He hurriedly explained, the contemplative life was not a lazy life. On the contrary, a man is more active in prayer than in action. What would the world be without prayer? You expiate the sins of others. You bear the burden of their misdeeds. You offer up your talents. You intercede between the world and God. Christophe listened in silence with increasing hostility. He was conscious of the hypocrisy of such renunciation in Leonard. He was not unjust enough to assume hypocrisy in all those who believe. He knew well that with a few, such abdication of life comes from the impossibility of living, from a bitter despair an appeal to death, that with still fewer it is an ecstasy of passion. How long does it last? But with the majority of men is it not too often the cold reasoning of souls more busied with their own ease and peace than with the happiness of others, or with truth? And if sincere men are conscious of it, how much they must suffer by such profanation of their ideal. Leonard was quite happy, and now set forth the beauty and harmony of the world, seen from the loftiness of the divine roost. Below all was dark, unjust, sorrowful. Seen from on high, it all became clear, luminous, ordered. The world was like the works of a clock, perfectly ordered. Now Christophe only listened absently. He was asking himself, Does he believe, or does he believe that he believes? And yet his own faith, his own passionate desire for faith, was not shaken. Not the mediocrity of soul and the poverty of argument of a fool like Leonard could touch that. Night came down over the town. The seat on which they were sitting was in darkness. The stars shone out. A white mist came up from the river. The crickets chirped under the trees in the cemetery. The bells began to ring. First, the highest of them, alone, like a plaintive bird, challenging the sky. Then the second, a third lower, joined in its plaint. At last came the deepest on the fifth, and seemed to answer them. The three voices were merged in each other, 
At the bottom of the towers there was a buzzing as of a gigantic hive of bees. The air and the boy's heart quivered. Christophe held his breath and thought how poor was the music of musicians compared with such an ocean of music, with all the sounds of thousands of creatures, the former the free world of sounds compared with the world tamed, catalogued, coldly labeled by human intelligence. He sank and sank into that sonorous and immense world without continents or bounds. And when the great murmuring had died away, when the air had ceased at last to quiver, Christophe woke up. He looked about him, startled. He knew nothing. Around him and in him everything was changed. There was no God. As with faith, so the loss of faith is often equally a flood of grace, a sudden light. Reason counts for nothing. The smallest thing is enough. A word, silence, the sound of bells... A man walks, dreams, expects nothing. Suddenly the world crumbles away. All about him is in ruins. He is alone. He no longer believes. Christophe was terrified and could not understand how it had come about. It was like the flooding of a river in the spring. Leonard's voice was still sounding, more monotonous than the voice of a cricket. Christophe did not hear it. He heard nothing. Night was fully come. Leonard stopped, surprised to find Christophe motionless. Uneasy because of the lateness of the hour, he suggested that they should go home. Christophe did not reply. Leonard took his arm. Christophe trembled and looked at Leonard with wild eyes. "'Christophe, we must go home,' said Leonard. "'Go to hell!' cried Christophe furiously. "'Oh, Christophe, what have I done?' asked Leonard tremulously. He was dumbfounded. Christophe came to himself. Yes, you are right, he said more gently. I do not know what I am saying. Go to God. Go to God. He was alone. He was in bitter distress. Ah, my God, my God, he cried, wringing his hands, passionately raising his face to the dark sky. Why do I no longer believe? Why can I believe no more? What has happened to me? The disproportion between the wreck of his faith and the conversation that he had just had with Leonard was too great. It was obvious that the conversation had no more brought it about than that the boisterousness of Amalia's gabble and the pettiness of the people with whom he lived were not the cause of the upheaval which for some days had been taking place in his moral resolutions. These were only pretexts, the uneasiness had not come from without. It was within himself. He felt stirring in his heart monstrous and unknown things, and he dared not rely on his thoughts to face the evil. The evil? Was it evil? A languor, an intoxication, a voluptuous agony filled all his being. He was no longer master of himself. In vain he sought to fortify himself with his former stoicism, his whole being crashed down. He had a sudden consciousness of the vast world, burning, wild, a world immeasurable. How it swallows up God! Only for a moment, but the whole balance of his old life was in that moment destroyed. End of section 24《セクション25of Jean Christophe, Volume 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1 by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canan. Youth 1, Part 4. There was only one person in the family to whom Christophe paid no attention. This was little Rosa. She was not beautiful, and Christophe, who was far from beautiful himself, was very exacting of beauty in others. He had that calm cruelty of youth, for which a woman does not exist if she be ugly. 
unless she has passed the age for inspiring tenderness, and there is then no need to feel for her anything but grave, peaceful, and quasi-religious sentiments. Rosa also was not distinguished by any especial gift, although she was not without intelligence, and she was cursed with a chattering tongue which drove Christophe from her. And he had never taken the trouble to know her, thinking that there was in her nothing to know, and the most he ever did was to glance at her. But she was of better stuff than most girls. She was certainly better than Minna, whom he had so loved. She was a good girl, no coquette, not at all vain, and until Christophe came it had never occurred to her that she was plain, or if it had, it had not worried her, for none of her family bothered about it. Whenever her grandfather or her mother told her so out of a desire to grumble, she only laughed, she did not believe it, or she attached no importance to it, nor did they. So many others, just as plain and more, had found someone to love them. The Germans are very mildly indulgent to physical imperfections. They cannot see them. They are even able to embellish them by virtue of an easy imagination which finds unexpected qualities in the face of their desire to make them like the most illustrious examples of human beauty. Old Euler would not have needed much urging to make him declare that his granddaughter had the nose of the Juno Ludovisi. Happily, he was too grumpy to pay compliments, and Rosa, unconcerned about the shape of her nose, had no vanity except in the accomplishment, with all the ritual, of the famous household duties. She had accepted as gospel all that she had been taught. She hardly ever went out, and she had very little standard of comparison. She admired her family naively, and believed what they said. She was of an expansive and confiding nature, easily satisfied, and tried to fall in with the mournfulness of her home, and docilely used to repeat the pessimistic ideas which she heard. She was a creature of devotion, always thinking of others, trying to please, sharing anxieties, guessing at what others wanted. She had a great need of loving without demanding anything in return. Naturally, her family took advantage of her, although they were kind and loved her, but there is always a temptation to take advantage of the love of those who are absolutely delivered into your hands. Her family were so sure of her attentions that they were not at all grateful for them. Whatever she did, they expected more. And then she was clumsy. She was awkward and hasty. Her movements were jerky and boyish. She had outbursts of tenderness which used to end in disaster. A broken glass, a jug upset, a door slammed to, things which let loose upon her the wrath of everybody in the house. She was always being snubbed and would go and weep in a corner. Her tears did not last long. She would soon smile again, and begin to chatter without a suspicion of rancor against anybody. Christophe's advent was an important event in her life. She had often heard of him. Christophe had some place in the gossip of the town. He was a sort of little local celebrity. His name used often to recur in the family conversation, especially when old Jean-Michel was alive, who, proud of his grandson, used to sing his praises to all of his acquaintance. Rosa had seen the young musician once or twice at concerts. When she heard that he was coming to live with them, she clapped her hands. She was sternly rebuked for her breach of manners and became confused. She saw no harm in it. In a life so monotonous as hers, a new lodger was a great distraction. She spent the last few days before his arrival in a fever of expectancy. She was fearful lest he should not like the house, and she tried hard to make every room as attractive as possible. On the morning of his arrival she even put a little bunch of flowers on the mantelpiece to bid him welcome. As to herself, she took no care at all to look her best, and one glance was enough to make Christophe decide that she was plain and slovenly dressed. She did not think the same of him, though she had good reason to do so. For Christophe, 
busy, exhausted, ill-kempt, was even more ugly than usual. But Rosa, who was incapable of thinking the least ill of anybody, Rosa, who thought her grandfather, her father, and her mother all perfectly beautiful, saw Christophe exactly as she had expected to see him, and admired him with all her heart. She was frightened at sitting next to him at table, and unfortunately her shyness took the shape of a flood of words which at once alienated Christophe's sympathies. She did not see this, and that first evening remained a shining memory in her life. When she was alone in her room after they had all gone upstairs, she heard the tread of the new lodgers as they walked over her head, and the sound of it ran joyously through her. The house seemed to her to take in new life. The next morning, for the first time in her life, she looked at herself in the mirror carefully and uneasily, and without exactly knowing the extent of her misfortune, she began to be conscious of it. She tried to decide about her features, one by one, but she could not. She was filled with sadness and apprehension. She sighed deeply and thought of introducing certain changes in her toilet, but she only made herself look still more plain. She conceived the unlucky idea of overwhelming Christophe with her kindness. In her naive desire to be always seeing her new friends and doing them service, she was forever going up and down the stairs, bringing them some utterly useless thing, insisting on helping them, and always laughing and talking and shouting. Her zeal and her stream of talk could only be interrupted by her mother's impatient voice calling her. Christophe looked grim. But for his good resolutions, he must have lost his temper quite twenty times. He restrained himself for two days. On the third, he locked his door. Rosa knocked, called, understood, went downstairs in dismay, and did not try again. When he saw her, he explained that he was very busy and could not be disturbed. She humbly begged his pardon. She could not deceive herself as to the failure of her innocent advances. They had accomplished the opposite of her intention. They had alienated Christophe. He no longer took the trouble to conceal his ill-humor. He did not listen when she talked, and did not disguise his impatience. She felt that her chatter irritated him, and by force of will she succeeded in keeping silent for a part of the evening but the thing was stronger than herself. Suddenly she would break out again, and her words would tumble over each other more tumultuously than ever. Christophe would leave her in the middle of a sentence. She was not angry with him. She was angry with herself. She thought herself stupid, tiresome, ridiculous. All her faults assumed enormous proportions, and she tried to wrestle with them but she was discouraged by the check upon her first attempts, and said to herself that she could not do it, that she was not strong enough, but she would try again. But there were other faults against which she was powerless. What could she do against her plainness? There was no doubt about it. The certainty of her misfortune had suddenly been revealed to her one day when she was looking at herself in the mirror. It came like a thunderclap. Of course, she exaggerated the evil, and saw her nose as ten times larger than it was. It seemed to her to fill all her face. She dared not show herself. She wished to die. But there is in youth such a power of hope that these fits of discouragement never lasted long. She would end by pretending that she had been mistaken. She would try to believe it, and for a moment or two would actually succeed in thinking her nose quite ordinary and almost shapely. Her instinct made her attempt, though very clumsily, certain childish tricks, a way of doing her hair so as not so much to show her forehead and so accentuate the disproportion of her face. And yet there was no coquetry in her. No thought of love had crossed her mind, or she was unconscious of it, she asked little. Nothing but a little friendship. But Christophe did not show any inclination to give her that little. It seemed to Rosa that she would have been perfectly happy had he only condescended to say good day when they met. A friendly good evening 
with a little kindness, but Christophe usually looked so hard and so cold it chilled her. He never said anything disagreeable to her, but she would rather have had cruel reproaches than such cruel silence. One evening Christophe was playing his piano. He had taken up his quarters in a little attic at the top of the house, so as not to be so much disturbed by the noise. Downstairs Rosa was listening to him, deeply moved. She loved music, though her taste was bad and unformed. While her mother was there, she stayed in a corner of the room and bent over her sewing, apparently absorbed in her work, but her heart was with the sounds coming from upstairs, and she wished to miss nothing. As soon as Amalia went out for a walk in the neighborhood, Rosa leaped to her feet, threw down her sewing, and went upstairs with her heart beating until she came to the attic door. She held her breath and laid her ear against the door. She stayed like that until Amalia returned. She went on tiptoe, taking care to make no noise. But as she was not very sure-footed and was always in a hurry, she was always tripping upon the stairs, and once while she was listening, leaning forward with her cheek glued to the keyhole, she lost her balance and banged her forehead against the door. She was so alarmed that she lost her breath. The piano stopped dead. She could not escape. She was getting up when the door opened. Christophe saw her, glared at her furiously, and then, without a word, brushed her aside, walked angrily downstairs, and went out. He did not return until dinner time, paid no heed to the despairing looks with which she asked his pardon, ignored her existence, and for several weeks he never played at all. Rosa secretly shed many tears. No one noticed it. No one paid any attention to her. Ardently she prayed to God. For what? She did not know. She had to confide her grief in someone. She was sure that Christophe detested her. And in spite of all she hoped, it was enough for her if Christophe seemed to show any sign of interest in her, if he appeared to listen to what she said, if he pressed her hand with a little more friendliness than usual. A few imprudent words from her relations set her imagination off upon a false road. The whole family was filled with sympathy for Christophe, the big boy of sixteen, serious and solitary, who had such lofty ideas of his duty, inspired a sort of respect in them all. His fits of ill-temper, his obstinate silences, his gloomy air, his brusque manner, were not surprising in such a house as that. Frau Vogel herself, who regarded every artist as a loafer, dared not reproach him aggressively, as she would have liked to do with the hours that he spent in stargazing in the evening, leaning, motionless, out of the attic window overlooking the yard, until night fell, for she knew that during the rest of the day he was hard at work with his lessons, and she humored him, like the rest, for an ulterior motive which no one expressed, though everybody knew it. Rosa had seen her parents exchanging looks and mysterious whisperings when she was talking to Christophe, at first she took no notice of it. Then she was puzzled and roused by it. She longed to know what they were saying, but dared not ask. One evening, when she had climbed on to a garden seat to untie the clothesline hung between two trees, she leaned on Christophe's shoulder to jump down. Just at that moment her eyes met her grandfather's and her father's. They were sitting smoking their pipes and leaning against the wall of the house. The two men winked at each other, and Eustace Euler said to Vogel, "'They will make a fine couple.' Vogel nudged him, seeing that the girl was listening, and he covered his remark very cleverly, or so he thought, with a loud, "'Hm, hm,' that could have been heard twenty yards away. Christophe, whose back was turned, saw nothing, but Rosa was so bowled over by it that she forgot that she was jumping down and sprained her foot. She would have fallen had not Christophe caught her, muttering curses on her clumsiness. She had hurt herself badly, but she did not show it. She hardly thought of it. She thought only of what she had just heard. She walked to her room. Every step was agony to her. She stiffened herself against it so as not to let it be seen. 
A delicious, vague uneasiness surged through her. She fell into a chair at the foot of her bed and hid her face in the coverlet. Her cheeks were burning. There were tears in her eyes, and she laughed. She was ashamed. She wished to sink into the depths of the earth. She could not fix her ideas. Her blood beat in her temples. There were sharp pains in her ankle. She was in a feverish stupor. Vaguely she heard sounds outside, children crying and playing in the street, and her grandfather's words were ringing in her ears. She was thrilled. She laughed softly. She blushed. With her face buried in the eiderdown, she prayed, gave thanks, desired, feared. She loved. Her mother called her. She tried to get up. At the first step she felt a pain so unbearable that she almost fainted. Her head swam. She thought she was going to die. She wished to die, and at the same time she wished to live with all the forces of her being, to live for the promised happiness. Her mother came at last, and the whole household was soon excited. She was scolded, as usual. Her ankle was dressed. She was put to bed, and sank into the sweet bewilderment of her physical pain and her inward joy. The night was sweet. The smallest memory of that dear evening was hallowed for her. She did not think of Christophe. She knew not what she thought. She was happy. The next day Christophe, who thought himself in some measure responsible for the accident, came to make inquiries, and for the first time he made some show of affection for her. She was filled with gratitude and blessed her sprained ankle. She would gladly have suffered all her life, if, all her life, she might have such joy. She had to lie down for several days and never move. She spent them in turning over and over her grandfather's words, and considering them. Had he said, They will? Or, They would? But it was possible that he had never said anything of this kind? Yes, he had said it. She was certain of it. What? Did they not see that she was ugly, and that Christophe could not bear her? But it was so good to hope. She came to believe that perhaps she had been wrong, that she was not as ugly as she thought. She would sit up on her sofa to try and see herself in the mirror on the wall opposite, above the mantelpiece. She did not know what to think. After all, her father and her grandfather were better judges than herself. People cannot tell about themselves. Oh, heaven, if it were possible, if it could be, if she never dared think it, if, if she were pretty, perhaps also she had exaggerated Christophe's antipathy. No doubt he was indifferent, and after the interest he had shown in her the day after the accident did not bother about her any more. He forgot to inquire, but Rosa made excuses for him. He was so busy. How should he think of her? An artist cannot be judged like other men. And yet, resigned though she was, she could not help expecting with beating heart a word of sympathy from him when he came near her. A word only, a look. Her imagination did the rest. In the beginning love needs so little food. It is enough to see, to touch as you pass. Such a power of dreams flows from the soul in such moments that almost of itself it can create its love. A trifle can plunge it into ecstasy that later, when it is more satisfied and in proportion more exacting, it will hardly find again when at last it does possess the object of its desire. Rosa lived absolutely, though no one knew it, in a romance of her own fashioning, pieced together by herself. Christophe loved her secretly and was too shy to confess his love, or there was some stupid reason, fantastic or romantic, delightful to the imagination of the sentimental little ninny. She fashioned endless stories, and all perfectly absurd. She knew it herself, but tried not to know it. She lied to herself voluptuously for days and days as she bent over her sewing. It made her forget to talk. Her flood of words was turned inward, like a river which suddenly disappears underground. But then the river took its revenge. What a debauch of speeches, of unuttered conversations, which no one heard but herself. 
Sometimes her lips would move, as they do with people who have to spell out the syllables to themselves as they read so as to understand them. When her dreams left her, she was happy and sad. She knew that things were not as she had just told herself, but she was left with a reflected happiness and had greater confidence for her life. She did not despair of winning Christophe. She did not admit it to herself, but she set about doing it. With the sureness of instinct that great affection brings, the awkward, ignorant girl contrived immediately to find the road by which she might reach her beloved's heart. She did not turn directly to him, but as soon as she was better and could once more walk about the house, she approached Louisa. The smallest excuse served. She found a thousand little services to render her, when she went out, she never failed to undertake various errands. She spared her going to the market, arguments with tradespeople. She would fetch water for her from the pump in the yard. She cleaned the windows and polished the floors in spite of Louise's protestations, who was confused when she did not do her work alone. But she was so weary that she had not the strength to oppose anybody who came to help her. Christophe was out all day. Louisa felt that she was deserted, and the companionship of the affectionate, chattering girl was pleasant to her. Rosa took up her quarters in her room. She brought her sewing, and talked all the time. By clumsy devices she tried to bring conversation round to Christophe. Just to hear of him, even to hear his name, made her happy. Her hands would tremble. She would sit with downcast eyes. Louisa was delighted to talk of her beloved Christophe, and would tell little tales of his childhood, trivial and just a little ridiculous. But there was no fear of Rosa thinking them so. She took a great joy, and there was a dear emotion for her in imagining Christophe as a child, and doing all the tricks and having all the darling ways of children. In her, the motherly tenderness which lies in the hearts of all women was mingled deliciously with that other tenderness. She would laugh heartily, and tears would come to her eyes. Louisa was touched by the interest that Rosa took in her. She guessed dimly what was in the girl's heart, but she never let it appear that she did so. But she was glad of it, for of all in the house she only knew the worth of the girl's heart. Sometimes she would stop talking to look at her, Rosa, surprised by her silence, would raise her eyes from her work. Louisa would smile at her. Rosa would throw herself into her arms, suddenly, passionately, and would hide her face in Louisa's bosom. Then they would go on working and talking, as if nothing had happened. In the evening when Christophe came home, Louisa, grateful for Rosa's attentions, and in pursuance of the little plan she had made, always praised the girl to the skies. Christophe was touched by Rosa's kindness. He saw how much good she was doing his mother, in whose face there was more serenity. And he would thank her effusively. Rosa would murmur and escape to conceal her embarrassment. So she appeared a thousand times more intelligent and sympathetic to Christophe than if she had spoken. He looked at her less with a prejudiced eye, and did not conceal his surprise at finding unsuspected qualities in her. Rosa saw that. She marked the progress that she made in his sympathy, and thought that his sympathy would lead to love. She gave herself up more than ever to her dreams. She came near to believing, with the beautiful presumption of youth, that what you desire with all your being is always accomplished in the end. Besides, how was her desire unreasonable? Should not Christophe have been more sensible than any other of her goodness and her affectionate need of self-devotion? But Christophe gave no thought to her. He esteemed her, but she filled no room in his thoughts. He was busied with far other things at the moment. Christophe was no longer Christophe. He did not know himself. He was in a mighty travail, that was like to sweep everything away, a complete upheaval. End of section 25
Section 26 of Jean Christophe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1 by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Youth 1, Part 5. Christophe was conscious of extreme weariness and great uneasiness. He was, for no reason, worn out. His head was heavy, his eyes, his ears, all his senses were dumb and throbbing. He could not give his attention to anything. His mind leaped from one subject to another, and was in a fever that sucked him dry. The perpetual fluttering of images in his mind made him giddy. At first he attributed it to fatigue and the enervation of the first days of spring. But spring passed, and his sickness only grew worse. It was what the poets, who only touch lightly on things, call the unease of adolescence, the trouble of the cherubim, the waking of the desire of love in the young body and soul. As if the fearful crisis of all a man's being, breaking up, dying, and coming to full rebirth, as if the cataclysm in which everything, faith, thought, action, all life, seems like to be blotted out, and then to be new forged in the convulsions of sorrow and joy, can be reduced to terms of a child's folly. All his body and soul were in a ferment. He watched them, having no strength to struggle with a mixture of curiosity and disgust. He did not understand what was happening in himself. His whole being was disintegrated. He spent days together in absolute torpor. Work was torture to him. At night he slept heavily and in snatches, dreaming monstrously with gusts of desire. The soul of a beast was racing madly in him. Burning, bathed in sweat, he watched himself in horror. He tried to break free of the crazy and unclean thoughts that possessed him, and he wondered if he were going mad. The day gave him no shelter from his brutish thoughts. In the depths of his soul he felt that he was slipping down and down. There was no stay to clutch at, no barrier to keep back chaos. All his defenses, all his citadels, with the quadruple rampart that hemmed him in so proudly, his God, his art, his pride, his moral faith, all was crumbling away, falling piece by piece from him. He saw himself naked, bound, lying, unable to move, like a corpse on which vermin swarm. He had spasms of revolt. Where was his will, of which he was so proud? He called to it in vain. It was like the efforts that one makes in sleep, knowing that one is dreaming and trying to awake. Then one succeeds only in falling from one dream to another like a lump of lead, and in being more and more choked by the suffocation of the soul in bondage. At last he found that it was less painful not to struggle. He decided not to do so with fatalistic apathy and despair. The even tenor of his life seemed to be broken up. Now he slipped down a subterranean crevasse and was like to disappear. Now he bounded up again with a violent jerk, the chain of his days was snapped. In the midst of the even plain of the hours, great gaping holes would open to engulf his soul. Christophe looked on at the spectacle as though it did not concern him. Everything, everybody, and himself, were strange to him. He went about his business, did his work automatically. It seemed to him that the machinery of his life might stop at any moment. The wheels were out of gear at dinner with his mother and the others, in the orchestra with the musicians and the audience, suddenly there would be a void and emptiness in his brain. He would look stupidly at the grinning faces about him, and he could not understand. He would ask himself, What is there between these creatures and... He dared not even say, And me. For he knew not whether he existed. He would speak, and his voice would seem to issue from another body. 
He would move, and he saw his movements from afar, from above, from the top of a tower. He would pass his hand over his face, and his eyes would wander. He was often near doing crazy things. It was especially when he was most in public that he had to keep guard on himself. For example, on the evenings when he went to the palace or was playing in public, then he would suddenly be seized by a terrific desire to make a face or say something outrageous, to pull the Grand Duke's nose or to take a running kick at one of the ladies. One whole evening, while he was conducting the orchestra, he struggled against an insensate desire to undress himself in public, and he was haunted by the idea from the moment when he tried to check it. He had to exert all his strength not to give way to it. When he issued from the brute struggle, he was dripping with sweat, and his mind was blank. He was really mad. It was enough for him to think that he must not do a thing for it to fasten on him with the maddening tenacity of a fixed idea. So his life was spent in a series of unbridled outbreaks and of endless falls into emptiness, a furious wind in the desert. Whence came this wind? From what abyss came these desires that wrenched his body and mind? He was like a bow stretched to breaking point by a strong hand, to what end unknown? which then springs back like a piece of dead wood. Of what force was he the prey? He dared not probe for it. He felt that he was beaten, humiliated, and he would not face his defeat. He was weary and broken in spirit. He understood now the people whom formerly he had despised, those who will not seek awkward truth. In the empty hours, when he remembered the time was passing, his work neglected, the future lost, he was frozen with terror. But there was no reaction, and his cowardice found excuses in desperate affirmation of the void in which he lived. He took a bitter delight in abandoning himself to it like a wreck on the waters. What was the good of fighting? There was nothing beautiful nor good, neither God nor life nor being of any sort. In the street as he walked, suddenly the earth would sink away from him, there was neither ground, nor air, nor light, nor himself. There was nothing. He would fall, his head would drag him down, face forwards. He could hardly hold himself up. He was on the point of collapse. He thought he was going to die. Suddenly, struck down. He thought he was dead. Christophe was growing a new skin. Christophe was growing a new soul. And seeing the worn-out and rotten soul of his childhood falling away, he never dreamed that he was taking on a new one, young and stronger. As through life we change our bodies, so also do we change our souls, and the metamorphosis does not always take place slowly over many days. There are times of crisis when the whole is suddenly renewed. The adult changes his soul. The old soul that is cast off dies. In those hours of anguish we think that all is at an end, and the whole thing begins again. A life dies, another life has already come into being. One night he was alone in his room, with his elbow on his desk, under the light of a candle. His back was turned to the window. He was not working. He had not been able to work for weeks. Everything was twisting and turning in his head. He had brought everything under scrutiny at once. Religion, morals, art, the whole of life. And in the general dissolution of his thoughts was no method, no order. He had plunged into the reading of books, taken haphazardly from his grandfather's heterogeneous library, or from Fogel's collection of books. Books of theology, science, philosophy, an odd lot, of which he understood nothing, having everything to learn. He could not finish any of them, and in the middle of them went off on divagations, endless whimsies, which left him weary, empty, and in mortal sorrow. So that evening he was sunk in an exhausted torpor. The whole house was asleep. His window was open. Not a breath came up from the yard. Thick clouds filled the sky. Christophe mechanically watched the candle burn away at the bottom of the candlestick. He could not go to bed. He had no thought of anything. He felt the void growing, growing from moment to moment. 
He tried not to see the abyss that drew him to its brink, and in spite of himself he leaned over and his eyes gazed into the depths of the night. In the void chaos was stirring, and faint sounds came from the darkness. Agony filled him. A shiver ran down his spine. His skin tingled. He clutched the table so as not to fall. Convulsively he awaited nameless things, a miracle, a god. Suddenly, like an opened sluice in the yard behind him, a deluge of water, a heavy rain, large drops downpouring, fell. The still air quivered. The dry, hard soil rang out like a bell, and the vast scent of the earth, burning warm as that of an animal, the smell of the flowers, fruit, and amorous flesh rose in a spasm of fury and pleasure. Christophe, under illusion, at fullest stretch, shook. He trembled. The veil was rent. He was blinded. By a flash of lightning, he saw in the depths of the night, he saw he was God. God was in himself. He burst the ceiling of the room, the walls of the house. He cracked the very bounds of existence. He filled the sky, the universe, space. The world coursed through him like a cataract. In the horror and ecstasy of that cataclysm, Christophe fell, too, swept along by the whirlwind which brushed away and crushed like straws the laws of nature. He was breathless. He was drunk with the swift hurtling down into God, God abyss, God gulf, fire of being, hurricane of life, madness of living, aimless, uncontrolled, beyond reason, for the fury of living. When the crisis was over, he fell into a deep sleep and slept as he had not done for long enough. Next day, when he awoke, his head swam. He was as broken as though he had been drunk. But in his inmost heart, he had still a beam of that somber and great light that had struck him down the night before. He tried to relight it. In vain. The more he pursued it, the more it eluded him. From that time on, all his energy was directed towards recalling the vision of a moment. The endeavor was futile. Ecstasy does not answer the bidding of the will. But that mystic exaltation was not the only experience that he had of it. It recurred several times, but never with the intensity of the first. It came always at moments when Christophe was least expecting it, for a second only, a time so short, so sudden, no longer than a wink of an eye or a raising of a hand, that the vision was gone before he could discover that it was and then he would wonder whether he had not dreamed it. After that fiery bolt that had set the night aflame, it was a gleaming dust, shedding fleeting sparks, which the eye could hardly see as they sped by. But they reappeared more and more often, and in the end they surrounded Christophe with a halo of perpetual misty dreams in which his spirit melted. Everything that distracted him in his state of semi-hallucination was an irritation to him. It was impossible to work. He gave up thinking about it. Society was odious to him, and more than any, that of his intimates, even that of his mother, because they arrogated to themselves more rights over his soul. He left the house. He took to spending his days abroad, and never returned until nightfall. He sought the solitude of the fields, and delivered himself up to it, drank his fill of it, like a maniac who wishes not to be disturbed by anything in the obsession of his fixed ideas. But in the great sweet air, in contact with the earth, his obsession relaxed. His ideas ceased to appear like specters, his exultation was no less. Rather, it was heightened, but it was no longer a dangerous delirium of the mind, but a healthy intoxication of his whole being, body and soul, crazy in their strength. He rediscovered the world, as though he had never seen it. It was a new childhood. It was as though a magic word had been uttered. 
an open sesame. Nature flamed with gladness. The sun boiled. The liquid sky ran like a clear river. The earth steamed and cried aloud in delight. The plants, the trees, the insects, all the innumerable creatures were like dazzling tongues of flame in the fire of life writhing upwards. Everything sang aloud in joy. And that joy was his own. That strength was his own. He was no longer cut off from the rest of the world. Till then, even in the happy days of childhood, when he saw nature with ardent and delightful curiosity, all creatures had seemed to him to be little worlds shut up, terrifying and grotesque, unrelated to himself and incomprehensible. He was not even sure that they had feeling and life. They were strange machines. And sometimes Christophe had even, with the unconscious cruelty of a child, dismembered wretched insects without dreaming that they might suffer, for the pleasure of watching their queer contortions. His uncle Gottfried, usually so calm, had one day indignantly to snatch from his hands an unhappy fly that he was torturing. The boy had tried to laugh at first. Then he had burst into tears, moved by his uncle's emotion. He began to understand that his victim did really exist, as well as himself, and that he had committed a crime. But if thereafter nothing would have induced him to do harm to the beasts, he never felt any sympathy for them. He used to pass them by without ever trying to feel what it was that worked their machinery. Rather, he was afraid to think of it. It was something like a bad dream. And now everything was made plain. These humble, obscure creatures became in their turn centers of light. Lying on his belly in the grass where creatures swarmed, in the shade of the trees that buzzed with insects, Christophe would watch the fevered movements of the ants, the long-legged spiders that seemed to dance as they walked, the bounding grasshoppers that leap aside, the heavy, bustling beetles, and the naked worms, pink and glabrous, mottled with white, or with his hands under his head and his eyes dosed, he would listen to the invisible orchestra, the roundelay of the frenzied insects circling in a sunbeam about the scented pines, the trumpeting of the mosquitoes, the organ notes of the wasps, the brass of the wild bees humming like bells in the tops of the trees, and the godlike whispering of the swaying trees, the sweet moaning of the wind in the branches, the soft whispering of the waving grass, like a breath of wind rippling the limpid surface of a lake, like the rustling of a light dress, and the lover's footsteps coming near and passing, then lost upon the air. He heard all these sounds and cries within himself. Through all these creatures, from the smallest to the greatest, flowed the same river of life, and in it he too swam. So he was one of them, he was of their blood, and brotherly, he heard the echo of their sorrows and their joys. Their strength was merged in his like a river fed with thousands of streams. He sank into them, his lungs were like to burst with the wind too freely blowing, too strong, that burst the windows and forced its way into the closed house of his suffocating heart. The change was too abrupt. After finding everywhere a void, when he had been buried only in his own existence, and had felt it slipping from him and dissolving like rain, now everywhere he found infinite and unmeasured being, now that he longed to forget himself, to find rebirth in the universe, he seemed to have issued from the grave. He swam voluptuously in life, flowing free and full, and borne on by its current, he thought that he was free. He did not know that he was less free than ever, that no creature is ever free, that even the law that governs the universe is not free, that only death perhaps, can bring deliverance. But the chrysalis, issuing from its stifling sheath joyously, stretched its limbs in its new shape, and had no time as yet to mark the bounds of its new prison. 
There began a new cycle of days, days of gold and fever, mysterious, enchanted, like those of his childhood, when one by one he discovered things for the first time. From dawn to set of sun he lived in one long mirage. He deserted all his business. The conscientious boy, who for years had never missed a lesson or an orchestra rehearsal, even when he was ill, was forever finding paltry excuses for neglecting his work. He was not afraid to lie. He had no remorse about it. The stoic principles of life, to which he had hitherto delighted to bend his will, morality, duty, now seemed to him to have no truth nor reason. Their jealous despotism was smashed against nature. Human nature, healthy, strong, free, that alone was virtue. To hell with all the rest. It provoked pitying laughter to see the little piddling rules of prudence and policy which the world adorns with the name of morality, while it pretends to enclose all life within them. A preposterous molehill, an ant-like people. Life sees to it that they are brought to reason. Life does but pass, and all is swept away. Bursting with energy, Christophe had moments when he was consumed with a desire to destroy, to burn, to smash, to glut with actions blind and uncontrolled the force which choked him. These outbursts usually ended in a sharp reaction. He would weep and fling himself down on the ground and kiss the earth and try to dig into it with his teeth and hands, to feed himself with it, to merge into it, he trembled then with fever and desire. One evening he was walking in the outskirts of a wood. His eyes were swimming with the light. His head was whirling. He was in that state of exaltation when all creatures and things were transfigured. To that was added the magic of the soft, warm light of evening. Bays of purple and gold hovered in the trees. From the meadows seemed to come a phosphorescent glimmer. In a field nearby, a girl was making hay. In her blouse and short skirt, with her arms and neck bare, she was raking the hay and heaping it up. She had a short nose, wide cheeks, a round face, a handkerchief thrown over her hair. The setting sun touched with red her sunburned skin, which, like a piece of pottery, seemed to absorb the last beams of the day. She fascinated Christophe. Leaning against a beech tree, he watched her come towards the verge of the woods, eagerly, passionately. Everything else had disappeared. She took no notice of him. For a moment she looked at him cautiously. He saw her eyes blue and hard in her brown face. She passed so near to him that, when she leaned down to gather up the hay through her open blouse, he saw a soft down on her shoulders and back. Suddenly the vague desire which was in him leaped forth. He hurled himself at her from behind, seized her neck and waist, threw back her head, and fastened his lips upon hers. He kissed her dry, cracked lips until he came against her teeth that bit him angrily. His hands ran over her rough arms, over her blouse wet with her sweat. She struggled. He held her tighter. He wished to strangle her. She broke loose, cried out, spat, wiped her lips with her hand, and hurled insults at him. He let her go and fled across the fields. She threw stones at him and went on discharging after him a litany of filthy epithets. He blushed, less for anything that she might say or think, but for what he was thinking himself. The sudden unconscious act filled him with terror. What had he done? What should he do? What he was able to understand of it all only filled him with disgust, and he was tempted by his disgust. He fought against himself and knew not on which side was the real Christophe. A blind force beset him. In vain did he fly from it. It was only to fly from himself. What would she do about him? What should he do tomorrow, in an hour? the time it took to cross the ploughed field to reach the road. Would he ever reach it? Should he not stop and go back and run back to the girl? And then he remembered that delirious moment 
when he had held her by the throat, everything was possible, all things were worthwhile, a crime even, yes, even a crime. The turmoil in his heart made him breathless. When he reached the road, he stopped to breathe. Over there, the girl was talking to another girl who had been attracted by her cries, and with arms akimbo, they were looking at each other and shouting with laughter. End of section 26「Section 27 of Jean Christophe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1 by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Youth 2, Part 1. 2. Sabine. He went home. He shut himself up in his room and never stirred for several days. He only went out even into the town when he was compelled. He was fearful of ever going out beyond the gates and venturing forth into the fields. He was afraid of once more falling in with the soft, maddening breath that had blown upon him like a rushing wind during a calm in a storm. He thought that the walls of the town might preserve him from it. He never dreamed that for the enemy to slip within there needed be only the smallest crack in the closed shutters, no more than is needed for a peep out. In a wing of the house on the other side of the yard there lodged on the ground floor a young woman of twenty, some months a widow, with a little girl. Frau Sabine Frolich was also a tenant of old Euler's. She occupied the shop which opened on to the street, and she had as well two rooms looking on to the yard, together with a little patch of garden, marked off from the Euler's by a wire fence, up which Ivy climbed. They did not often see her, the child used to play down in the garden from morning to night, making mud pies, and the garden was left to itself, to the great distress of old Eustus, who loved tidy paths and neatness in the beds. He had tried to bring the matter to the attention of his tenant, but that was probably why she did not appear, and the garden was not improved by it. Frau Frolich kept a little draper's shop, which might have had customers enough, thanks to its position in a street of shops in the center of the town, but she did not bother about it any more than about her garden. Instead of doing her housework herself, as, according to Frau Vogel, every self-respecting woman ought to do, especially when she is in circumstances which do not permit, much less excuse, idleness, she had hired a little servant, a girl of fifteen, who came in for a few hours in the morning to clean the rooms and look after the shop, while the young woman lay in bed or dawdled over her toilet. Christophe used to see her sometimes through his windows, walking about her room with bare feet in her long nightgown, or sitting for hours together before her mirror, for she was so careless that she used to forget to draw her curtains, and when she saw him, she was so lazy that she could not take the trouble to go and lower them. Christophe, more modest than she, would leave the window so as not to incommode her. But the temptation was great. He would blush a little and steal a glance at her bare arms, which were rather thin, as she drew them languidly around her flowing hair, and with her hands clasped behind her head, lost herself in a dream until they were numbed and then she would let them fall. Christophe would pretend that he only saw these pleasant sights inadvertently as he happened to pass the window, and that they did not disturb him in his musical thoughts. But he liked it, and in the end he wasted as much time in watching Frau Zabina as she did over her toilet. Not that she was a coquette. She was rather careless, generally, and did not take anything like the meticulous care with her appearance that Amalia or Rosa did. If she dawdled in front of her dressing-table, it was from pure laziness. Every time she put in a pin, she had to rest from the effort of it. 
while she made little piteous faces at herself in the mirrors. She was never quite properly dressed at the end of the day. Often her servant used to go before Sabina was ready, and a customer would ring the shop bell. She would let him ring and call once or twice before she could make up her mind to get up from her chair. She would go down, smiling and never hurrying, never hurrying would look for the article required. And if she could not find it after looking for some time, or even, as happened sometimes, if she had to take too much trouble to reach it, as, for instance, taking the ladder from one end of the shop to the other, she would say calmly that she did not have it in stock, and as she never bothered to put her stock in order or to order more of the articles of which she had run out, her customers used to lose patience and go elsewhere. But she never minded. How could you be angry with such a pleasant creature who spoke so sweetly and was never excited about anything? She did not mind what anybody said to her, and she made this so plain that those who began to complain never had the courage to go on. They used to go, answering her charming smile with a smile, but they never came back. She never bothered about it. She went on smiling. She was like a little Florentine figure. Her well-marked eyebrows were arched. Her gray eyes were half open behind the curtain of her lashes. The lower eyelid was a little swollen, with a little crease below it. Her little finely drawn nose turned up slightly at the end. Another little curve lay between it and her upper lip, which curled up above her half-open mouth, pouting in a weary smile. Her lower lip was a little thick. The lower part of her face was rounded and had the serious expression of the little virgins of Filippo Lippi. Her complexion was a little muddy. Her hair was light brown, always untidy, and done up in a slovenly chignon. She was slight of figure, small-boned, and her movements were lazy. Dressed carelessly, a gaping bodice, buttons missing, ugly worn shoes, always looking a little slovenly, she charmed by her grace and youth, her gentleness, her instinctively coaxing ways. When she appeared to take the air at the door of her shop, the young men who passed used to look at her with pleasure, and although she did not bother about them, she noticed it none the less. Always then she wore that grateful and glad expression which is in the eyes of all women when they know that they have been seen with sympathetic eyes. It seemed to say, Thank you, again, look at me again. But though it gave her pleasure to please, her indifference would never let her make the smallest effort to please. She was an object of scandal to the Euler Vogels. Everything about her offended them, her indolence, the untidiness of her house, the carelessness of her dress, her polite indifference to their remarks, her perpetual smile, the impertinent serenity with which she had accepted her husband's death, her child's illnesses, her straitened circumstances, the great and small annoyances of her daily life, while nothing could change one jot of her favorite habits or her eternal longing, everything about her offended them. And the worst of all was that, as she was, she did give pleasure. Frau Vogel could not forgive her that. It was almost as though Sabina did it on purpose, on purpose, ironically, to set at naught by her conduct the great traditions, the true principles, the savorless duty, the pleasureless labor, the restlessness, the noise, the quarrels, the mooning ways, the healthy pessimism which was the motive power of the Euler family, as it is that of all respectable persons, and made their life a foretaste of purgatory. That a woman who did nothing but dawdle about all the blessed day should take upon herself to defy them with her calm insolence, while they bore their suffering in silence like galley slaves, and that people should approve of her into the bargain, that was beyond the limit. That was enough to turn you against respectability. Fortunately, thank God, there were still a few sensible people left in the world. Frau Vogel consoled herself with them. 
They exchanged remarks about the little widow, and spied on her through her shutters. Such gossip was the joy of the family when they met at supper. Christophe would listen absently. He was so used to hearing the Fogels set themselves up as censors of their neighbors that he never took any notice of it. Besides, he knew nothing of Frau Zbina except her bare neck and arms, and though they were pleasing enough, they did not justify his coming to a definite opinion about her. However, he was conscious of a kindly feeling towards her, and, in a contradictory spirit, he was especially grateful to her for displeasing Frau Vogel. After dinner in the evening, when it was very hot, it was impossible to stay in the stifling yard, where the sun shone the whole afternoon. The only place in the house where it was possible to breathe was the rooms looking into the street. Euler and his son-in-law used sometimes to go and sit on the doorstep with Louisa. Frau Vogel and Rosa would only appear for a moment. They were kept by their housework. Frau Vogel took a pride in showing that she had no time for dawdling, and she used to say, loudly enough to be overheard, that all the people sitting there and yawning on their doorsteps, without doing a stitch of work, got on her nerves. As she could not, to her sorrow, compel them to work, she would pretend not to see them, and would go in and work furiously. Rosa thought she must do likewise. Euler and Vogel would discover drafts everywhere, and, fearful of catching cold, would go up to their rooms. They used to go to bed early, and would have thought themselves ruined had they changed the least of their habits. After nine o'clock only Louisa and Christophe would be left. Louisa spent the day in her room, and in the evening Christophe used to take pains to be with her, whenever he could, to make her take the air. If she were left alone, she would never go out. The noise of the street frightened her. Children were always chasing each other with shrill cries. All the dogs of the neighborhood took it up and barked. The sound of a piano came up, a little farther off a clarinet, and in the next street a cornet a piston. Voices chattered. People came and went and stood in groups in front of their houses. Louisa would have lost her head if she had been left alone in all the uproar. But when her son was with her it gave her pleasure. The noise would gradually die down. The children and the dogs would go to bed first. The groups of people would break up. The air would become more pure. Silence would descend upon the street. Louisa would tell in her thin voice the little scraps of news that she had heard from Amalia or Rosa. She was not greatly interested in them, but she never knew what to talk about to her son, and she felt the need of keeping in touch with him, of saying something to him. And Christophe, who felt her need, would pretend to be interested in everything she said. But he did not listen. He was off in vague dreams, turning over in his mind the doings of the day. One evening, when they were sitting there, while his mother was talking, he saw the door of the draper's shop open. A woman came out silently and sat in the street. Her chair was only a few yards from Louisa. She was sitting in the darkest shadow. Christophe could not see her face, but he recognized her. His dreams vanished. The air seemed sweeter to him. Louisa had not noticed Sabina's presence, and went on with her chatter in a low voice. Christophe paid more attention to her, and he felt impelled to throw out a remark here and there, to talk, perhaps to be heard. The slight figure sat there without stirring, a little limp, with her legs lightly crossed, and her hands lying crossed in her lap. She was looking straight in front of her, and seemed to hear nothing. Louisa was overcome with drowsiness. She went in. Christophe said he would stay a little longer. It was nearly ten. The street was empty. The people were going indoors. The sound of the shops being shut was heard. The lighted windows winked and then were dark again. One or two were still lit. Then they were blotted out. Silence. They were alone. They did not look at each other. They held their breath. They seemed not to be aware of each other. From the distant fields came the smell of the new-mown hay, 
and from a balcony in a house nearby the scent of a pot of cloves. No wind stirred. Above their heads was the Milky Way. To their right, red Jupiter. Above a chimney, Charles's wain bent its axles. In the pale green sky, its stars flowered like daisies. From the bells of the parish church, eleven o'clock rang out and was caught up by all the other churches, with their voices clear or muffled, and from the houses by the dim chiming of the clock or husky cuckoos. They awoke suddenly from their dreams, and got up at the same moment, and just as they were going indoors, they both bowed without speaking. Christophe went up to his room. He lighted his candle and sat down by his desk with his head in his hands, and stayed so for a long time without a thought. Then he sighed and went to bed. Next day when he got up, mechanically he went to his window to look down into Sabina's room. But the curtains were drawn. They were drawn the whole morning. They were drawn ever after. Next evening Christophe proposed to his mother that they should go again to sit by the door. He did so regularly. Louisa was glad of it. She did not like his shutting himself up in his room immediately after dinner with the window and shutters closed. The little silent shadow never failed to come and sit in its usual place. They gave each other a quick nod, which Louisa never noticed. Christophe would talk to his mother. Sabine would smile at her little girl, playing in the street. About nine she would go and put her to bed and would then return noiselessly. If she stayed a little, Christophe would begin to be afraid that she would not come back. He would listen for sounds in the house, the laughter of the little girl who would not go to sleep. He would hear the rustling of Sabine's dress before she appeared on the threshold of the shop. Then he would look away and talk to his mother more eagerly. Sometimes he would feel that Sabine was looking at him. In turn, he would furtively look at her but their eyes would never meet. The child was a bond between them. She would run about in the street with other children. They would find amusement in teasing a good-tempered dog sleeping there with his nose in his paws. He would cock a red eye and at last would emit a growl of boredom. Then they would fly this way and that, screaming in terror and happiness. The little girl would give piercing shrieks and look behind her as though she were being pursued, she would throw herself into Louisa's lap, and Louisa would smile fondly. She would keep the child and question her, and so she would enter into conversation with Sabine. Christophe never joined in. He never spoke to Sabine. Sabine never spoke to him. By tacit agreement, they pretended to ignore each other. But he never lost a word of what they said as they talked over him. His silence seemed unfriendly to Louisa. Sabine never thought it so, but it would make her shy, and she would grow confused in her remarks. Then she would find some excuse for going in. For a whole week Louisa kept indoors for a cold. Christophe and Sabine were left alone. The first time they were frightened by it. Sabine, to seem at her ease, took her little girl on her knees and loaded her with caresses. Christophe was embarrassed, and did not know whether he ought to go on ignoring what was happening at his side. It became difficult. Although they had not spoken a single word to each other, they did know each other, thanks to Louisa. He tried to begin several times, but the words stuck in his throat. Once more the little girl extricated them from their difficulty. She played hide-and-seek, and went round Christophe's chair. He caught her as she passed and kissed her. He was not very fond of children, but it was curiously pleasant to him to kiss the little girl. She struggled to be free, for she was busy with her game. He teased her. She bit his hands. He let her fall. Sabine laughed. They looked at the child and exchanged a few trivial words. Then Christophe tried, he thought he must, to enter into conversation. But he had nothing very much to go upon, and Sabine did not make his task any the easier. She only repeated what he said. It is a fine evening. Yes, it is a very fine evening. 
Impossible to breathe in the yard. Yes, the yard was stifling. Conversation became very difficult. Sabine discovered that it was time to take the little girl in, and went in herself, and she did not appear again. Christophe was afraid she would do the same on the evenings that followed, and that she would avoid being left alone with him, as long as Louisa was not there. But on the contrary, the next evening Sabine tried to resume their conversation. She did so deliberately rather than for pleasure. She was obviously taking a great deal of trouble to find subjects of conversation, and bored with the questions she put, questions and answers came between heartbreaking silences. Christophe remembered his first interviews with Otto, but with Sabine their subjects were even more limited than then, and she had not Otto's patience. When she saw the small success of her endeavors, she did not try any more. She had to give herself too much trouble, and she lost interest in it. She said no more, and he followed her lead. And then there was sweet peace again. The night was calm once more, and they returned to their inward thoughts. Sabine rocked slowly in her chair, dreaming. Christophe also was dreaming. They said nothing. After half an hour Christophe began to talk to himself, and in a low voice cried out with pleasure in the delicious scent brought by the soft wind that came from a cart of strawberries. Sabine said a word or two in reply. Again they were silent. They were enjoying the charm of these indefinite silences and trivial words. Their dreams were the same. They had but one thought. They did not know what it was. They did not admit it to themselves. At eleven they smiled and parted. Next day they did not even try to talk. They resumed their sweet silence. At long intervals a word or two let them know that they were thinking of the same things. Sabine began to laugh. "'How much better it is,' she said, "'not to try to talk. "'One thinks one must, and it is so tiresome.' "'Ah,' said Christophe with conviction, "'if only everybody thought the same.' They both laughed. They were thinking of Frau Vogel. "'Poor woman,' said Sabine. "'How exhausting she is!' "'She is never exhausted.' replied Christophe gloomily. She was tickled by his manner and his jest. "'You think it amusing?' he asked. "'That is easy for you. You are sheltered.' "'So I am,' said Sabine. "'I lock myself in.' She had a little soft laugh that hardly sounded. Christophe heard it with delight in the calm of the evening. He snuffed the fresh air luxuriously. "'Ah, it is good to be silent,' he said, stretching his limbs." "'And talking is no use,' said she. "'Yes,' returned Christophe. "'We understand each other so well.' They relapsed into silence. In the darkness they could not see each other. They were both smiling. And yet, though they felt the same when they were together, or imagined that they did, in reality they knew nothing of each other. Sabine did not bother about it. Christophe was more curious. One evening he asked her, do you like music? No, she said simply. It bores me. I don't understand it. Her frankness charmed him. He was sick of the lies of people who said that they were mad about music and were bored to death when they heard it, and it seemed to him almost a virtue not to like it and to say so. He asked if Sabine read. No, she had no books. He offered to lend her his. Serious books? she asked uneasily. Not serious books, if she did not want them. Poetry. But those are serious books. Novels, then, she pouted. They don't interest you? Yes, she was interested in them, but they were always too long. She never had the patience to finish them. She forgot the beginning, skipped chapters, and then lost the thread. And then she threw the book away. Fine interest you take. Bah, enough for a story that is not true. She kept her interest for better things than books. For the theatre, then? No, no. Didn't she go to the theatre? No, it was too hot. There were too many people. So much better at home. 
The lights tired her eyes, and the actors were so ugly. He agreed with her in that. But there were other things in the theatre. The play, for instance. Yes, she said absently. But I have no time. What do you do all day? She smiled. There is so much to do. True, said he. There is your shop. Oh, she said calmly. That does not take much time. Your little girl takes up your time, then? Oh, no, poor child. She is very good and plays by herself. Then? He begged pardon for his indiscretion, but she was amused by it. There are so many things. What things? She could not say. All sorts of things. Getting up, dressing, thinking of dinner, cooking dinner, eating dinner thinking of supper, cleaning her room, and then the day was over, and besides, you must have a little time for doing nothing. And you are not bored? Never. Even when you are doing nothing? Especially when I am doing nothing. It is much worse doing something. That bores me. They looked at each other and laughed. You are very happy, said Christophe. I can't do nothing. It seems to me that you know how. I have been learning lately. Ah, well, you'll learn. When he left off talking to her, he was at his ease and comfortable. It was enough for him to see her. He was rid of his anxieties and irritations and the nervous trouble that made him sick at heart. When he was talking to her, he was beyond care, and so when he thought of her, he dared not admit it to himself, but as soon as he was in her presence he was filled with a delicious, soft emotion that brought him almost to unconsciousness. At night he slept as he had never done. End of section 27section 28 of Jean Christophe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1 by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canan. Youth 2, Part 2. When he came back from his work, he would look into this shop. It was not often that he did not see Sabine. They bowed and smiled. Sometimes she was at the door, and then they would exchange a few words, and he would open the door and call the little girl and hand her a packet of sweets. One day he decided to go in. He pretended that he wanted some waistcoat buttons. She began to look for them, but she could not find them. All the buttons were mixed up. It was impossible to pick them out. She was a little put out, that he should see her untidiness. He laughed at it and bent over the better to see it. No, she said, trying to hide the drawers with her hands. Don't look. It is a dreadful muddle. She went on looking, but Christophe embarrassed her. She was cross, and as she pushed the drawer back, she said, I can't find any. Go to Lizzie in the next street. She is sure to have them. She has everything that people want. He laughed at her way of doing business. Do you send all your customers away like that? Well, you are not the first, said Sabine warmly, and yet she was a little ashamed. It is too much trouble to tidy up, she said. I put off doing it from day to day, but I shall certainly do it tomorrow. Shall I help you? asked Christophe. She refused. She would gladly have accepted, but she dared not for fear of gossip. And besides, it humiliated her. They went on talking. And your buttons? She said to Christophe a moment later. Aren't you going to Lizzie? Never, said Christophe. I shall wait until you have tidied up. Oh, said Sabine, who had already forgotten what she had just said. Don't wait all that time. Her frankness delighted them both. Christophe went to the drawer that she had shut. Let me look. 
She ran to prevent his doing so. No, now please. I am sure I haven't any. I bet you have. At once he found the button he wanted, and was triumphant. He wanted others. He wanted to go on rummaging, but she snatched the box from his hands, and, hurt in her vanity, she began to look herself. The light was fading. She went to the window. Christophe sat a little away from her. The little girl clambered on to his knees. He pretended to listen to her chatter and answered her absently. He was looking at Sabine, and she knew that he was looking at her. She bent over the box. He could see her neck and a little of her cheek. And as he looked, he saw that she was blushing, and he blushed too. The child went on talking. No one answered her. Sabine did not move. Christophe could not see what she was doing. He was sure she was doing nothing. She was not even looking at the box in her hands. The silence went on and on. The little girl grew uneasy and slipped down from Christophe's knees. Why don't you say anything? Sabine turned sharply and took her in her arms. The box was spilled on the floor. The little girl shouted with glee and ran on hands and knees after the buttons rolling under the furniture. Sabine went to the window again and laid her cheek against the pane. She seemed to be absorbed in what she saw outside. "'Good night,' said Christophe, ill at ease. She did not turn her head and said in a low voice, "'Good night.' On Sundays the house was empty during the afternoon. The whole family went to church for vespers. Sabine did not go. Christophe jokingly reproached her with it once when he saw her sitting at her door in the little garden while the lovely bells were bawling themselves hoarse summoning her. She replied in the same tone that only mass was compulsory, not vespers. It was then no use, and perhaps a little indiscreet to be too zealous, and she liked to think that God would be rather pleased than angry with her. "'You have made God in your own image,' said Christophe. "'I should be so bored if I were in his place,' replied she with conviction. "'You would not bother much about the world if you were in his place.' "'All that I should ask of it would be that it should not bother itself about me.' "'Perhaps it would be none the worse for that,' said Christophe. "'Shh!' cried Sabine. "'We are being irreligious. "'I don't see anything irreligious in saying that God is like you. "'I am sure he is flattered.' "'Will you be silent?' said Sabine, half laughing, half angry. She was beginning to be afraid that God would be scandalized. She quickly turned the conversation. "'Besides,' she said, "'it is the only time in the week when one can enjoy the garden in peace.' "'Yes,' said Christophe. "'They are gone.' They looked at each other. "'How silent it is,' muttered Sabine. "'We are not used to it. One hardly knows where one is. Oh, cried Christophe suddenly and angrily, there are days when I would like to strangle her. There was no need to ask of whom he was speaking. And the others? asked Sabine gaily. True, said Christophe, a little abashed. There is Rosa. Poor child, said Sabine. They were silent. If only it were always as it is now, sighed Christophe. She raised her laughing eyes to his, and then dropped them. He saw that she was working. "'What are you doing?' he asked. The fence of ivy that separated the two gardens was between them. "'Look,' she said, lifting a basin that she was holding in her lap. "'I am shelling peas.' She sighed. "'But that is not unpleasant,' he said, laughing. "'Oh,' she replied. It is disgusting, always having to think of dinner. I bet that if it were possible, he said, you would go without your dinner rather than have the trouble of cooking it. That's true, cried she. Wait, I'll come and help you. He climbed over the fence and came to her. She was sitting in a chair in the door. He sat on a step at her feet. He dipped into her lap for handfuls of green pods, and he poured the little round peas into the basin that Sabini held between her knees. He looked down. He saw Sabini's black stockings, clinging to her ankles and feet, 
One of her feet was half out of its shoe. He dared not raise his eyes to look at her. The air was heavy, the sky was dull, and clouds hung low. There was no wind, no leaf stirred. The garden was enclosed within high walls. There was no world beyond them. The child had gone out with one of the neighbors. They were alone. They said nothing. They could say nothing. Without looking, he went on taking handfuls of peas from Sabine's lap. His fingers trembled as he touched her. Among the fresh, smooth pods, they met Sabine's fingers, and they trembled, too. They could not go on. They sat still, not looking at each other. She leaned back in her chair with her lips half open and her arms hanging. He sat at her feet, leaning against her. Along his shoulder and arm, he could feel the warmth of Sabine's leg. They were breathless. Christophe laid his hands against the stones to cool them. One of his hands touched Sabine's foot, that she had thrust out of her shoe, and he left it there, could not move it. They shivered. Almost they lost control. Christophe's hand closed on the slender toes of Sabine's little foot. Sabine turned cold. The sweat broke out on her brow. She leaned towards Christophe. Familiar voices broke the spell. They trembled. Christophe leaped to his feet and crossed the fence again. Sabine picked up the shells in her lap and went in. In the yard he turned. She was at her door. They looked at each other. Drops of rain were beginning to patter on the leaves of the trees. She closed her door. Frau Vogel and Rosa came in. He went up to his room. In the yellow light of the waning day, drowned in the torrents of rain, he got up from his desk in response to an irresistible impulse. He ran to his window and held out his arms to the opposite window. At the same moment, through the opposite window in the half-darkness of the room, he saw... He thought he saw Sabine holding out her arms to him. He rushed from his room. He went downstairs. He ran to the garden fence. At the risk of being seen, he was about to clear it. But when he looked at the window at which she had appeared, he saw that the shutters were closed. The house seemed to be asleep. He stopped. Old Euler, going to his cellar, saw him and called him. He retraced his footsteps. He thought he must have been dreaming. It was not long before Rosa began to see what was happening. She had no diffidence, and she did not yet know what jealousy was. She was ready to give wholly and to ask nothing in return. But if she was sorrowfully resigned to not being loved by Christophe, she had never considered the possibility of Christophe loving another. One evening after dinner she had just finished a piece of embroidery at which she had been working for months. She was happy, and wanted for once in a way to leave her work and go and talk to Christophe. She waited until her mother's back was turned, and then slipped from the room. She crept from the house like a truant. She wanted to go and confound Christophe, who had vowed scornfully that she would never finish her work. She thought it would be a good joke to go and take them by surprise in the street. It was no use the poor child knowing how Christophe felt towards her. She was always inclined to measure the pleasure which others should have at seeing her by that which she had herself in meeting them. She went out. Christophe and Sabine were sitting as usual in front of the house. There was a catch at Rosa's heart. And yet she did not stop for the irrational idea that was in her, and she chafed Christophe warmly. The sound of her shrill voice in the silence of the night struck on Christophe like a false note. He started in his chair and frowned angrily. Rosa waved her embroidery in his face triumphantly. Christophe snubbed her impatiently. "'It is finished, finished,' insisted Rosa. "'Oh, well, go and begin another.' said Christophe curtly. Rosa was crestfallen. All her delight vanished. Christophe went on crossly. And when you have done thirty, when you are very old, you will at least be able to say to yourself that your life has not been wasted. Rosa was near weeping. How cross you are, Christophe, she said. Christophe was ashamed 
and spoke kindly to her. She was satisfied with so little that she regained confidence, and she began once more to chatter noisily. She could not speak low. She shouted deafeningly, like everybody in the house. In spite of himself, Christophe could not conceal his ill-humor. At first he answered her with a few irritated monosyllables. Then he said nothing at all, turned his back on her, fidgeted in his chair, and ground his teeth as she rattled on. Rosa saw that he was losing his temper and knew that she ought to stop, but she went on louder than ever. Sabine, a few yards away, in the dark, said nothing, watched the scene with ironic impassivity. Then she was weary, and feeling that the evening was wasted, she got up and went in. Christophe only noticed her departure after she had gone. He got up at once, and without ceremony went away with a curt, "'Good evening.' Rosa was left alone in the street, and looked in bewilderment at the door by which he had just gone in. Tears came to her eyes. She rushed in, went up to her room without a sound, so as not to have to talk to her mother, undressed hurriedly, and when she was in her bed, buried under the clothes, sobbed and sobbed. She made no attempt to think over what had passed. She did not ask herself whether Christophe loved Sabine, or whether Christophe and Sabine could not bear her. She knew only that all was lost, that life was useless, that there was nothing left to her but death. Next morning thought came to her once more with eternal elusive hope. She recalled the events of the evening and told herself that she was wrong to attach so much importance to them. No doubt Christophe did not love her. She was resigned to that. Though in her heart she thought, though she did not admit the thought, that in the end she would win his love by her love for him. But what reason had she for thinking that there was anything between Sabine and him? How could he, so clever as he was, love a little creature whose insignificance and mediocrity were patent? She was reassured. But for that she did not watch Christophe any the less closely. She saw nothing all day because there was nothing to see. But Christophe, seeing her prowling about him all day long without any sort of explanation, was peculiarly irritated by it. She set the crown on her efforts in the evening, when she appeared again, and sat with them in the street. The scene of the previous evening was repeated. Rosa talked alone but Sabine did not wait so long before she went indoors, and Christophe followed her example. Rosa could no longer pretend that her presence was not unwelcome, but the unhappy girl tried to deceive herself. She did not perceive that she could have done nothing worse than to try so to impose on herself, and with her usual clumsiness she went on through the succeeding days. Next day, with Rosa sitting by his side, Christophe waited in vain for Sabine to appear. The day after, Rosa was alone. They had given up the struggle. But she gained nothing by it save resentment from Christophe, who was furious at being robbed of his beloved evenings, his only happiness. He was the less inclined to forgive her for being absorbed with his own feelings. He had no suspicion of Rosa's. Sabine had known them for some time, she knew that Rosa was jealous, even before she knew that she herself was in love. But she said nothing about it, and with the natural cruelty of a pretty woman, who is certain of her victory, in quizzical silence she watched the futile efforts of her awkward rival. Left mistress of the field of battle, Rosa gazed piteously upon the results of her tactics. The best thing she could have done would have been not to persist, and to leave Christophe alone, at least for the time being. But that was not what she did, and as the worst thing she could have done was to talk to him about Sabine, that was precisely what she did. With a fluttering at her heart, by way of sounding him, she said timidly that Sabine was pretty. Christophe replied curtly that she was very pretty. And although Rosa might have foreseen the reply she would provoke, her heart thumped when she heard him. She knew that Sabine was pretty, but she had never particularly remarked it, 
Now she saw her for the first time with the eyes of Christophe. She saw her delicate features, her short nose, her fine mouth, her slender figure, her graceful movements. Ah, how sad! What would not she have given to possess Sabine's body and live in it? She did not go closely into why it should be preferred to her own. Her own? What had she done to possess such a body? What a burden it was upon her! How ugly it seemed to her! It was odious to her! And to think that nothing but death could ever free her from it! She was at once too proud and too humble to complain that she was not loved. She had no right to do so, and she tried even more to humble herself. But her instinct revolted. No, it was not just. Why should she have such a body, she and not Sabine? And why should Sabine be loved? What had she done to be loved? Rosa saw her with no kindly eye, lazy, careless, egoistic, indifferent towards everybody, not looking after her house or her child or anybody, loving only herself, living only for sleeping, dawdling, and doing nothing. And it was such a woman who pleased, who pleased Christophe, Christophe who was so severe, Christophe who was so discerning, Christophe whom she esteemed and admired more than anybody. How could Christophe be blind to it? She could not help from time to time dropping an unkind remark about Sabine in his hearing. She did not wish to do so, but the impulse was stronger than herself. She was always sorry for it, for she was a kind creature and disliked speaking ill of anybody. But she was the more sorry because she drew down on herself such cruel replies as showed how much Christophe was in love. He did not mince matters. Hurt in his love, he tried to hurt in return, and succeeded. Rosa would make no reply and go out with her head bowed and her lips tight-pressed to keep from crying. She thought that it was her own fault, that she deserved it for having hurt Christophe by attacking the object of his love. Her mother was less patient. Frau Vogel, who saw everything, and old Euler, also had not been slow to notice Christophe's interviews with their young neighbor. It was not difficult to guess their romance. Their secret projects of one day marrying Rosa to Christophe were set at naught by it, and that seemed to them a personal affront of Christophe, although he was not supposed to know that they had disposed of him without consulting his wishes. But Amalia's despotism did not admit of ideas contrary to her own, and it seemed scandalous to her that Christophe should have disregarded the contemptuous opinion she had often expressed of Sabine. She did not hesitate to repeat it for his benefit. Whenever he was present, she found some excuse for talking about her neighbor. She cast about for the most injurious things to say of her, things which might sting Christophe most cruelly, and with the crudity of her point of view and language, she had no difficulty in finding them. The ferocious instinct of a woman, so superior to that of a man in the art of doing evil, as well as of doing good, made her insist less on Sabine's laziness and moral failings than on her uncleanliness. Her indiscreet and prying eye had watched through the window for proofs of it in the secret processes of Sabine's toilet, and she exposed them with coarse complacency. When from decency she could not say everything, she left the more to be understood. Christophe would go pale with shame and anger. He would go white as a sheet and his lips would quiver. Rosa, foreseeing what must happen, would implore her mother to have done. She would even try to defend Sabine, but she only succeeded in making Amalia more aggressive. And suddenly Christophe would leap from his chair. He would thump on the table and begin to shout that it was monstrous to speak of a woman, to spy upon her, to expose her misfortunes. Only an evil mind could so persecute a creature who was good, charming, quiet, keeping herself to herself, and doing no harm to anybody, and speaking no ill of anybody. 
but they were making a great mistake if they thought they could do her harm. They only made him more sympathetic and made her kindness shine forth only the more clearly. Amalia would feel then that she had gone too far, but she was hurt by feeling it, and shifting her ground, she would say that it was only too easy to talk of kindness, that the word was called in as an excuse for everything. Heavens! It was easy enough to be thought kind when you never bothered about anything or anybody, and never did your duty. To which Christophe would reply that the first duty of all was to make life pleasant for others, but that there were people for whom duty meant only ugliness, unpleasantness, tiresomeness, and everything that interferes with the liberty of others and annoys and injures their neighbors, their servants, their families, and themselves. God save us from such people and such a notion of duty as from the plague. They would grow venomous. Amalia would be very bitter. Christophe would not budge an inch. And the result of it all was that henceforth Christophe made a point of being seen continually with Sabine. He would go and knock at her door. He would talk gaily and laugh with her. He would choose moments when Amalia and Rosa could see him. Amalia would avenge herself with angry words, but the innocent Rosa's heart was rent and torn by this refinement of cruelty. She felt that he detested them and wished to avenge himself, and she wept bitterly. End of section 28section twenty nine of jean christophe volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by joshua seeger in chicago jean christophe volume one by romain roland translated by gilbert canan youth two part three so christophe who had suffered so much from injustice learned unjustly to inflict suffering. Some time after that, Sabine's brother, a miller at Landeg, a little town a few miles away, was to celebrate the christening of a child. Sabine was to be godmother. She invited Christophe. He had no liking for these functions, but for the pleasure of annoying the Fogels and of being with Sabine, he accepted eagerly. Sabina gave herself the malicious satisfaction of inviting Amalia and Rosa also, being quite sure that they would refuse. They did. Rosa was longing to accept. She did not dislike Sabina. Sometimes even her heart was filled with tenderness for her because Christophe loved her. Sometimes she longed to tell her so and to throw her arms about her neck. But there was her mother and her mother's example— she stiffened herself in her pride and refused. Then, when they had gone, and she thought of them together, happy together, driving in the country on the lovely July day, while she was left shut up in her room with a pile of linen to mend, with her mother grumbling by her side, she thought she must choke, and she cursed her pride. Oh, if there were still time! Alas, if it were all to do again, she would have done the same. The miller had sent his wagonette to fetch Christophe and Sabina. They took up several guests from the town and the farms on the road. It was fresh, dry weather. The bright sun made the red berries of the brown trees by the road and the wild cherry trees in the fields shine. Sabina was smiling. Her pale face was rosy under the keen wind. Christophe had her little girl on his knees. They did not try to talk to each other. They talked to their neighbors without caring to whom or of what. They were glad to hear each other's voices. They were glad to be driving in the same carriage. They looked at each other in childish glee as they pointed out to each other a house, a tree, a passerby. Sabina loved the country, but she hardly ever went into it. Her incurable laziness made excursions impossible. It was almost a year since she had been outside the town, and so she delighted in the smallest things she saw. They were not new to Christophe, but he loved Sabina, and like all lovers he saw everything through her eyes, and felt all her thrills of pleasure 
and all and more than the emotion that was in her, for merging himself with his beloved, he endowed her with all that he was himself. When they came to the mill, they found in the yard all the people of the farm and the other guests who received them with a deafening noise. The fowls, the ducks, and the dogs joined in. The miller, Bertolk, a great fair-haired fellow, square of head and shoulders, as big and tall as Sabina was slight, took his little sister in his arms and put her down gently as though he were afraid of breaking her. It was not long before Christophe saw that the little sister, as usual, did just as she liked with the giant, and that while he made heavy fun of her whims and her laziness and her thousand and one failings, he was at her feet, her slave. She was used to it and thought it natural. She did nothing to win love. It seemed to her right that she should be loved, and, if she were not, did not care. That is why everybody loved her. Christophe made another discovery not so pleasing. For a christening, a godfather is necessary as well as a godmother, and the godfather has certain rights over the godmother, rights which he does not often renounce, especially when she is young and pretty. He learned this suddenly when he saw a farmer with fair curly hair and rings in his ears go up to Sabina laughing and kiss her on both cheeks. Instead of telling himself that he was an ass to have forgotten this privilege, and more than an ass to be huffy about it, he was cross with Sabina as though she had deliberately drawn him into the snare. His crossness grew worse when he found himself separated from her during the ceremony. Sabina turned round every now and then as the procession wound across the fields and threw him a friendly glance. He pretended not to see it. She felt that he was annoyed and guessed why, but it did not trouble her. It amused her. If she had had a real squabble with someone she loved, in spite of all the pain it might have caused her, she would never have made the least effort to break down any misunderstanding. It would have been too much trouble. Everything would come right if it were only left alone. At dinner, sitting between the miller's wife and a fat girl with red cheeks, whom he had escorted to the service without ever paying any attention to her, it occurred to Christophe to turn and look at his neighbor. And finding her calmly, out of revenge, he flirted desperately with her with the idea of catching Sabina's attention. He succeeded. But Sabina was not the sort of woman to be jealous of anybody or anything. So long as she was loved, she did not care whether her lover did or did not pay court to others, and instead of being angry, she was delighted to see Christophe amusing himself. From the other end of the table, she gave him her most charming smile. Christophe was disgruntled. There was no doubt, then, that Sabina was indifferent to him, and he relapsed into his sulky mood from which nothing could draw him, neither the soft eyes of his neighbor nor the wine that he drank. Finally, when he was half asleep, he asked himself angrily what on earth he was doing at such an interminable orgy, and did not hear the miller propose a trip on the water to take certain of the guests home. Nor did he see Sabina beckoning him to come with her, so that they should be in the same boat. When it occurred to him, there was no room for him, and he had to go in another boat. This fresh mishap was not likely to make him more amiable until he discovered that he was to be rid of almost all his companions on the way. Then he relaxed and was pleasant. Besides, the pleasant afternoon on the water, the pleasure of rowing, the merriment of these good people rid him of his ill humor. As Sabina was no longer there, he lost his self-consciousness and had no scruple about being frankly amused like the others. They were in their boats. They followed each other closely and tried to pass each other. They threw laughing insults at each other. When the boats bumped, Christophe saw Sabina's smiling face, and he could not help smiling, too. They felt that peace was made. He knew that very soon they would return together. They began to sing part songs. Each voice took up a line in time, and the refrain was taken up in chorus. The people in the different boats some way from each other, now echoed each other. The notes skimmed over the water like birds, 
From time to time, a boat would go in to the bank. A few peasants would climb out. They would stand there and wave to the boats as they went further and further away. Little by little, they were disbanded. One by one, voices left the chorus. At last, they were alone, Christophe, Sabina, and the miller. They came back in the same boat, floating down the river. Christophe and Berthold held the oars, but they did not row. Sabina sat in the stern facing Christophe and talked to her brother and looked at Christophe. Talking so, they were able to look at each other undisturbedly. They could never have done so had the words ceased to flow. The deceitful words seemed to say, It is not you that I see. But their eyes said to each other, Who are you? Who are you? You that I love. You that I love, whoever you be. The sky was clouded. Mists rose from the fields. The river steamed. The sun went down behind the clouds. Sabina shivered and wrapped her little black shawl round her head and shoulders. She seemed to be tired. As the boat, hugging the bank, passed under the spreading branches of the willows, she closed her eyes. Her thin face was pale. Her lips were sorrowful. She did not stir. She seemed to suffer, to have suffered, to be dead. Christophe's heart ached. He leaned over to her. She opened her eyes again and saw Christophe's uneasy eyes upon her, and she smiled into them. It was like a ray of sunlight to him. He asked in a whisper, Are you ill? She shook her head and said, I am cold. The two men put their overcoats about her, wrapped up her feet, her legs, her knees, like a child being tucked up in bed. She suffered it and thanked them with her eyes. A fine cold rain was beginning to fall. They took the oars and went quietly home. Heavy clouds hung in the sky. The river was inky black. Lights showed in the windows of the houses here and there in the fields. When they reached the mill, the rain was pouring down, and Sabina was numbed. They lit a large fire in the kitchen and waited until the deluge should be over. But it only grew worse, and the wind rose. They had to drive three miles to get back to the town. The miller declared that he would not let Sabina go in such weather, and he proposed that they should both spend the night in the farmhouse. Christophe was reluctant to accept. He looked at Sabina for counsel, but her eyes were fixed on the fire on the hearth. It was as though they were afraid of influencing Christophe's decision. But when Christophe had said yes, she turned to him, and she was blushing. Or was it the reflection of the fire? and he saw that she was pleased. A jolly evening, the rain stormed outside. In the black chimney the fire darted jets of golden sparks. They spun round and round. Their fantastic shapes were marked against the wall. The miller showed Sabina's little girl how to make shadows with her hands. The child laughed and was not altogether at her ease. Sabina leaned over the fire and poked it mechanically with a heavy pair of tongs, she was a little weary and smiled dreamily, while, without listening, she nodded to her sister-in-law's chatter of her domestic affairs. Christophe sat in the shadow by the miller's side and watched Sabina smiling. He knew that she was smiling at him. They never had an opportunity of being alone all evening or of looking at each other. They sought none. They parted early. Their rooms were adjoining and communicated by a door. Christophe examined the door and found that the lock was on Sabina's side. He went to bed and tried to sleep. The rain was pattering against the windows. The wind howled in the chimney. On the floor above him a door was banging. Outside the window a poplar bent and groaned under the tempest. Christophe could not close his eyes. He was thinking that he was under the same roof near her. A wall only divided them. He heard no sound in Sabina's room, but he thought he could see her. He sat up in his bed and called to her in a low voice through the wall. Tender, passionate words, he said. He held out his arms to her, and it seemed to him that she was holding out her arms to him. In his heart 
he heard the beloved voice answering him, repeating his words, calling low to him, and he did not know whether it was he who asked and answered all the questions, or whether it was really she who spoke. The voice came louder, the call to him. He could not resist. He leaped from his bed. He groped his way to the door. He did not wish to open it. He was reassured by the closed door, and when he laid his hand once more on the handle, he found that the door was opening. He stopped dead. He closed it softly. He opened it once more. He closed it again. Was it not closed just now? Yes, he was sure it was. Who had opened it? His heart beat so that he choked. He leaned over his bed and sat down to breathe again. He was overwhelmed by his passion. It robbed him of the power to see or hear or move. His whole body shook. He was in terror of this unknown joy for which for months he had been craving, which was with him now, near him, so that nothing could keep it from him. Suddenly the violent boy, filled with love, was afraid of these desires newly realized and revolted from them. He was ashamed of them, ashamed of what he wished to do. He was too much in love to dare to enjoy what he loved. He was afraid. He would have done anything to escape his happiness. Is it only possible to love, to love at the cost of the profanation of the beloved? He went to the door again, and trembling with love and fear, with his hand on the latch, he could not bring himself to open it. And on the other side of the door, standing barefooted on the tiled floor, shivering with cold, was Sabina. So they stayed. For how long? Minutes? Hours? They did not know that they were there. And yet they did know. They held out their arms to each other. He was overwhelmed by a love so great that he had not the courage to enter. She called to him, waited for him, trembled lest he should enter. And when at last he made up his mind to enter, she had just made up her mind to turn the lock again. Then he cursed himself for a fool. He leaned against the door with all his strength. With his lips to the lock he implored her, Open! He called to Sabina in a whisper. She could hear his heated breathing. She stayed motionless near the door. She was frozen. Her teeth were chattering. She had no strength either to open the door or to go to bed again. The storm made the trees crack and the doors in the house bang. They turned away and went to their beds, worn out, sad and sick at heart. The cocks crowed huskily. The first light of dawn crept through the wet windows, a wretched pale dawn, drowned in the persistent rain. Christophe got up as soon as he could. He went down to the kitchen and talked to the people there. He was in a hurry to be gone, and was afraid of being left alone with Sabina again. He was almost relieved when the miller's wife said that Sabina was unwell, and had caught cold during the drive, and would not be going that morning. His journey home was melancholy. He refused to drive, and walked through the soaking fields, in the yellow mist that covered the earth, the trees, the houses, with a shroud. Like the light, Life seemed to be blotted out. Everything loomed like a specter. He was like a specter himself. At home he found angry faces. They were all scandalized at his having passed the night, God knows where, with Sabina. He shut himself up in his room and applied himself to his work. Sabina returned the next day and shut herself up also. They avoided meeting each other. The weather was still wet and cold. Neither of them went out. They saw each other through their closed windows. Sabina was wrapped up by her fire, dreaming. Christophe was buried in his papers. They bowed to each other a little coldly and reservedly and then pretended to be absorbed again. They did not take stock of what they were feeling. They were angry with each other, with themselves, with things generally. The night at the farmhouse had been thrust aside in their memories. They were ashamed of it and did not know whether they were more ashamed of their folly or of not having yielded to it. It was painful to them to see each other, for that made them remember things from which they wished to escape, 
and by joint agreement they retired into the depths of their rooms so as utterly to forget each other. But that was impossible, and they suffered keenly under the secret hostility which they felt was between them. Christophe was haunted by the expression of dumb rancor which he had once seen in Sabine's cold eyes. From such thoughts her suffering was not less. In vain did she struggle against them, and even deny them. She could not rid herself of them. They were augmented by her shame that Christophe should have guessed what was happening within her, and the shame of having offered herself, the shame of having offered herself without having given. Christophe gladly accepted an opportunity which cropped up to go to Cologne and Dusseldorf for some concerts. He was glad to spend two or three weeks away from home. Preparation for the concerts and the composition of a new work that he wished to play at them took up all his time, and he succeeded in forgetting his obstinate memories. They disappeared from Sabina's mind, too, and she fell back into the torpor of her usual life. They came to think of each other with indifference. Had they really loved each other? They doubted it. Christophe was on the point of leaving for Cologne without saying good-bye to Sabine. On the evening before his departure they were brought together again by some imperceptible influence. It was one of the Sunday afternoons, when everybody was at church. Christophe had gone out, too, to make his final preparations for the journey. Sabina was sitting in her tiny garden, warming herself in the last rays of the sun. Christophe came home. He was in a hurry, and his first inclination when he saw her was to bow and pass on but something held him back as he was passing. Was it Sabina's paleness, or some indefinable feeling, remorse, fear, tenderness? He stopped, turned to Sabina, and leaning over the fence, he bade her good evening. Without replying, she held out her hand. Her smile was all kindness, such kindness as he had never seen in her. Her gesture seemed to say, Peace between us. He took her hand over the fence, bent over it, and kissed it. She made no attempt to withdraw it. He longed to go down on his knees and say, I love you. They looked at each other in silence, but they offered no explanation. After a moment, she removed her hand and turned her head. He turned, too, to hide his emotion. Then they looked at each other again with untroubled eyes. The sun was setting. Subtle shades of color, violet, orange, and mauve, chased across the cold, clear sky. She shivered and drew her shawl closer about her shoulders with a movement that he knew well. He asked, How are you? She made a little grimace, as if the question were not worth answering. They went on looking at each other and were happy. It was as though they had lost and had just found each other again. At last he broke the silence and said, I am going away tomorrow. There was alarm in Sabina's eyes. Going away? she said. He added quickly, Oh, only for two or three weeks. Two or three weeks? she said in dismay. He explained that he was engaged for the concerts, but that when he came back he would not stir all winter. Winter, she said. That is a long time off. Oh, no, it will soon be here. She saddened and did not look at him. When shall we meet again? She asked a moment later. He did not understand the question. He had already answered it. As soon as I come back, in a fortnight, or three weeks at most. She still looked dismayed. He tried to tease her. It won't be long for you, he said. You will sleep. Yes said Sabine. She looked down. She tried to smile, but her eyes trembled. Christophe, she said suddenly, turning towards him. There was a note of distress in her voice. She seemed to say, Stay, don't go. He took her hand, looked at her, did not understand the importance she attached to his fortnight's absence, but he was only waiting for a word from her to say, I will stay and just as she was going to speak, the front door was opened, and Rosa appeared. Sabina withdrew her hand from Christophe's 
and went hurriedly into her house. At the door she turned and looked at him once more, and disappeared. End of section 29《ジョン・ r ィストフ・ Christophe, Volume 1。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. ジョン・クリストフ・ Volume 1 by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert k a n a n Youth 2, Part 4. Christophe thought he should see her again in the evening. But he was watched by the Fogels and followed everywhere by his mother. As usual, he was behindhand with his preparations for his journey and could not find time to leave the house for a moment. Next day, he left very early. As he passed Sabine's door, he longed to go in, to tap at the window. It hurt him to leave her without saying good bye, for he had been interrupted by Rosa before he had had time to do so. But he thought she must be asleep and would be cross with him if he woke her up. And then, what could he say to her? It was too late now to abandon his journey. And what if she were to ask him to do so? He did not admit to himself that he was not averse to exercising his power over her, if need be, causing her a little pain. He did not take seriously the grief that his departure brought Sabine. And he thought that his short absence would increase the tenderness which, perhaps, she had for him. He ran to the station. In spite of everything, he was a little remorseful. But as soon as the train had started, it was all forgotten. There was youth in his heart. Gaily he saluted the old town with its roofs and towers rosy under the sun, and with the carelessness of those who are departing, he said good bye to those whom he was leaving. And thought no more of them. The whole time that he was at Dusseldorf and Cologne, Sabine never once recurred to his mind. Taken up from morning till night with rehearsals and concerts, dinners and talk, busied with a thousand and one new things, and the pride and satisfaction of his success, he had no time for recollection. Once only, on the fifth night after he left home, he woke suddenly after a dream. And knew that he had been thinking of her in his sleep, and that the thought of her had wakened him up. But he could not remember how he had been thinking of her. He was unhappy and feverish. It was not surprising. He had been playing at a concert that evening, and when he left the hall, he had been dragged off to a supper at which he had drunk several glasses of champagne. He could not sleep and got up. He was obsessed by a musical idea. He pretended that it was that which had broken in upon his sleep, and he wrote it down. As he read through it, he was astonished to see how sad it was. There was no sadness in him when he wrote, at least so he thought, but he remembered that on other occasions when he had been sad, he had only been able to write joyous music, so gay that it offended his mood. He gave no more thought to it. He was used to the surprises of his mind world without ever being able to understand them. He went to sleep at once and knew no more until the next morning. He extended his stay by three or four days. It pleased him to prolong it, knowing he could return whenever he liked. He was in no hurry to go home. It was only when he was on the way, in the train, that the thought of Sabina came back to him. He had not written to her. He was even careless enough never to have taken the trouble to ask at the post office for any letters that might have been written to him. He took a secret delight in his silence. He knew that at home he was expected, that he was loved. Loved? She had never told him so. He had never told her so. No doubt they knew it and had no need to tell it. And yet there was nothing so precious as the certainty of such an avowal. Why had they waited so long to make it? When they had been on the point of speaking, always something, some mischance, shyness, embarrassment, had hindered them. Why? Why? How much time they had lost. He longed to hear the dear words from the lips of the beloved. He longed to say them to her. He said them aloud in the empty carriage. 
As he neared the town, he was torn with impatience, a sort of agony. Faster! Faster! Oh! To think that in an hour he would see her again. It was half-past six in the morning when he reached home. Nobody was up yet. Sabina's windows were closed. He went into the yard on tiptoe, so that she should not hear him. He chuckled at the thought of taking her by surprise. He went up to his room. His mother was asleep. He washed and brushed his hair without making any noise. He was hungry, but he was afraid of waking Louisa by rummaging in the pantry. He heard footsteps in the yard. He opened his window softly and saw Rosa, first up as usual, beginning to sweep. He called her gently. She started in glad surprise when she saw him. Then she looked solemn. He thought she was still offended with him. But for the moment he was in a very good temper. He went down to her. "'Rosa, Rosa,' he said gaily. "'Give me something to eat, or I shall eat you. I am dying of hunger.' Rosa smiled and took him to the kitchen on the ground floor. She poured him out a bowl of milk, and then could not refrain from plying him with a string of questions about his travels and his concerts. But although he was quite ready to answer them, in the happiness of his return he was almost glad to hear Rosa's chatter once more. Rosa stopped suddenly in the middle of her cross-examination. Her face fell, her eyes turned away, and she became sorrowful. Then her chatter broke out again, but soon it seemed that she thought it out of place, and once more she stopped short. And he noticed it then and said, "'What is the matter, Rosa? Are you cross with me?' She shook her head violently in denial, and turning towards him with her usual suddenness, took his arm with both hands. "'Oh, Christophe!' she said. He was alarmed. He let his piece of bread fall from his hands. "'What? What is the matter?' he stammered. She said again, "'Oh, Christophe, such an awful thing has happened!' He thrust away from the table. He stuttered, uh, "'Here?' She pointed to the house on the other side of the yard. He cried, "'Sabine!' She wept. "'She is dead!' Christophe saw nothing. He got up. He almost fell. He clung to the table, upset the things on it, he wished to cry out. He suffered fearful agony. He turned sick. Rosa hastened to his side. She was frightened. She held his head and wept. As soon as he could speak, he said, It is not true. He knew that it was true, but he wanted to deny it. He wanted to pretend that it could not be. When he saw Rosa's face wet with tears, he could doubt no more, and he sobbed aloud. Rosa raised her head. Christophe, she said. He hid his face in his hands. She leaned towards him. Christophe, Mama is coming. Christophe got up. No, no, he said. She must not see me. She took his hand and led him, stumbling and blinded by his tears, to a little woodshed which opened on to the yard. She closed the door. They were in darkness. He sat on a block of wood used for chopping sticks. She sat on the faggots. Sounds from without were deadened and distant. There he could weep without fear of being heard. He let himself go and sobbed furiously. Rosa had never seen him weep. She had even thought that he could not weep. She knew only her own girlish tears, and such despair in a man filled her with terror and pity. She was filled with a passionate love for Christophe. It was an absolutely unselfish love an immense need of sacrifice, a maternal self-denial, a hunger to suffer for him, to take his sorrow upon herself. She put her arm round his shoulders. "'Dear Christophe,' she said, "'do not cry.' Christophe turned from her. "'I wish to die.' Rosa clasped her hands. "'Don't say that, Christophe. "'I wish to die. "'I cannot, cannot live now.' What is the good of living? Christophe, dear Christophe, you are not alone. You are loved. What is that to me? I love nothing now. It is nothing to me whether everything else live or die. I love nothing. I loved only her. I loved only her. 
He sobbed louder than ever, with his face buried in his hands. Rosa could find nothing to say. The egoism of Christophe's passion stabbed her to the heart. Now, when she thought herself most near to him, she felt more isolated and more miserable than ever. Grief, instead of bringing them together, thrust them only the more widely apart. She wept bitterly. After some time, Christophe stopped weeping and asked, How? How? Rosa understood. She fell ill of influenza on the evening you left, and she was taken suddenly. He groaned. Dear God, why did you not write to me? She said. I did write. I did not know your address. You did not give us any. I went and asked at the theater. Nobody knew it. He knew how timid she was, and how much it must have cost her. He asked, Did she... did she tell you to do that? She shook her head. No, but I thought... He thanked her with a look. Rosa's heart melted. My poor, poor Christophe, she said. She flung her arms round his neck and wept. Christophe felt the worth of such pure tenderness. He had so much need of consolation. He kissed her. How kind you are, he said. You loved her too? She broke away from him. She threw him a passionate look, did not reply, and began to weep again. That look was a revelation to him. It meant, It was not she whom I loved. Christophe saw at last what he had not known, what for months he had not wished to see. He saw that she loved him. Shh, she said. They are calling me. They heard Amalia's voice. Rosa asked, Do you want to go back to your room? He said, No, I could not yet. I could not bear to talk to my mother. Later on, she said, Stay here. I will come back soon. He stayed in the dark woodshed, to which only a thread of light penetrated through a small air hole filled with cobwebs. From the street there came up the cry of a hawker, Against the wall, a horse in a stable next door was snorting and kicking. The revelation that had just come to Christophe gave him no pleasure, but it held his attention for a moment. It made plain many things that he had not understood. A multitude of little things that he had disregarded occurred to him and were explained. He was surprised to find himself thinking of it. He was ashamed to be turned aside even for a moment from his misery. But that misery was so frightful, so irrepressible, that the mistrust of self-preservation, stronger than his will, than his courage, than his love, forced him to turn away from it, seized on this new idea, as the suicide drowning seizes in spite of himself on the first object which can help him, not to save himself, but to keep himself for a moment longer above the water and it was because he was suffering that he was able to feel what another was suffering, suffering through him. He understood the tears that he had brought to her eyes. He was filled with pity for Rosa. He thought how cruel he had been to her, how cruel he must still be, for he did not love her. What good was it for her to love him? Poor girl! In vain did he tell himself that she was good, she had just proved it. What was her goodness to him? What was her life to him? He thought, Why is it not she who is dead, and the other who is alive? He thought, She is alive. She loves me. She can tell me that today, tomorrow, all my life. And the other, the woman I love, she is dead and never told me that she loved me. I never have told her that I loved her. I shall never hear her say it. She will never know it. And suddenly he remembered that last evening. He remembered that they were just going to talk when Rosa came and prevented it. And he hated Rosa. The door of the woodshed was opened. Rosa called Christophe softly and groped towards him. She took his hand. He felt an aversion in her near presence. In vain did he reproach himself for it. It was stronger than himself. Rosa was silent. Her great pity had taught her silence. Christophe was grateful to her for not breaking in upon his grief with useless words. 
and yet he wished to know. She was the only creature who could talk to him of her. He asked in a whisper, When did she? He dared not say die. She replied, Last Saturday week. Dimly he remembered, he said, At night? Rosa looked at him in astonishment and said, Yes, at night, between two and three. The sorrowful melody came back to him, he asked, trembling. Did she suffer much? No, no. God be thanked, dear Christophe. She hardly suffered at all. She was so weak. She did not struggle against it. Suddenly they saw that she was lost. And she, did she know it? I don't know, I think. Did she say anything? No, nothing. She was sorry for herself like a child. You were there? Yes, for the first two days I was there alone, before her brother came. He pressed her hand in gratitude. Thank you. She felt the blood rush to her heart. After a silence, he said, he murmured the question which was choking him, Did she say anything? For me? Rosa shook her head sadly. She would have given much to be able to let him have the answer he expected. She was almost sorry that she could not lie about it. She tried to console him. She was not conscious. But she did speak. One could not make out what she said. It was in a very low voice. Where is the child? Her brother took her away with him to the country. And she? She is there, too. She was taken away last Monday week. They began to weep again. Frau Vogel's voice called Rosa once more. Christophe, left alone again, lived through those days of death. A week, already a week ago. Oh, God, what had become of her? How it had rained that week. And all that time he was laughing. He was happy. In his pocket he felt a little parcel wrapped up in soft paper. They were silver buckles that he had brought her for her shoes. He remembered the evening when he had placed his hand on the little stockinged foot. Her little feet, where were they now? How cold they must be! He thought the memory of that warm contact was the only one that he had of the beloved creature. He had never dared to touch her, to take her in his arms, to hold her to his breast. She was gone forever, and he had never known her. He knew nothing of her, neither soul nor body. He had no memory of her body, of her life, of her love. Her love? What proof had he of that? He had not even a letter, a token, nothing. Where could he seek to hold her, in himself or outside himself? Oh, nothing. There was nothing left him but the love he had for her nothing left him but himself, and in spite of all his desperate desire to snatch her from destruction, his need of denying death made him cling to the last piece of wreckage in an act of blind faith. Ne son già morto, e ben cialbergo cangi, resto in te vivo, cior mi vede e piangi, se l'altro amante si trasforma. I am not dead. I have changed my dwelling. I live still in thee who art faithful to me. The soul of the beloved is merged in the soul of the lover. He had never read these sublime words, but they were in him. Each one of us in turn climbs the calvary of the age. Each one of us finds anew the agony. Each one of us finds anew the desperate hope and folly of the ages. Each one of us follows in the footsteps of those who were, of those before us who struggled with death, denied death, and are dead. End of section 30。section 31 of Jean Christophe, volume 1 。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1, by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canan. Youth 2, 
Part 5 He shut himself up in his room. His shutters were closed all day, so as not to see the windows of the house opposite. He avoided the Fogels. They were odious to his sight. He had nothing to reproach them with. They were too honest, and too pious, not to have thrust back their feelings in the face of death. They knew Christophe's grief and respected it. Whatever they might think of it, they never uttered Sabina's name in his presence. But they had been her enemies when she was alive. That was enough to make him their enemy, now that she was dead. Besides, they had not altered their noisy habits, and in spite of the sincere though passing pity that they had felt, it was obvious that at bottom they were untouched by the misfortune. It was too natural. Perhaps even they were secretly relieved by it. Christophe imagined so, at least. Now that the Fogel's intentions with regard to himself were made plain, he exaggerated them in his own mind. In reality, they attached little importance to him. He set too great store by himself. But he had no doubt that the death of Sabine, by removing the greatest obstacle in the way of his landlord's plans, did seem to them to leave the field clear for Rosa. So he detested her. That they, the Fogels, Louisa, and even Rosa, should have tacitly disposed of him, without consulting him, was enough in any case to make him lose all affection for the person whom he was destined to love. He shied whenever he thought an attempt was made upon his umbrageous sense of liberty. But now it was not only a question of himself. The rights which these others had assumed over him did not only infringe upon his own rights, but upon those of the dead woman to whom his heart was given. So he defended them doggedly, although no one was for attacking them. He suspected Rosa's goodness. She suffered in seeing him suffer, and would often come and knock at his door to console him and talk to him about the other. He did not drive her away. He needed to talk of Sabine with someone who had known her. He wanted to know the smallest of what had happened during her illness. But he was not grateful to Rosa. He attributed ulterior motives to her. Was it not plain that her family, even Amalia, permitted these visits and long colloquies which she would never have allowed if they had not fallen in with her wishes? Was not Rosa in league with her family? He could not believe that her pity was absolutely sincere and free of personal thoughts. And, no doubt, it was not. Rosa pitied Christophe with all her heart. She tried hard to see Sabine through Christophe's eyes and through him to love her. She was angry with herself for all the unkind feelings that she had ever had towards her and asked her pardon in her prayers at night. But could she forget that she was alive, that she was seeing Christophe every moment of the day, that she loved him, that she was no longer afraid of the other, that the other was gone, that her memory would also fade away in its turn, that she was left alone, that one day, perhaps, in the midst of her sorrow, and the sorrow of her friend more hers than her own, could she repress a glad impulse, an unreasoning hope? For that, too, she was angry with herself. It was only a flash. It was enough. He saw it. He threw her a glance which froze her heart. She read in it hateful thoughts. He hated her for being alive while the other was dead. The miller brought his cart for Sabine's little furniture. Coming back from a lesson, Christophe saw heaped up before the door in the street the bed, the cupboard, the mattress, the linen, all that she had possessed, all that was left of her. It was a dreadful sight to him. He rushed past it. In the doorway he bumped into Berthold, who stopped him. "'Ah, my dear sir,' he said, shaking his hand effusively. "'Ah, who would have thought it when we were together? How happy we were! And yet it was because of that day, because of that cursed row on the water, that she fell ill. Oh, well, it is no use complaining. She is dead. It will be our turn next. That is life. And how are you? 
I am very well, thank God. He was red in the face, sweating, and smelled of wine. The idea that he was her brother, that he had rights in her memory, hurt Christophe. It offended him to hear this man talking of his beloved. The miller, on the contrary, was glad to find a friend with whom he could talk of Sabine. He did not understand Christophe's coldness. He had no idea of all the sorrow that his presence, the sudden calling to mind of the day at his farm, the happy memories that he recalled so blunderingly, the poor relics of Sabine, heaped upon the ground, which he kicked as he talked, set stirring in Christophe's soul. He made some excuse for stopping Berthold's tongue. He went up the steps, but the other clung to him, stopped him, and went on with his harangue. At last, when the miller took to telling him of Sabine's illness, with that strange pleasure which certain people, and especially the common people, take in talking of illness, with a plethora of painful details, Christophe could bear it no longer. He took a tight hold of himself so as not to cry out in his sorrow. He cut him short. Pardon, he said curtly and icily. I must leave you. He left him without another word. His insensibility revolted the miller. He had guessed the secret affection of his sister and Christophe, and that Christophe should now show such indifference seemed monstrous to him. He thought he had no heart. Christophe had fled to his room. He was choking. Until the removal was over, he never left his room. He vowed that he would never look out of the window. But he could not help doing so, and hiding in a corner behind the curtain, he followed the departure of the goods and chattels of the beloved eagerly and with profound sorrow. When he saw them disappearing forever, he all but ran down to the street to cry, No, no, leave them to me, do not take them from me. He longed to beg at least for some little thing, only one little thing, so that she should not be altogether taken from him. But how could he ask such a thing of the miller? It was nothing to him. She herself had not known his love. How dared he then reveal it to another? And besides, if he had tried to say a word, he would have burst out crying. No, no, he had to say nothing, to watch all go, without being able without daring to save one fragment from the wreck. And when it was all over, when the house was empty, when the yard gate was closed after the miller, when the wheels of his cart moved on, shaking the windows, when they were out of hearing, he threw himself on the floor. Not a tear left in him, not a thought of suffering, of struggling, frozen, and like one dead. There was a knock at the door. He did not move. Another knock. He had forgotten to lock the door. Rosa came in. She cried out on seeing him stretched on the floor and stopped in terror. He raised his head angrily. What? What do you want? Leave me. She did not go. She stayed, hesitating, leaning against the floor, and said again, Christophe. He got up in silence. He was ashamed of having been seen so. He dusted himself with his hand and asked harshly, Well, what do you want? Rosa said shyly, Forgive me, Christophe. I came in. I was bringing you. He saw that she had something in her hand. See, she said, holding it out to him. I asked Berthold to give me a little token of her. I thought you would like it. It was a little silver mirror, the pocket mirror, in which she used to look at herself for hours, not so much from coquetry as from want of occupation. Christophe took it, took also the hand which held it. Oh, Rosa, he said. He was filled with her kindness and the knowledge of his own injustice. On a passionate impulse, he knelt to her and kissed her hand. Forgive, forgive, he said. Rosa did not understand at first. Then she understood only too well. She blushed, she trembled, she began to weep. She understood that he meant, Forgive me if I am unjust. Forgive me if I do not love you. Forgive me if I cannot, if I cannot love you, if I can never love you. She did not withdraw her hand from him. 
she knew that it was not herself that he was kissing, and with his cheek against Rosa's hand he wept hot tears, knowing that she was reading through him. There was sorrow and bitterness in being unable to love her and making her suffer. They stayed so, both weeping in the dim light of the room. At last she withdrew her hand. He went on murmuring, Forgive. She laid her hand gently on his hand. He rose to his feet. They kissed in silence. They felt on their lips the bitter savor of their tears. We shall always be friends, he said softly. She bowed her head and left him, too sad to speak. They thought that the world is ill-made. The lover is unloved. The beloved does not love. The lover who is loved is sooner or later torn from his love. There is suffering. There is the bringing of suffering. And the most wretched is not always the one who suffers. Once more, Christophe took to avoiding the house. He could not bear it. He could not bear to see the curtainless windows, the empty rooms. A worse sorrow awaited him. Old Euler lost no time in reletting the ground floor. One day, Christophe saw strange faces in Sabine's room. New lives blotted out the traces of the life that was gone. It became impossible for him to stay in his rooms. He passed whole days outside, not coming back until nightfall, when it was too dark to see anything. Once more he took to making expeditions in the country. Irresistibly he was drawn to Berthold's farm. But he never went in, dared not go near it, wandered about it at a distance. He discovered a place on a hill from which he could see the house, the plain, the river. It was thither that his steps usually turned. From thence he could follow with his eyes the meanderings of the water down to the willow clump under which he had seen the shadow of death pass across Sabine's face. From thence he could pick out the two windows of the rooms in which they had waited, side by side, so near, so far, separated by a door, the door to eternity. From thence he could survey the cemetery. He had never been able to bring himself to enter it. From childhood he had had a horror of those fields of decay and corruption, and refused to think of those whom he loved in connection with them. But from a distance, and seen from above, the little graveyard never looked grim. It was calm. It slept with the sun. Sleep. She loved to sleep. Nothing would disturb her there. The crowing cocks answered each other across the plains. From the homestead rose the roaring of the mill, the clucking of the poultry yard, the cries of children playing. He could make out Sabine's little girl. He could see her running. He could mark her laughter. Once he lay in wait for her near the gate of the farmyard, in a turn of the sunk road made by the walls. He seized her as she passed and kissed her. The child was afraid and began to cry. She had almost forgotten him already. He asked her, Are you happy here? Yes, it is fun. You don't want to come back? No. He let her go. The child's indifference plunged him in sorrow. Poor Sabine. And yet it was she, something of her, so little. The child was hardly at all like her mother, had lived in her, but was not she. In that mysterious passage through her being the child had hardly retained more than the faintest perfume of the creature who was gone. Inflections of her voice, a pursing of the lips, a trick of bending the head. The rest of her was another being altogether, and that being, mingled with the being of Sabine, was repulsive to Christophe, though he never admitted it to himself. It was only in himself that Christophe could find the image of Sabine. It followed him everywhere, hovering above him, but he only felt himself really to be with her when he was alone. Nowhere was she nearer to him than in this refuge, on the hill, far from strange eyes, in the midst of the country that was so full of the memory of her. He would go miles to it, climbing at a run, his heart beating as though he were going to a meeting with her, 
and so it was indeed. When he reached it, he would lie on the ground, the same earth in which her body was laid. He would close his eyes, and she would come to him. He could not see her face. He could not hear her voice. He had no need. She entered into him, held him. He possessed her utterly. In this state of passionate hallucination, he would lose the power of thought. He would be unconscious of what was happening. He was unconscious of everything, save that he was with her. That state of things did not last long. To tell the truth, he was only once altogether sincere. From the day following, his will had its share in the proceedings, and from that time on, Christophe tried in vain to bring it back to life. It was only then that he thought of evoking in himself the face and form of Sabine. Until then, he had never thought of it. He succeeded spasmodically, and he was fired by it. But it was only at the cost of hours of waiting and of darkness. Poor Sabine, he would think. They have all forgotten you. There is only I who love you who keep your memory alive forever. Oh, my treasure, my precious, I have you, I hold you, I will never let you go. He spoke these words because already she was escaping him. She was slipping from his thoughts like water through his fingers. He would return again and again, faithful to the tryst. He wished to think of her and he would close his eyes. But after half an hour, or an hour, or sometimes two hours, he would begin to see that he had been thinking of nothing. The sounds of the valley, the roar of the wind, the little bells of the two goats browsing on the hill, the noise of the wind in the little slender trees under which he lay, were sucked up by his thoughts, soft and porous like a sponge. He was angry with his thoughts. They tried to obey him, and to fix the vanished image to which he was striving to attach his life. But his thoughts fell back weary and chastened, and once more with a sigh of comfort abandoned themselves to the listless stream of sensations. He shook off his torpor. He strode through the country hither and thither, seeking Sabine. He sought her in the mirror that once had held her smile. He sought her by the river bank where her hands had dipped in the water. But the mirror and the water gave him only the reflection of himself. The excitement of walking, the fresh air, the beating of his own healthy blood awoke music in him once more. He wished to find change. Oh, Sabine, he sighed. He dedicated his songs to her. He strove to call her to life in his music, his love, and his sorrow. In vain. Love and sorrow came to life surely, but poor Sabine had no share in them. Love and sorrow looked towards the future, not towards the past. Christophe was powerless against his youth. The sap of life swelled up again in him with new vigor. His grief, his regrets, his chaste and ardent love, his baffled desires heightened the fever that was in him. In spite of his sorrow, his heart beat in lively, sturdy rhythm. Wild songs leaped forth in mad, intoxicated strains. Everything in him, hymned life and even sadness, took on a festival shape. Christophe was too frank to persist in self-deception, and he despised himself. But life swept him headlong, and in his sadness, with death in his heart, and life in all his limbs, he abandoned himself to the forces newborn in him, to the absurd, delicious joy of living, which grief, pity, despair, the aching wound of an irreparable loss, all the torment of death, can only sharpen and kindle into being in the strong, as they rowel their sides with furious spur. And Christoph knew that in himself, in the secret hidden depths of his soul, he had an inaccessible and inviolable sanctuary where lay the shadow of Sabine, that the flood of life could not bear away. Each of us bears in his soul, as it were, a little graveyard of those whom he has loved. 
They sleep there through the years, untroubled. But a day cometh, this we know, when the graves shall reopen. The dead issue from the tomb and smile with their pale lips, loving always, on the beloved and the lover in whose breast their memory dwells, like the child sleeping in the mother's womb. End of section 31、section、thirty two of Jean Christophe, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume One by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert c a n a n Youth Three, Part One. Three, Ada. After the wet summer, the autumn was radiant. In the orchards, the trees were weighed down with fruit. The red apples shone like billiard balls. Already, some of the trees were taking on their brilliant garb of the falling year flame color, fruit color, color of ripe melon, of oranges and lemons. Of good cooking and fried dishes. Misty lights glowed through the woods, and from the meadows there rose the little pink flames of the saffron. He was going down a hill. It was a Sunday afternoon. He was striding, almost running, gaining speed down the slope. He was singing a phrase the rhythm of which had been obsessing him all through his walk. He was red, disheveled. He was walking, swinging his arms, and rolling his eyes like a madman. When, as he turned a bend in the road, he came suddenly on a fair girl perched on a wall, tugging with all her might at a branch of a tree from which she was greedily plucking and eating purple plums. Their astonishment was mutual. She looked at him, stared with her mouth full. Then she burst out laughing. So did he. She was good to see, with her round face framed in fair curly hair. Which was like a sunlit cloud about her. Her full pink cheeks, her wide blue eyes, her rather large nose, impertinently turned up, her little red mouth showing white teeth, the canine little, strong and projecting, her plump chin, and her full figure, large and plump, well built, solidly put together. He called out, Good eating! and was for going on his road, but she called to him, Sir, sir, will you be very nice? Help me to get down. I can't. He returned and asked her how she had climbed up. With my hands and feet. It is easy enough to get up. Especially when there are tempting plums hanging above your head. Yes, but when you have eaten, your courage goes. You can't find the way to get down. He looked at her on her perch. He said, You are all right there. Stay there quietly. I'll come and see you tomorrow. Good night. But he did not budge and stood beneath her. She pretended to be afraid and begged him with little glances not to leave her. They stayed looking at each other and laughing. She showed him the branch to which she was clinging and asked, Would you like some? Respect for property had not developed in Christophe since the days of his expeditions with Otto. He accepted without hesitation. She amused herself with pelting him with plums. When he had eaten, she said, Now! He took a wicked pleasure in keeping her waiting. She grew impatient on her wall. At last he said, Come then, and held his hand up to her. But just as she was about to jump down, she thought a moment, Wait, we must make provision first. She gathered the finest plums within reach. And filled the front of her blouse with them. Carefully, don't crush them. He felt almost inclined to do so. She lowered herself from the wall and jumped into his arms. Although he was sturdy, he bent under her weight and all but dragged her down. They were of the same height. Their faces came together. He kissed her lips, moist and sweet with the juice of the plums, and she returned his kiss without more ceremony. Where are you going? He asked. I don't know. Are you out alone? No, I am with friends, but I have lost them. Hi, hi, 
she called suddenly as loudly as she could. No answer. She did not bother about it any more. They began to walk, at random, following their noses. "'And you? Where are you going?' said she. "'I don't know either.' "'Good. We'll go together.' She took some plums from her gaping blouse and began to munch them. "'You'll make yourself sick,' he said. "'Not I. I've been eating them all day.' Through the gap in her blouse he saw the white of her chemise. "'They are all warm now,' she said. "'Let me see.' She held him one and laughed. He ate it. She watched him out of the corner of her eye as she sucked at the fruit like a child. He did not know how the adventure would end. It is probable that she at least had some suspicion. She waited. "'Hi, hi!' voices in the woods. "'Hi, hi!' she answered. "'Ah, there they are,' she said to Christophe. "'Not a bad thing, either.' But on the contrary, she was thinking that it was rather a pity. But speech was not given to woman for her to say what she is thinking. Thank God, for there would be an end of morality on earth. The voices came near. Her friends were near the road. She leaped the ditch, climbed the hedge, and hid behind the trees. He watched her in amazement. She signed to him imperiously to come to her. He followed her. She plunged into the depths of the wood. Hi, hi, she called once more when they had gone some distance. You see, they must look for me, she explained to Christophe. Her friends had stopped on the road and were listening for her voice to mark where it came from. They answered her and in their turn entered the woods, but she did not wait for them. She turned about on right and on left. They bawled loudly after her. She let them, and then went and called in the opposite direction. At last they wearied of it, and making sure that the best way of making her come was to give up seeking her, they called, "Goodbye," and went off singing. She was furious that they should not have bothered about her any more than that. She had tried to be rid of them, but she had not counted on their going off so easily. Christophe looked rather foolish. This game of hide-and-seek with a girl whom he did not know did not exactly enthrall him, and he had no thought of taking advantage of their solitude. Nor did she think of it. In her annoyance she forgot Christophe. "'Oh, it's too much,' she said, thumping her hands together. "'They have left me.' "'But,' said Christophe, "'you wanted them to.' "'Not at all. You ran away.' If I ran away from them, that is my affair, not theirs. They ought to look for me. What if I were lost? Already she was beginning to be sorry for herself because of what might have happened if, if the opposite of what actually had occurred had come about. Oh, she said, I'll shake them. She turned back and strode off. As she went, she remembered Christophe and looked at him once more. But it was too late. She began to laugh. The little demon which had been in her the moment before was gone. While she was waiting for another to come, she saw Christophe with the eyes of indifference. And then she was hungry. Her stomach was reminding her that it was supper-time. She was in a hurry to rejoin her friends at the inn. She took Christophe's arm, leaned on it with all her weight, groaned, and said that she was exhausted. That did not keep her from dragging Christophe down a slope, running and shouting and laughing like a mad thing. They talked. She learned who he was. She did not know his name and seemed not to be greatly impressed by his title of musician. He learned that she was a shop girl from a dressmaker's in the Kaiserstrasse, the most fashionable street in the town. Her name was Adelheid, to friends Ada. Her companions on the excursion were one of her friends, who worked at the same place as herself, and two nice young men, a clerk at Viler's Bank and a clerk from a big linen draper's. They were turning their Sunday to account. They had decided to dine at the Brochet Inn, from which there is a fine view over the Rhine, and then to return by boat. The others had already established themselves at the inn when they arrived. Ada made a scene with her friends, she complained of their cowardly desertion and presented Christophe as her savior. They did not listen to her complaints, but they knew Christophe, the bank clerk by reputation, the clerk from having heard some of his compositions. 
he thought it a good idea to hum an air from one of them immediately afterwards, and the respect which they showed him made an impression on Ada, the more so as Mira, the other young woman, her real name was Hansi or Johanna, a brunette with blinking eyes, bumpy forehead, hair screwed back, Chinese face, a little too animated, but clever and not without charm, in spite of her goat-like head and her oily, golden-yellow complexion, at once began to make advances to their Hofmusikus. They begged him to be so good as to honor their repast with his presence. Never had he been in such high feather, for he was overwhelmed with attentions, and the two women, like good friends as they were, tried each to rob the other of him. Both courted him, Mira with ceremonious manners, sly looks as she rubbed her leg against his under the table, Ada openly making play with her fine eyes, her pretty mouth, and all the seductive resources at her command. Such coquetry, in its almost coarseness, incommoded and distressed Christophe. These two bold young women were a change from the unkindly faces he was accustomed to at home. Mira interested him. He guessed her to be more intelligent than Ada, but her obsequious manners and her ambiguous smile were curiously attractive and repulsive to him at the same time. She could do nothing against Ada's radiance of life and pleasure, and she was aware of it. When she saw that she had lost the bout, she abandoned the effort, turned in upon herself, went on smiling, and patiently waited for her day to come. Ada, seeing herself mistress of the field, did not seek to push forward the advantage she had gained. What she had done had been mainly to despite her friend. She had succeeded. She was satisfied. But she had been caught in her own game. She felt, as she looked into Christophe's eyes, the passion that she had kindled in him, and that same passion began to awake in her. She was silent. She left her vulgar teasing. They looked at each other in silence. On their lips they had the savor of their kiss. From time to time, by fits and starts, they joined vociferously in the jokes of the others. Then they relapsed into silence, stealing glances at each other. At last they did not even look at each other, as though they were afraid of betraying themselves. Absorbed in themselves, they brooded over their desire. When the meal was over, they got ready to go. They had to go a mile and a half through the woods to reach the pier. Ada got up first. Christophe followed her. They waited on the steps until the others were ready. Without speaking, side by side, in the thick mist that was hardly at all lit up by the single lamp hanging by the inn door. Mira was dawdling by the mirror. Ada took Christophe's hand and led him along the house towards the garden into the darkness. Under a balcony from which hung a curtain of vines they hid, all about them was dense darkness. They could not even see each other. The wind stirred the tops of the pines. He felt Ada's warm fingers entwined in his, and the sweet scent of a heliotrope flower that she had at her breast. Suddenly she dragged him to her. Christophe's lips found Ada's hair, wet with the mist, and kissed her eyes, her eyebrows, her nose, her cheeks, the corners of her mouth, seeking her lips, and finding them, staying pressed to them. The others had gone. They called, Ada! They did not stir. They hardly breathed, pressed close to each other, lips and bodies. They heard Mira. They have gone on. The footsteps of their companions died away in the night. They held each other closer in silence, stifling on their lips a passionate murmuring. In the distance a village clock rang out. They broke apart. They had to run to the pier. Without a word they set out, arms and hands entwined, keeping step, a little quick, firm step like hers. The road was deserted. No creature was abroad. They could not see ten yards ahead of them. They went, serene and sure, into the beloved night. They never stumbled over the pebbles on the road. As they were late, they took a short cut. The path led for some way down through vines, and then began to ascend and wind up the side of the hill. Through the mist, they could hear the roar of the river and the heavy paddles of the steamer approaching. They left the road and ran across the fields. At last they found themselves on the bank of the Rhine, but still far from the pier. Their serenity was not disturbed. Ada had forgotten her fatigue of the evening, 
It seemed to them that they could have walked all night like that, on the silent grass, in the hovering mists that grew wetter and more dense along the river that was wrapped in a whiteness as of the moon. The steamer's siren hooted. The invisible monster plunged heavily away and away. They said, laughing, We will take the next. By the edge of the river, soft lapping waves broke at their feet. At the landing stage, they were told, The last boat has just gone. Christophe's heart thumped. Ada's hand grasped his arm more tightly. But, she said, there will be another one tomorrow. A few yards away in a halo of mist was the flickering light of a lamp hung on a post on a terrace by the river. A little farther on were a few lighted windows, a little in. They went into the tiny garden, the sand ground under their feet. They groped their way to the steps. When they entered, the lights were being put out. Ada, on Christophe's arm, asked for a room. The room to which they were led opened on to the little garden. Christophe leaned out of the window and saw the phosphorescent flow of the river and the shade of the lamp on the glass of which were crushed mosquitoes with large wings. The door was closed. Ada was standing by the bed and smiling. He dared not look at her. She did not look at him. But through her lashes she followed Christophe's every movement. The floor creaked with every step. They could hear the least noise in the house. They sat on the bed and embraced in silence. The flickering light of the garden is dead. All is dead. Night. The abyss. Neither light nor consciousness. Being. The obscure, devouring forces of being. Joy all-powerful. Joy rending. Joy which sucks down the human creature as the void a stone. The sprout of desire sucking up thought. The absurd, delicious law of the blind, intoxicated worlds which roll at night. A night which is many nights, hours that are centuries, records which are death, dreams shared, words spoken with eyes closed, tears and laughter, the happiness of loving in the voice, of sharing the nothingness of sleep, the swiftly passing images floating in the brain, the hallucinations of the roaring night. The Rhine laps in a little creek by the house, in the distance, his waters over the dams and breakwaters make a sound as of a gentle rain falling on sand. The hull of the boat cracks and groans under the weight of water. The chain by which it is tied sags and grows taut with a rusty clattering. The voice of the river rises. It fills the room. The bed is like a boat. They are swept along side by side by a giddy current, hung in mid-air like a soaring bird. The night grows ever more dark, the void more empty. Ada weeps. Christophe loses consciousness. Both are swept down under the flowing waters of the night. Night. Death. Why wake to life again? The light of the dawning day peeps through the dripping panes. The spark of life glows once more in their languorous bodies. He awakes. Ada's eyes are looking at him. A whole life passes in a few moments, days of sin, greatness, and peace. Where am I? And am I too? Do I still exist? I am no longer conscious of being. All about me is the infinite. I have the soul of a statue with large, tranquil eyes, filled with Olympian peace. They fall back into the world of sleep, and the familiar sounds of the dawn the distant bells, a passing boat, oars dripping water, footsteps on the road, all caress without disturbing their happy sleep, reminding them that they are alive and making them delight in the savor of their happiness. End of section 32。section 33 of Jean Christophe, volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1, Baromain Roland, translated by Gilbert Canaan, Youth 3, Part 2. 
The puffing of the steamer outside the window brought Christophe from his torpor. They had agreed to leave at seven, so as to return to the town in time for their usual occupations. He whispered, Do you hear? She did not open her eyes. She smiled, she put out her lips, she tried to kiss him and then let her head fall back on his shoulder. Through the window panes he saw the funnel of the steamer slip by against the sky. He saw the empty deck and clouds of smoke. Once more he slipped into dreaminess. An hour passed without his knowing it. He heard it strike and started in astonishment. Ada, he whispered to the girl. Ada, he said again. It's eight o'clock. Her eyes were still closed. She frowned and pouted pettishly. Oh, let me sleep, she said. She sighed wearily and turned her back on him and went to sleep once more. He began to dream. His blood ran bravely, calmly through him. His limpid senses received the smallest impressions simply and freshly. He rejoiced in his strength and youth. Unwittingly he was proud of being a man. He smiled in his happiness and felt himself alone, alone as he had always been, more lonely even, but without sadness, in a divine solitude, no more fever. No more shadows, nature could freely cast a reflection upon his soul in its serenity, lying on his back, facing the window, his eyes gazing deep into the dazzling air with its luminous mists, he smiled. How good it is to live! To live! A boat passed, the thought suddenly of those who were no longer alive, of a boat gone by on which they were together. He? She? She? Not that one, sleeping by his side. She, the only she, the beloved, the poor little woman who was dead. But is it that one? How came she there? How did they come to this room? He looks at her. He does not know her. She is a stranger to him. Yesterday morning she did not exist for him. What does he know of her? He knows that she is not clever. He knows that she is not good. He knows that she is not even beautiful with her face, spiritless and bloated with sleep, her low forehead, her mouth open in breathing, her swollen, dried lips pouting like a fish. He knows that he does not love her, and he is filled with a bitter sorrow when he thinks that he kissed those strange lips in the first moment with her, that he has taken this beautiful body for which he cares nothing on the first night of their meeting and that she whom he loved, he watched her live and die by his side and never dared touch her hair with his lips, that he will never know the perfume of her being. Nothing more. All is crumbled away. The earth has taken all from him, and he never defended what was his. And while he leaned over the innocent sleeper and scanned her face, and looked at her with eyes of unkindness, she felt his eyes upon her. Uneasy under his scrutiny, she made a great effort to raise her heavy lids and to smile, and she said, stammering a little, like a waking child, D -d "'Don't look at me. I'm ugly.' She fell back at once, weighed down with sleep, smiled once more, murmured, "'Oh, I'm so, so sleepy,' and went off again into her dreams. He could not help laughing. He kissed her childish lips more tenderly. He watched the girl sleeping for a moment longer, and got up quietly. She gave a comfortable sigh when he was gone. He tried not to wake her as he dressed, though there was no danger of that. And when he had done, he sat in the chair near the window, and watched the steaming, smoking river, which looked as though it were covered with ice, and he fell into a brown study in which there hovered music, pastoral melancholy. From time to time she half opened her eyes and looked at him vaguely, took a second or two, smiled at him, and passed from one sleep to another. She asked him the time. A quarter to nine. Half asleep she pondered. What? Can it be a quarter to nine? At half past nine she stretched, sighed, and said that she was going to get up. It was ten o'clock before she stirred. She was petulant. Striking again. The clock is fast. 
He laughed and went and sat on the bed by her side. She put her arms round his neck and told him her dreams. He did not listen very attentively and interrupted her with little love words, but she made him be silent and went on very seriously, as though she were telling something of the highest importance. She was at dinner. The Grand Duke was there. Mira was a Newfoundland dog. No, a frizzy sheep who waited at table. Ada had discovered a method of rising from the earth, of walking, dancing, and lying down in the air. You see, it was quite simple. You had only to do thus, thus, and it was done. Christophe laughed at her. She laughed, too, though a little ruffled at his laughing. She shrugged her shoulders. Ah, you don't understand. They breakfasted on the bed from the same cup, with the same spoon. At last she got up. She threw off the bedclothes and slipped down from the bed. Then she sat down to recover her breath and looked at her feet. Finally she clapped her hands and told him to go out, and as he was in no hurry about it, she took him by the shoulders and thrust him out of the door and then locked it. After she had dawdled, looked over and stretched each of her handsome limbs, she sang as she washed a sentimental lead in fourteen couplets, threw water at Christophe's face, he was outside drumming on the window, and as they left she plucked the last rose in the garden, and then they took the steamer. The mist was not yet gone, but the sun shone through it. They floated through a creamy light. Ada sat at the stern with Christophe. She was sleepy and a little sulky. She grumbled about the light in her eyes, and said that she would have a headache all day. And as Christophe did not take her complaints seriously enough, she returned into morose silence. Her eyes were hardly opened, and in them was the funny gravity of children who have just woke up. But at the next landing stage an elegant lady came and sat not far from her, and she grew lively at once. She talked eagerly to Christophe about things sentimental and distinguished. She had resumed with him the ceremonious C. Christophe was thinking about what she could say to her employer by way of excuse for her lateness. She was hardly at all concerned about it. Bah! It's not the first time. The first time that... what? That I have been late, she said, put out by the question. He dared not ask her what had caused her lateness. What will you tell her? That my mother is ill. Dead. How do I know? He was hurt by her talking so lightly. I don't want you to lie. She took offense. First of all, I never lie, and then I cannot very well tell her. He asked her half in jest, half in earnest. Why not? She laughed, shrugged, and said that he was coarse and ill-bred, and that she had already asked him not to use the do to her. Haven't I the right? Certainly not. After what has happened? Nothing has happened. She looked at him a little defiantly and laughed, and although she was joking, he felt most strongly that it would not have cost her much to say it seriously and almost to believe it. But some pleasant memory tickled her, for she burst out laughing and looked at Christophe and kissed him loudly without any concern for the people about, who did not seem to be in the least surprised by it. Now on all his excursions he was accompanied by shop-girls and clerks, he did not like their vulgarity, and used to try to lose them, but Ada, out of contrariness, was no longer disposed for wandering in the woods. When it rained, or for some other reason they did not leave the town, he would take her to the theatre, or the museum, or the Tiergarten, for she insisted on being seen with him. She even wanted him to go to church with her, but he was so absurdly sincere that he would not set foot inside a church, since he had lost his belief. On some other excuse, he had resigned his position as organist, and, at the same time, unknown to himself, remained much too religious not to think Ada's proposal sacrilegious. He used to go to her rooms in the evening. Mira would be there, for she lived in the same house. Mira was not at all resentful against him. She would hold out her soft hand, caressingly, and talk of trivial and improper things, and then dip away discreetly. The two women had never seemed to be such friends as since they had had small reason for being so. They were always together. Ada had no secrets from Mira, 
She told her everything. Mira listened to everything. They seemed to be equally pleased with it all. Christophe was ill at ease in the company of the two women. Their friendship, their strange conversations, their freedom of manner, the crude way in which Mira especially viewed and spoke of things. Not so much in his presence, however, as when he was not there, but Ada used to repeat her sayings to him. Their indiscreet and impertinent curiosity, which was forever turned upon subjects that were silly or basely sensual, the whole equivocal and rather animal atmosphere oppressed him terribly, though it interested him, for he knew nothing like it. He was at sea in the conversations of the two little beasts who talked of dress and made silly jokes and laughed in an inept way with their eyes shining with delight when they were off on the track of some spicy story. He was more at ease when Mira left them. When the two women were together, it was like being in a foreign country without knowing the language. It was impossible to make himself understood. They did not even listen. They poked fun at the foreigner. When he was alone with Ada, they went on speaking different languages, but at least they did make some attempt to understand each other. To tell the truth, the more he understood her, the less he understood her. She was the first woman he had known, for if poor Sabina was a woman he had known, he had known nothing of her. She had always remained for him a phantom of his heart. Ada took upon herself to make him make up for lost time. In his turn, he tried to solve the riddle of woman, an enigma which perhaps is no enigma except for those who seek some meaning in it. Ada was without intelligence. That was the least of her faults. Christophe would have commended her for it if she had approved it herself. But although she was occupied only with stupidities, she claimed to have some knowledge of the things of the spirit, and she judged everything with complete assurance. She would talk about music and explain to Christophe things which he knew perfectly and would pronounce absolute judgment and sentence. It was useless to try to convince her she had pretensions and susceptibilities in everything. She gave herself airs. She was obstinate, vain. She would not, she could not understand anything. Why would she not accept that she could understand nothing? He loved her so much better when she was content with being just what she was, simply, with her own qualities and failings, instead of trying to impose on others and herself. In fact, she was little concerned with thought. She was concerned with eating, drinking, singing, dancing, crying, laughing, sleeping. She wanted to be happy, and that would have been all right if she had succeeded. But although she had every gift for it, she was greedy, lazy, sensual, and frankly egoistic, in a way that revolted and amused Christophe. Although she had almost all the vices which make life pleasant for their fortunate possessor, if not for their friends, and even then does not a happy face, at least if it be pretty, shed happiness on all those who come near it, in spite of so many reasons for being satisfied with life and herself, Ada was not even clever enough for that. The pretty, robust girl, fresh, hearty, healthy-looking, endowed with abundant spirits and fierce appetites, was anxious about her health. She bemoaned her weakness, while she ate enough for four. She was always sorry for herself. She could not drag herself along. She could not breathe. She had a headache, feet ache, her eyes ached, her stomach ached, her soul ached. She was afraid of everything and madly superstitious and saw omens everywhere. At meals, the crossing of knives and forks, the number of the guests, the upsetting of a salt cellar. Then there must be a whole ritual to turn aside misfortune. Out walking, she would count the crows and never failed to watch which side they flew to. She would anxiously watch the road at her feet, and when a spider crossed her path in the morning, she would cry out aloud. Then she would wish to go home, and there would be no other means of not interrupting the walk than to persuade her that it was after twelve, and so the omen was one of hope rather than of evil. She was afraid of her dreams. She would recount them at length to Christophe. For hours she would try to recollect some detail that she had forgotten. She never spared him one. Absurdities piled one on the other, strange marriages, deaths, dressmakers' prices, burlesque, and sometimes obscene things. 
he had to listen to her and give her his advice. Often she would be for a whole day under the obsession of her inept fancies. She would find life ill-ordered. She would see things and people rawly and overwhelm Christophe with her jeremiads, and it seemed hardly worth while to have broken away from the gloomy middle-class people with whom he lived to find once more the eternal enemy, the trauriger und griechischer hypochandrist. But suddenly in the midst of her sulks and grumblings, she would become gay, noisy, exaggerated. There was no more dealing with her gaiety than with her moroseness. She would burst out laughing for no reason and seem as though she were never going to stop. She would rush across the fields, play mad tricks and childish pranks, take a delight in doing silly things, in mixing with the earth and dirty things and the beasts and the spiders and worms, in teasing them and hurting them and making them eat each other. The cats eat the birds, the fowls the worms, the ants the spiders, not from any wickedness, or perhaps from an altogether unconscious instinct for evil, from curiosity, or from having nothing better to do. She seemed to be driven always to say stupid things, to repeat senseless words again and again, to irritate Christophe, to exasperate him, set his nerves on edge, and make him almost beside himself. And her coquetry, as soon as anybody, no matter who, appeared on the road, then she would talk excitedly, laugh noisily, make faces, draw attention to herself. She would assume an affected, mincing gait. Christophe would have a horrible presentiment that she was going to plunge into serious discussion. And indeed, she would do so. She would become sentimental, uncontrolledly, just as she did everything. She would unbosom herself in a loud voice. Christophe would suffer and long to beat her. Least of all could he forgive her her lack of sincerity. He did not yet know that sincerity is a gift as rare as intelligence or beauty, and that it cannot justly be expected of everybody. He could not bear a lie, and Ada gave him lies in full measure. She was always lying, quite calmly, in spite of evidence to the contrary. She had that astounding faculty for forgetting what is displeasing to them, or even what has been pleasing to them, which those women possess who live from moment to moment. And in spite of everything, they loved each other with all their hearts. Ada was as sincere as Christophe in her love. Their love was none the less true for not being based on intellectual sympathy. It had nothing in common with base passion. It was the beautiful love of youth. It was sensual, but not vulgar, because it was altogether youthful. It was naive, almost chaste, purged by the ingenuous ardor of pleasure. Although Ada was not, by a long way, so ignorant as Christophe, yet she had still the divine privilege of youth, of soul and body, that freshness of the senses, limpid and vivid as a running stream, which almost gives the illusion of purity, and through life is never replaced. Egoistic, commonplace, insincere in her ordinary life, love made her simple, true, almost good. She understood in love the joy that is to be found in self-forgetfulness. Christophe saw this with delight, and he would gladly have died for her. Who can tell all the absurd and touching illusions that a loving heart brings to its love? And the natural illusion of the lover was magnified an hundredfold in Christophe by the power of illusion which is born in the artist. Ada's smile held profound meanings for him. An affectionate word was the proof of the goodness of her heart. He loved in her all that is good and beautiful in the universe. He called her his own, his soul, his life. They wept together over their love. Pleasure was not the only bond between them. There was an indefinable poetry of memories and dreams, their own, or those of the men and women who had loved before them, who had been before them, in them. Without a word, perhaps without knowing it, they preserved the fascination of the first moments of their meeting in the woods, the first days, the first nights together, 
those hours of sleep in each other's arms, still, unthinking, sinking down into a flood of love and silent joy. Swift fancies, visions, dumb thoughts, titillating, and making them go pale, and their hearts sink under their desire, bringing all about them a buzzing as of bees, a fine light and tender, their hearts sink and beat no more, borne down in excess of sweetness, silence, languor, and fever, the mysterious weary smile of the earth quivering under the first sunlight of spring, so fresh a love in two young creatures is like an April morning, like April it must pass, youth of the heart is like an early feast of sunshine. End of section 33「Section 34 of Jean Christophe, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Seeger in Chicago. Jean Christophe, Volume 1 by Romain Roland. Translated by Gilbert Canaan. Youth 3, Part 3. Nothing could have brought Christophe closer to Ada in his love than the way in which he was judged by others. The day after their first meeting it was known all over the town. Ada made no attempt to cover up the adventure, and rather plumed herself on her conquest. Christophe would have liked more discretion, but he felt that the curiosity of the people was upon him, and as he did not wish to seem to fly from it, he threw in his lot with Ada. The little town buzzed with tattle. Christophe's colleagues in the orchestra paid him sly compliments to which he did not reply, because he would not allow any meddling with his affairs. The respectable people of the town judged his conduct very severely. He lost his music lessons with certain families. With others, the mothers thought that they must now be present at the daughter's lessons, watching with suspicious eyes, as though Christophe were intending to carry off the precious darlings. The young ladies were supposed to know nothing. Naturally, they knew everything, and while they were cold towards Christophe for his lack of taste, they were longing to have further details. It was only among the small tradespeople and the shop people that Christophe was popular, but not for long. He was just as annoyed by their approval as by the condemnation of the rest, and being unable to do anything against that condemnation, he took steps not to keep their approval. There was no difficulty about that. He was furious with the general indiscretion. The most indignant of all with him were Eustus Euler and the Fogels. They took Christophe's misconduct as a personal outrage. They had not made any serious plans concerning him. They distrusted, especially Frau Vogel, these artistic temperaments. But as they were naturally discontented and always inclined to think themselves persecuted by fate, they persuaded themselves that they had counted on the marriage of Christophe and Rosa. As soon as they were quite certain that such a marriage would never come to pass, they saw in it the mark of the usual ill luck. Logically, if fate were responsible for their miscalculation, Christophe could not be. But the Fogel's logic was that which gave them the greatest opportunity for finding reasons for being sorry for themselves. So they decided that if Christophe had misconducted himself, it was not so much for his own pleasure as to give offense to them. They were scandalized. Very religious, moral, and oozing domestic virtue, they were of those to whom the sins of the flesh are the most shameful, the most serious, almost the only sins, because they are the only dreadful sins, it is obvious that respectable people are never likely to be tempted to steal or murder. And so Christophe seemed to them absolutely wicked, and they changed their demeanor towards him. They were icy towards him, and turned away as they passed him. Christophe, who was in no particular need of their conversation, shrugged his shoulders at all the fuss. He pretended not to notice Amalia's insolence, who, while she affected contemptuously to avoid him, did all that she could to make him fall in with her so that she might tell him all that was rankling in her. 
Christophe was only touched by Rosa's attitude. The girl condemned him more harshly even than her family. Not that this new love of Christophe's seemed to her to destroy her last chances of being loved by him. She knew that she had no chance left, although perhaps she went on hoping, she always hoped. But she had made an idol of Christophe, and that idol had crumbled away. It was the worst sorrow for her. Yes, a sorrow more cruel to the innocence and honesty of her heart than being disdained and forgotten by him. Brought up puritanically, with a narrow code of morality, in which she believed passionately, what she had heard about Christophe had not only brought her to despair, but had broken her heart. She had suffered already when he was in love with Sabine. She had begun then to lose some of her illusions about her hero. That Christophe could love so commonplace a creature seemed to her inexplicable and inglorious. But at least that love was pure, and Sabine was not unworthy of it. And in the end, death had passed over it and sanctified it. But that at once Christophe should love another woman, and such a woman was base and odious. She took upon herself the defense of the dead woman against him. She could not forgive him for having forgotten her. Alas, he was thinking of her more than she, but she never thought that in a passionate heart there might be room for two sentiments at once. She thought it impossible to be faithful to the past without sacrifice of the present. Pure and cold, she had no idea of life or of Christophe, Everything in her eyes was pure, narrow, submissive to duty like herself. Modest of soul, modest of herself, she had only one source of pride, purity. She demanded it of herself and of others. She could not forgive Christophe for having so lowered himself, and she would never forgive him. Christophe tried to talk to her, though not to explain himself. What could he say to her? What could he say to a little puritanical and naive girl? He would have liked to assure her that he was her friend, that he wished for her esteem, and had still the right to it. He wished to prevent her absurdly estranging herself from him. But Rosa avoided him in stern silence. He felt that she despised him. He was both sorry and angry. He felt that he did not deserve such contempt, and yet in the end he was bowled over by it, and thought himself guilty. Of all the reproaches cast against him, the most bitter came from himself when he thought of Sabine. He tormented himself. Oh, God, how is it possible? What sort of creature am I? But he could not resist the stream that bore him on. He thought that life is criminal, and he closed his eyes so as to live without seeing it. He had so great a need to live and be happy and love and believe. No, there was nothing despicable in his love. He knew that it was impossible to be very wise or intelligent or even very happy in his love for Ada. But what was there in it that could be called vile? Suppose, he forced the idea on himself, that Ada were not a woman of any great moral worth. How was the love that he had for her the less pure for that? Love is in the lover, not in the beloved. Everything is worthy of the lover. Everything is worthy of love. To the pure all is pure. All is pure in the strong and the healthy of mind. Love, which adorns certain birds with their loveliest colors, calls forth from the souls that are true all that is most noble in them. The desire to show to the beloved only what is worthy makes the lover take pleasure only in those thoughts and actions which are in harmony with the beautiful image fashioned by love. And the waters of youth in which the soul is bathed, the blessed radiance of strength and joy, are beautiful and health-giving, making the heart great. That his friends misunderstood him filled him with bitterness. But the worst trial of all was that his mother was beginning to be unhappy about it. The good creature was far from sharing the narrow views of the Fogels. She had seen real sorrows too near ever to try to invent others. Humble, broken by life, having received little joy from it, and having asked even less, resigned to everything that happened, without even trying to understand it, 
she was careful not to judge or censure others. She thought she had no right. She thought herself too stupid to pretend that they were wrong when they did not think as she did. It would have seemed ridiculous to try to impose on others the inflexible rules of her morality and belief. Besides that, her morality and her belief were purely instinctive. Pious and pure in herself, she closed her eyes to the conduct of others, with the indulgence of her class for certain faults and certain weaknesses. That had been one of the complaints that her father-in-law, Jean-Michel, had lodged against her. She did not sufficiently distinguish between those who were honorable and those who were not. She was not afraid of stopping in the street or the marketplace to shake hands and talk with young women, notorious in the neighborhood, whom a respectable woman ought to pretend to ignore. She left it to God to distinguish between good and evil, to punish or to forgive. From others she asked only a little of that affectionate sympathy which is so necessary to soften the ways of life. If people were only kind, she asked no more. But since she had lived with the Vogels, a change had come about in her. The disparaging temper of the family had found her an easier prey because she was crushed and had no strength to resist. Amalia had taken her in hand, and from morning to night, when they were working together alone, and Amalia did all the talking, Louisa, broken and passive, unconsciously assumed the habit of judging and criticizing everything. Frau Vogel did not fail to tell her what she thought of Christophe's conduct. Louisa's calmness irritated her. She thought it indecent of Louisa to be so little concerned about what put him beyond the pale. She was not satisfied until she had upset her altogether. Christophe saw it. Louisa dared not reproach him, but every day she made little timid remarks, uneasy, insistent, and when he lost patience and replied sharply, she said no more. But still he could see the trouble in her eyes, and when he came home sometimes he could see that she had been weeping. He knew his mother too well not to be absolutely certain that her uneasiness did not come from herself, and he knew well whence it came. He determined to make an end of it. One evening, when Louisa was unable to hold back her tears and had got up from the table in the middle of supper without Christophe being able to discover what was the matter, he rushed downstairs four steps at a time and knocked at the Fogel's door. He was boiling with rage. He was not only angry about Frau Fogel's treatment of his mother, he had to avenge himself for her having turned Rosa against him, for her bickering against Sabine, for all that he had had to put up with at her hands for months. For months he had borne his pent-up feelings against her and now made haste to let them loose. He burst in on Frau Vogel, and in a voice that he tried to keep calm, though it was trembling with fury, he asked her what she had told his mother to bring her to such a state. Amalia took it very badly. She replied that she would say what she pleased, and was responsible to no one for her actions, to him least of all, and seizing the opportunity to deliver the speech which she had prepared, she added that if Louisa was unhappy, he had to go no further for the cause of it than his own conduct, which was a shame to himself and a scandal to everybody else. Christophe was only waiting for her onslaught to strike out. He shouted angrily that his conduct was his own affair, that he did not care a rap whether it pleased Frau Vogel or not, that if she wished to complain of it, she must do so to him, and that she could say to him whatever she liked. That rested with her, but he forbade her, did she hear? Forbade her to say anything to his mother. It was cowardly and mean so to attack a poor, sick old woman. Frau Vogel cried loudly. Never had anyone dared to speak to her in such a manner. She said that she was not to be lectured by a rapscallion, and in her own house, too, and she treated him with abuse. The others came running up on the noise of the quarrel, except Vogel, who fled from anything that might upset his health. Old Euler was called to witness by the indignant Amalia, and sternly bade Christophe in future to refrain from speaking to or visiting them. 
He said that they did not need him to tell them what they ought to do, that they did their duty and would always do it. Christophe declared that he would go and would never again set foot in their house. However, he did not go until he had relieved his feelings by telling them what he had still to say about their famous duty, which had become to him a personal enemy. He said that their duty was the sort of thing to make him love vice. It was people like them who discouraged good by insisting on making it unpleasant. It was their fault that so many find delight by contrast among those who are dishonest, but amiable and laughter-loving. It was a profanation of the name of duty to apply it to everything, to the most stupid tasks, to trivial things, with a stiff and arrogant severity which ends by darkening and poisoning life. Duty, he said, was exceptional. It should be kept for moments of real sacrifice and not used to lend the lover of its name to ill humor and the desire to be disagreeable to others. There was no reason because they were stupid enough or ungracious enough to be sad, to want everybody else to be so too, and to impose on everybody their decrepit way of living. The first of all virtues is joy. Virtue must be happy, free, and unconstrained. He who does good must give pleasure to himself. But this perpetual upstart duty, this pedagogic tyranny, this peevishness, this futile discussion, this acrid, puerile quibbling, this ungraciousness, this charmless life, without politeness, without silence, this mean-spirited pessimism, which lets slip nothing that can make existence poorer than it is, this vainglorious unintelligence, which finds it easier to despise others than to understand them, all this middle-class morality, without greatness, without largeness, without happiness, without beauty, all these things are odious and hurtful. They make vice appear more human than virtue. So thought Christophe, and in his desire to hurt those who had wounded him, he did not see that he was being as unjust as those of whom he spoke. No doubt these unfortunate people were, almost as he saw them, but it was not their fault. It was the fault of their ungracious life, which had made their faces, their doings, and their thoughts ungracious. They had suffered the deformation of misery, not that great misery which swoops down and slays or forges anew, but the misery of ever-recurring ill fortune, that small misery which trickles down drop by drop from the first day to the last. Sad indeed, for beneath these rough exteriors, what treasures in reserve are there, of uprightness, of kindness, of silent heroism, the whole strength of a people, all the sap of the future. Christophe was not wrong in thinking duty exceptional, but love is so no less. Everything is exceptional. Everything that is of worth has no worse enemy, not the evil, the vices are of worth, but the habitual, the mortal enemy of the soul is the daily wear and tear. Ada was beginning to weary of it. She was not clever enough to find new food for her love in an abundant nature like that of Christophe. Her senses and her vanity had extracted from it all the pleasure they could find in it. There was left her only the pleasure of destroying it. She had that secret instinct common to so many women, even good women, to so many men, even clever men, who are not creative either of art, or of children, or of pure action, no matter what of life, and yet have too much life in apathy and resignation to bear with their uselessness. They desire others to be as useless as themselves and do their best to make them so. Sometimes they do so in spite of themselves, and when they become aware of their criminal desire they hotly thrust it back, but often they hug it to themselves, and they set themselves according to their strength, some modestly in their own intimate circle, others largely with vast audiences, to destroy everything that has life, everything that loves life, everything that deserves life. The critic who takes upon himself to diminish the stature of great men and great thoughts, and the girl who amuses herself with dragging down her lovers, are both mischievous beasts of the same kind but the second is the pleasanter of the two. 
Ada then would have liked to corrupt Christophe a little, to humiliate him. In truth, she was not strong enough. More intelligence was needed, even in corruption. She felt that, and it was not the least of her rankling feelings against Christophe that her love could do him no harm. She did not admit the desire that was in her to do him harm. Perhaps she would have done him none if she had been able, but it annoyed her that she could not do it. It is to fail in love for a woman not to leave her the illusion of her power for good or evil over her lover. To do that must inevitably be to impel her irresistibly to the test of it. Christophe paid no attention to it when Ada asked him jokingly, Would you leave your music for me? Although she had no wish for him to do so. He replied frankly, No, my dear, neither you nor anybody else can do anything against that. I shall always make music. And you say you love? cried she, put out. She hated his music, the more so because she did not understand it, and it was impossible for her to find a means of coming to grips with this invisible enemy, and so to wound Christophe in his passion. If she tried to talk of it contemptuously or scornfully to judge Christophe's compositions, he would shout with laughter, and in spite of her exasperation, Ada would relapse into silence, for she saw that she was being ridiculous. But if there was nothing to be done in that direction, she had discovered another weak spot in Christophe, one more easy of access, his moral faith. In spite of his squabble with the Fogels, and in spite of the intoxication of his adolescence, Christophe had preserved an instinctive modesty, a need of purity, of which he was entirely unconscious. At first it struck Ada, attracted and charmed her, then made her impatient and irritable, and finally, being the woman she was, she detested it. She did not make a frontal attack. She would ask insidiously, Do you love me? Of course. How much do you love me? As much as it is possible to love. That is not much. After all, what would you do for me? Whatever you like. Will you do something dishonest? That would be a queer way of loving. That is not what I asked. Would you? It is not necessary. But if I wished it? You would be wrong. Perhaps. Would you do it? He tried to kiss her, but she thrust him away. Would you do it? Yes or no? No, my dear. She turned her back on him and was furious. You do not love me. You do not know what love is. That is quite possible, he said good-humouredly. He knew that, like anybody else, he was capable in a moment of passion of committing some folly, perhaps something dishonest, and, who knows, even more but he would have thought shame of himself if he had boasted of it in cold blood, and certainly it would be dangerous to confess it to Ada. Some instinct warned him that the beloved foe was lying in ambush, and taking stock of his smallest remark, he would not give her any weapon against him. She would return to the charge again and ask him, Do you love me because you love me, or because I love you? Because I love you. Then if I did not love you? You would still love me? Yes. And if I loved someone else, you would still love me? Ah, I don't know about that. I don't think so. In any case, you would be the last person to whom I should say so. How would it be changed? Many things would be changed. Myself, perhaps. You, certainly. And if I changed, what would it matter? All the difference in the world. I love you as you are. If you become another creature, I can't promise to love you. You do not love. You do not love. What is the use of all this quibbling? You love or you do not love. If you love me, you ought to love me just as I am. Whatever I do, always. That would be to love you like an animal. I want to be loved like that. Then you have made a mistake, said he jokingly. I am not the sort of man you want. I would like to be, but I cannot, and I will not. You are very proud of your intelligence. You love your intelligence more than you do me. But I love you, you wretch, more than you love yourself. The more beautiful and the more good you are, the more I love you. You are a schoolmaster. 
she said with asperity. What would you? I love what is beautiful. Anything ugly disgusts me. Even in me? Especially in you. She drummed angrily with her foot. I will not be judged. Then complain of what I judge you to be, and of what I love in you, said he tenderly to appease her. She let him take her in his arms, and deigned to smile, and let him kiss her. But in a moment, when he thought she had forgotten, she asked uneasily, What do you think ugly in me? He would not tell her. He replied cowardly, I don't think anything ugly in you. She thought for a moment, smiled, and said, Just a moment, Quistley. You say that you do not like lying? I despise it. You are right, she said. I despise it, too. I am of a good conscience. I never lie. He stared at her. She was sincere. Her unconsciousness disarmed him. Then, she went on, putting her arms about his neck, why would you be cross with me if I loved someone else and told you so? Don't tease me. I'm not teasing. I am not saying that I do love someone else. I am saying that I do not. But if I did love someone later on... Well, don't let us think of it. But I want to think of it. You would not be angry with me. You could not be angry with me. I should not be angry with you. I should leave you. That is all. Leave me? Why? If I still loved you? While you loved someone else? Of course. It happens sometimes. Well, it will not happen with us. Why? "'Because as soon as you love someone else, "'I shall love you no longer, my dear, "'never, never again.' "'But just now you said perhaps. "'Ah, you see, you do not love me.' "'Well, then, all the better for you.' "'Because?' "'Because if I loved you when you loved someone else, "'it might turn out badly for you, me, and him.' "'Then? Now you are mad. "'Then I am condemned to stay with you all my life?' Be calm. You are free. You shall leave me when you like. Only it will not be au revoir. It will be good-bye. But if I still love you? When people love, they sacrifice themselves to each other. Well, then, sacrifice yourself. He could not help laughing at her egoism, and she laughed, too. The sacrifice of one only, he said, means the love of one only. Not at all. It means the love of both. I shall not love you much longer if you do not sacrifice yourself for me. And think, Christly, how much you will love me when you have sacrificed yourself, and how happy you will be. They laughed and were glad to have a change from the seriousness of the disagreement. He laughed and looked at her. At heart, as she said, she had no desire to leave Christophe at present. If he irritated her and often bored her, she knew the worth of such devotion as his, and she loved no one else. She talked so for fun, partly because she knew he disliked it, partly because she took pleasure in playing with equivocal and unclean thoughts, like a child which delights to mess about with dirty water. He knew this. He did not mind. But he was tired of these unwholesome discussions, of the silent struggle against this uncertain and uneasy creature whom he loved, who perhaps loved him. He was tired from the effort that he had to make to deceive himself about her, sometimes tired almost to tears. He would think, Why, why is she like this? Why are people like this? How second-rate life is! At the same time he would smile as he saw her pretty face above him, her blue eyes, her flower-like complexion, her laughing, chattering lips, foolish a little, half open to reveal the brilliance of her tongue and her white teeth. Their lips would almost touch, and he would look at her as from a distance, a great distance, as from another world. He would see her going farther and farther from him, vanishing in a mist, and then he would lose sight of her. He could hear her no more. He would fall into a sort of smiling oblivion in which he thought of his music, his dreams, a thousand things foreign to Ada. Ah, beautiful music. So sad, so mortally sad, and yet kind, loving. Ah, how good it is. It is that, it is that. Nothing else is true. She would shake his arm. A voice would cry. 
Eh, what's the matter with you? You are mad, quite mad. Why do you look at me like that? Why don't you answer? Once more he would see the eyes looking at him. Who was it? Ah, yes, he would sigh. She would watch him. She would try to discover what he was thinking of. She did not understand, but she felt that it was useless, that she could not keep hold of him, that there was always a door by which he could escape. She would conceal her irritation. "'Why are you crying?' she asked him once, as he returned from one of his strange journeys into another life. He drew his hands across his eyes. He felt that they were wet. "'I do not know,' he said. "'Why don't you answer? Three times you have said the same thing.' "'What do you want?' he asked gently. She went back to her absurd discussions. He waved his hand wearily. "'Yes,' she said. "'I've done. Only a word more.' And off she started again. Christophe shook himself angrily. "'Will you keep your dirtiness to yourself?' "'I was only joking.' "'Find cleaner subjects, then.' "'Tell me why, then. Tell me why you don't like it.' "'Why?' You can't argue as to why a dump heap smells. It does smell, and that is all. I hold my nose and go away. He went away, furious, and he strode along, taking in great breaths of the cold air. But she would begin again, once, twice, ten times. She would bring forward every possible subject that could shock him and offend his conscience. He thought it was only a morbid jest of a neurasthenic girl, amusing herself by annoying him. He would shrug his shoulders or pretend not to hear her. He would not take her seriously. But sometimes he would long to throw her out of the window. For neurasthenia and the neurasthenics were very little to his taste. But ten minutes away from her were enough to make him forget everything that had annoyed him. He would return to Ada with a fresh store of hopes and new illusions. He loved her. Love is a perpetual act of faith. Whether God exists or no is a small matter. We believe because we believe. We love because we love. There is no need of reasons. End of section 34